fantastic yesterday. And you know, who want to continue on this this great knock that he's had so far. Very much in tune with his game in familiar surrounds. Having scored his fourth test century at the Gabba yesterday. In goes Imran, wide of the off stump. Well, bowling a little dry there at Warner, trying to tempt him into having a crack. And uh, Warner at the moment, full of resolve. And he goes on one of those meanderfuls towards square leg in between. And uh, he has these, as we'll see when Smith comes out in, in a more demonstrative way, but uh, Warner has his own little routine to set himself to concentrate. Kicks away at the traces. <laughs> Normally has a tug or two of his gloves in between deliveries. As Imran Khan is away from the Stanley Street end and runs in and Warner leaves another ball. A bit fuller and still a little wide. And he said, no thanks. So he's only added one to his score and Australia just trickling along. One for 314, just trying to get themselves in. What about the no balls? Uh, from Blackman's Bay in Tassie, Marx says he wants to understand the no ball fiasco. A bowl of bowling no balls doesn't know because the umpire isn't calling them or warning the bowler. Then a wicket is taken and via replay the umpire calls the no ball and overturns the decision. This stinks. Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I think you know uh, Chris Rogers made made that point last night about you know if, if, if you're not knowing when. You know, if you're not getting feedback from the umpire, I remember a very good umpire back in in the day, Rudy Kurtzen, would always give you feedback as a bowler mm -hmm. if you're creeping up on that line. Shaheen bowls and Labuschagne right. plays into the gully, and it's another dot as Australia watchfully get themselves in. So I was thinking about it last night. I'm thinking if if you're not knowing that you're bowling no balls, you, you if you, if it's not being called, you're assuming that you you are behind the line, are you? So um, you just can you. you you won't be looking to rectify that. Mm. Um, and then it gets, you know, an important moment. You, you take a wicket like we saw yesterday, and then it gets referred and um, no ball. So, look, it, it, yeah, it needs to be better. It needs to be improved. Here comes Shaheen pitching up, driven for four. Spanking shot through straightish mid-off. Nice half volley, and he measured it off superbly between the bowler and mid-off. Beautifully timed. Impressive. Shot of the day so far. Labuschagne to 60 and it's one for 318. Having watched Marnus Labuschagne over the last, last year or so, I think a, a real area of improvement in his game has been his management around that off stump, fourth, fifth stump. Um, you know, I think he makes really good decisions. He, he knows when to play and, and importantly when not to play. And certainly seeing him in <coughs> county cricket, uh, that was a, a big improvement in his game. Here goes Shaheen pitching around the same spot, but not as full. And it's defended by Labuschagne uh, very confidently down on the offside. So what's to do? I mean, the umpire's trying to make a point here that uh, they need a bit more help out there in the middle. So what's the most important thing for them? It's what happens at the other end more than what happens here. I've got insurance upstairs. If I miss it, they'll find it. Yeah, I, I don't see why umpires can't do both. They've yep. done it for a long time. Um, I suppose the technology just highlights any mistakes, doesn't it? Shaheen Bowles pitching up, driven and driven through the covers. A luscious shot again. It's slowing up as it goes, but it will get there to the deep cover boundary. Two fours in the over. Exquisitely played by Manus Labuschagne. He's 64. And Australia get a wriggle on one for three, two, two. It was a lovely shot. And again, highlighting that there is no movement through the air for Shaheen Afridi. And since he, he's a bowler who really needs the, the ball moving through the air to be effective. Um, My mind goes back talking about no balls to... Um, a moment in a test match a few years ago. Here's Shaheen. He runs in and Labuschagne is back and plays the ball down, which um, a number of us will recall in New Zealand when uh, Richard Illingworth no-balled, whoever it was, 
and Adam Bozes was bowled. Remember that? No, I don't remember that. He got bowled, and it wasn't a no, no ball, ball on the replay. But it, it can't See, be overturned, that, is that is that right? It can't be. No, not if you're bowled. From what the umpires called as a no ball, oh. that, that will stand. And that's right. why I wonder ah. if umpires are thinking now, well, you know, if it's close, I don't want to make a mistake. Yeah. And, and if I'm wrong, well, then the bloke upstairs will help right. me. Shaheen, Afridi bowls, short ball, tugged away by Labuschagne to deep square. Yassir Shah is out there in the deep, and they collect the run. So Australia busy, busy, busy in that over. Labuschagne, 65. Warner's at it just one. He's 152, and it's one for 323. I remember a few years ago it, uh, talking about no balls, and I remember Dean Jones talking about he, he thinks a square leg umpire. And this was at the time. I don't know if he still thinks that now. He said the square leg umpire should stand at... Extra cover. Uh, extra cover and be the checking for no balls. That's, that, what, that was that's what the late colleague uh, was very strong Was on. he? Yeah. That right. Yeah, for a long while. Yep. He said, you know, particularly in big cricket, you've got technology to do the umpire's job at square leg, so right. move him to a place where he can be useful. Yeah. It's an idea. It is an idea. I think uh, we were talking yesterday with Chris Rogers about uh, Peter George is coming up with some technology, but... He's, yeah, he's got that the, the, the chip that you put in the bowler's shoe. Sure, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. But you've still got the, the, the area where the, you know, the heel can be raised, and that's legal if it's behind the line. Uh, Imran Khan bowls right tight hand. at the right-handed lavish, only defends a ball from the line of the stumps back down the pitch. So, yes, there's, there's lots of fiddling going around because um, we are constantly, as we, we move on with these things, as they evolve, are seeking perfection. And sometimes you can't get perfection. Players aren't perfect, umpires aren't perfect. Technology may not always be. But perfect. we want to see progression, don't we? Yes. And that's what it's about, I suppose. It's, as long as it's... It's fair. Here comes Imran right Khan, right on the length. Labuschagne stands up, up on his toes, and defends back down the pitch. Yes. Jim, there's a, a Cameron here. Uh, can I read this one out? Go, go. Since when is it the umpire's responsibility to coach? Does the umpire tell a batsman when he is not playing down the line or the keeper that he's rising too early? Bowlers just need to get their run-ups right from Cameron. Well, well, Cameron, what I would say to that is there's nothing wrong with the umpire giving a bowler some feedback. Uh, I think that's just good good game management. So no one wants to see you know, bowlers bowling no ball after no ball. Um. Imran Khan in again. Labuschagne defending. Straight back down the pitch. It, it's, have... it's part of any form of cricket, even in, in social cricket, if you... Yeah. You happen to be out there, I'm um, praying, you, you just say to the bloke, hey, mate, you're getting a bit it, It's just feedback, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, and I certainly don't think it's coaching. So, no. But thank you for yes. your message there. Thank you for the feedback, wherever you are, on your tractor, down the beach, um, or in a uh, retirement facility, an aged care facility, listening. And um, Ruby, I'm talking to you, of course, and to many others. Hello again, Ruby. Yeah, I hope, okay. I hope you're with us this time. Yep. I know you were at lunch last time. You missed <laughs> Imran Khan charges in and he bowls again. And yes, it's please. neatly worked away by Labuschagne. He liked that. And he sent it out to deep mid-wicket for two. It will be three. And again, he was just sweating on a ball. He could work through the field. It was fuller. It was straighter. And uh, it was almost like watching Steve Smith, except he would have been even further across to the offside. Bowl at the stumps, and that's where they go. And you could hear in the effects, Mike, as soon as he'd hit that Marnus Labuschagne, and he called three. And sure enough, he, he ran three. He's played enough cricket here at the, at the Gabba. We've got a couple more texts there, Jim. Yeah, Murray, of course, is asking the question, really, overrate which countries actually get the overs in because it really seems to happen. Well, they did in New Zealand yesterday. That's right. They did it. And it's not too high, I can assure you. 15 overs is very manageable. Imran Khan bowls just outside. Warner's off stump. Warner very watchful. This is his second slowest test century. 57 runs per 100 balls. Averages 
five for his other 21 centuries. Wow. So is this, the, this the new Warner that we saw some of in the World Cup? And he's playing in a very measured fashion there. I th think he's, he's just trusting himself to react to the ball and, and playing every ball on its merit. It, it hasn't seemed to be any premeditated mm. play by David Warner. And he's, I think he's looked fantastic. Barry Diego, one for 326. Imran Khan bowls to him, and he's hit on the pad high up, pushing at that ball that bounced and came back. And that ends the over. So, change in commentary here. Quentin Hull's going to join you, Dizzy, okay. with Australia going along OK. One for three, two, six. ABC Grandstand's coverage of the Test Series. Australia versus Pakistan. On ABC Radio. And on the ABC Listen app. Morning all. Morning, Jason. Morning, Q. Looking fresh. Yeah. Feeling as, good. As you are, yes. What did you get up to last night? Uh, dinner with a dear friend. Oh, lovely. Yes. Good catch up. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Just a uh, quiet Friday in Bris Vegas. Uh, Home oh, test for me. I'm not yeah, on tour like yeah. you. No, well, I had a, had a, went for a little run and then had a had a, some Thai food and, and just watched a bit of TV. Very quiet night. Ah, Thai food. Mm. Do tell more. Shaheen bowling to Labashain. Gets underneath a bouncing ball he thought of pulling and decided not to as it goes eye height through to Cooper Mohammed Rizwan. He went the salt and pepper tofu last night. Oh, right. Delightful. Absolutely delightful. Tofu? Yeah. yeah. Join, the, join the tofu. Okay. It was nice. Yeah. It's very nice. Well, it's going to be a long day, I think, for the tourists. Uh, I think you're right, without a doubt. Overrate, minus three up on the board. I think that's being generous. Shaheen bowling to Manus. He defends on the offside and won't get a run there. One for 326, Australia. Made 312 yesterday for the loss of Joe Burns' wicket for 97. David Warner pressing on and Manus Labashain. Yet again past 50 in test cricket. The sixth time he's got to the half hundred. Yet to get to triple figures. I, I think it's only a matter of time. I, I think he's in, a, in, in fine form, Manus. We saw some wonderful knocks during the Ashes. He's playing the ball late, playing it straight. He's doing well. Shaheen to him, and he defends on the onside, and the bowler scurries in his follow-through to prevent the run. Two slips, Scully, point, cover, mid-off, mid-on, and we did see a couple of bouncing deliveries. They've got the trap out, deep square, and a deep fine leg. If indeed Manus takes the option to try and play the pull or the hook stroke, and misconstrues. I was just chatting with with Jim about Marnus and you know what I think he's done really well last 12 months his management on and around off stump has been very good but he's also playing the ball very late playing it under his eyes the left arm over the wicket bounces and there is the pull from Labashain he doesn't get all of that but it balloons midway between the pitch and the boundary out on the western side of the field and a couple of runs for Labashain as Yassir Sher comes in to do the fielding he moves to 70 one for 328 they're not in total control of that shot. Manus, it seemed to get to him a bit quicker than he anticipated. He rocked it. He, just, he, he didn't necessarily get onto the back foot. He more like stood up and, and accessed the ball through the leg side there. The replay showing it got high on the bat and not right out of the meat. Shaheen to him again. That's full driven and stopped by the bowler in his follow through. That was a lovely time stroke to a half volley but pumped straight back to Shaheen. He's been scoring a lot of runs. He's been playing a lot of cricket, Manus Labashain. But I had a chat to him on Sunday in the lead into the Test match, and he did score a white ball 100 in the domestic game against your old mob, South Australia here. But outside of that, there's been lots of half centuries in tough conditions, it must be said, the majority of... Queensland Shield games to start the season have been here at the Gabba. Shaheen is to him, full driven, just wide of mid off. He takes a cheeky single, gets to the non strikers in time before the throw can threaten a misdemeanour there. Azar Ali moving to his left through, missed. Manus will keep the strike. That's the end of the over. He's 71. Warner 152, Australia 1 for 
329. He also played for played for Glamorgan in the county championship and you know, heaps of he, runs there. Yeah, he scored a big 100, 180 against uh, the Sussex Sharks at Hove. Um, yeah, we were sick of the side of him. Um, he played beautifully, to be fair to him. Yeah. 18 innings, mm. 10 times t past 50 yeah. in uh, county cricket, and, and five of those he went on to get 100, and, and Rick's just given me the numbers. The last red ball 100 he scored was back on the 30th of June. So since then, he's been past 50 three times in shield cricket. Uh, he's desperate to get another red ball 100. He's facing Imran here. New over, driven down the onside of the pitch, but straight to mid on. There's no run. He scored 81 here in the day-night test against Sri Lanka mm -hmm. earlier in the year. And uh, when I spoke to him, he's a very nice young man, very respectful, saying, gee, you've I've passed 50 a lot of times, and as soon as he saw the question coming, he's like, oh, and, and asked him about, well, what is it? Is it technique, temperament, so all of those things? It's just part of me developing my game, playing more cricket, learning how to get the daddy hundred. Well, he's got no better chance than today to go on against, on a good surface against this Pakistan attack. No better chance to get a test hundred. Two slips, two gullies here for Imran to Lubbershane. Short, pulled beautifully through mid-wicket. Got it down quickly. It races through the infield and out to the rope on the eastern side of the field for four. Lubbershane to 75. Australia leads almost by 100. They're 93 in front at one for 333. That's a lovely shot. A little bit more controlled than the, the pull shot he played last over against Afridi. Probably didn't quite bounce as much from Imran Khan. Probably a bit s slower as well. But a lovely shot. And, and it's brought about a change in the field. Cute. Man's dropping back, square leg. So mid-wicket, who was in the infield, has now gone two-thirds the way to the boundary. Fine leg's in the deep. And now just the one gully with the two slips for the right armour Imran. Bollington Labashane leaves it outside the off stump. Here's a good number, Rick. Have you been on air this morning? Come on, say good morning to us. How are you, Rick? Hello, Quentin. Hello, everyone. Morning, Feeling good Rick. on this Saturday? Yeah. Excellent. Always, always. So, what's this number? Manus, 20 runs today. Mm. It's not his age. 20 runs today and <laughs> Warner 1 today. Thank you. Nice to welcome you to the broadcast. Thank you. In a vocal capacity. <laughs> Great to have Rick Finlay with us, <laughs> chiming in. I'll tell you what, I listened heaps during the winter, which was fantastic. I reckon Andy Zaltzman was second yeah. to Aggers as the most spoken on air during the really? TMS. He, like the stats man. For, we, we're going to try and get Rick a bit more in Andy's you know, sort of regularity on air. Marnus takes a quick single on the onside, pushing on that uh, eastern side just wide of mid on. Gets a, a single. Did you hear Andy Zaltzman during the TMS winter? Fight? I did, occasionally, yes. Were you yes. envious? Uh, no, no, I'm happy. I'm okay, happy, good. Yes. But he's, uh, he's, got, he's, he's got a second career as a stand-up comedian, hasn't he? As, uh, so he's well practiced at this sort of art. You're pretty good after stumps. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Silence is golden. Good on you, Rick. Thanks, Quentin. Good start. You just start. put him on the spot a little bit there, Q. Well, that's okay. Yeah. It's all good camaraderie here. Okay. Even though the game might be meandering, you never know what's coming next ball. <laughs> Imran around the wicket, bowling to David Warner, who defends. And Imran picks up in his follow-through. That's the skill of the game, Diz, isn't it? It is. You never know what's coming next ball. Keep yourself sharp. That's why we love the game so much. One for 3.34. The SMS number is 0467920222. G'day to Big O. Hi, boys. Listening intently while walking over the beautiful Tasman Bridge. Go the Tassie boys. Alistair Nicholson's pumping his fist in the back of the box. As is Rick. It was an Apple isle -a -thon earlier this morning with Tim Payne and Alistair down there having a chat, getting Rick in. Oh, it would have been a love-in, wouldn't it? Hey? Oops. <laughs> Imran around the wicket to Warner. Leaves it go. That was a well-directed delivery, just shaping back towards the top of off stump, but Warner's pad was across and the bat was raised and it goes through to Rizwan. Untouched. Warner 152, Lubbershane 76, end of the over one for 334. Quentin Hull and Jason Gillespie with you on Grandstand Test Cricket. 
Yes, the southern part of the continent's been prominent mm -hmm. so far this morning. Payne, Nicholson, mm -hmm. Winlay. Yep. Tasman George football. Bailey in the news as well. Yes. Chance to be a player yeah. or player, player selector. selector. Yes. I, for what it's worth, and I, I don't know if, if that is happening, but I, I think if that did happen, I think that would be a massive positive for Australian cricket. We'll get you to expand on that. Mm. As we wait for Shaheen Shah Free to commence his 22nd over, has none for 58 from those previous 21 with the five maidens. Two slips, gully, point, cover, mid off, mid on. Those two men are out still for Shaheen to Manas, who tries to play a late cut and is beaten. Goes through to the keeper without Willow, but it, that was a near thing. It almost looked like he tried to run that through the through third slip. Yeah, I reckon he, he tried. It went between bat and pad. Late decision to bring the blade down on that. Oh, yeah. And that was a chance of a nick through to the keeper or an inside edge onto the woodwork. Well bowled from Shane Shah Free. And it looked like he might have just got a hint of movement through the air at 138.4 kilometres an hour. So it's good pace. Let's see if that gives the tourists some bubble. Shaheen the left arm, a full inside edge onto pad. That ballooned where the short leg would have been. But there's not one there, and they'll take a cheeky two to the square leg umpire. And the crowd like oh, that. Oh, that is so frustrating as a bowler. Ball go to the square leg umpire and come back for two. Oh, frustrating. And it would have gone chest height to short leg. Yeah. <laughs> one for 336. Manus to 78. Yeah, very frustrating, that. Good delivery, that the length uh, from Shaheen Afridi there. Very good. It's been a, been a decent over so far, his first two deliveries. Another warm day ahead and plenty of colour on the Saturday at the Gabba. And Shaheen bowls and Labashane leaves that one go. Now, we enjoy every day we come to the test match cricket but I don't think we're going to have as much fun as the guys just down to our right uh, they are the Gabba Troopers now, where, where are you pointing on? just to the right of the players pavilion so yep. at the Vulture Street end yep. slightly western side of the field they're all wearing the white hats you know they've got they've got storm trooper oh, visors right two years oh yes, yes two years ago they came for a, a 40th birthday there was 80 of them right they didn't come last year because of the different scheduling shaheen Damanis lets it go yeah. so they're back this year but there's 180 of them today and there's one darth vader among them <laughs> I haven't, oh, there, there he is darth standing up at the moment <laughs> so he's the guest of honor it's generally one of the group that's celebrating some type of right. milestone. It was a 40th birthday a couple of years ago. Yep. So we had the Richies yesterday. They're a sort of what, what a familiar no part now of the colour in the stands. Idea, novel idea, that. Fantastic. They march from a couple of blocks away. Right. <laughs> Someone's got a ghetto blast. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Here comes Shaheen. Bowling to Manus lets it go again. He remains on 78, one for 336. Really, um, in Star Wars, the Emperor's uh, troopers were dressed in red, weren't Yeah, they? the Red Guards. The Red Guards, mm -hmm. yeah. They, they looked intimidating. Yeah, they were all pretty intimidating, weren't they? Oh, absolutely. And Rick's just pointing to me, oh, one of the, uh, one of the Storm Troopers, got a couple of them, they've got trumpets. Wow. So there's a bit of colour if you're thinking of coming down to the ground today in and around Brisbane. Absolutely fantastic. It's what makes a day at the cricket, doesn't it? Particularly a long hot day, which we're on the prospect of here. Yeah. Labashain on his toes, turning Shaheen again. Out through the onside, big call of no as they take one. Yassir coming in hard from the deep mid-wicket boundary to keep the scoring to a single. Labashain keeps the strike. Jason Gillespie's on his way. Good to have a former Australian quick, a Ponytail Express with us. Manus 79, Warner is 152, and Australia 1 for 337, having started the day at 1 for 312. So 25 runs added without loss in 36 minutes. Good morning, Ramiz Raja. It is a pleasure to see you once again with us. Hello, Saya. How are we today? Look, I am 
fine. All right, okay, but we are not. No, your countrymen have <laughs> got a fair bit of work to do to yeah, I mean. get into this test. And I would suggest, dare I be so provocative, uh, <laughs> many are wondering whether there'll be a fourth innings in this test match at the moment. That's right, yeah. Um, so they'll have to bat out of their skins. Um, Wish they did in the fourth innings yeah, that's three right. years ago. But, you know, when, when you're on the defensive, a different mechanism kicks in. And, and there are only a handful who can alter their game and not get out when you're supposed to be absolutely sure that your wicket is so vital that if you lose your wicket, then disaster will ensue. So that's a different mindset altogether. And there are very few in the business who can manage that kind of a role. Um, Sunil Gavaskar of India was phenomenal in that regard. You know, it, it, it'd be so good at defending and, and playing for a draw. Um, and I, I, I mean, Asa Shafiq did it last time here, um, didn't he? Um, yep, 137 in the yeah. second inning. And this is a good batting strip. So I, I don't know how they're feeling. I mean, it depends on, you know, the, the circumstances, the dressing room environment. What are they thinking right now? They're completely down. Spin into the attack. Yassir starting a spell. Driven by Lavashane through cover. That's an exquisite stroke. Getting to the pitch. Stroking beautifully. Out to the rope for four. Oh, it was nowhere near a loose warm-up ball from Yassir. But that was a cover drive of class. Up to 83, Manus. Yeah, gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. I saw him play spin extremely well in UAE, I think it was last season or a couple of seasons back. Yeah, it's October like... of 2018. Yeah, uh, and he, he looked pretty organized because the uh, ball was spinning like a top. And he uh, really did a good job. Again, he drives, but this time straight to cover. So that previous stroke bringing up his highest test score, going past the 81 that he scored in the day-night fixture against Sri Lanka earlier this year. I mean, it's so good that uh, you're playing against Pakistan when your form is in upswing. Yasir over the wicket. Beats. Oh. Manas outside the off stump, probing in defence, slapping into the gloves of Mohammad Rizwan. Nice response from the wristy. Yeah, I mean, did that spin? Yeah, gripped and spun quite nicely for Yasir. Slip and short leg of the close catching men. At one for 341. Yassir whirring away. Ah, yes, Labashane gets full blade to that in defence. He'd be thinking, what a day to bat. One for 340 odd. I'm 83 not. I'm here at the Gabba. It's my sixth time past 50 in Test cricket. But next ball, next ball. Here he is driving again, similar to earlier in the over. Getting to the pitch, but this time... The man out in the deep will ensure it's just a couple. And Manus moves to 85 on that stroke. One for 343. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a lovely driver of the ball. We saw a couple of wake drives um, off um, Shine Shah Freedy. And he's not been bad against Yasser so far. Easy, carefree driving from him. Skipper Azar Ali has just come over to have a quick chat to Yasser Shah. In fact, it was Harris Sahail who's having a chat to him. Both of them have the broad brim. Oh, here we go. Aussie Bob. The Gabba Troopers on the, the trumpet. As Yasir comes in. Yeah, and indeed. Manus defends. Back to the spinner. That's the end of the over. Well. Ramiz. Yes. Ugh. <laughs> Where are nine wickets coming from? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a tough one. I... I you know, they, they just need to be mentally tough now um, because it's a beautiful batting day um, and both batsmen are batting love, you know, look to be in great touch. So if I were captaining them right now, it'll be managing the, the faculty, the mind games, you know. Let's not completely be disengaged. Somehow we've got to find some rhythm, something to cheer um, and, and just hang in there. Um. Well, the youngster's coming in to have a bowl. Nasim Shah, I wonder how his body felt this morning when he rolled out of bed. Yeah. It's tough for him. 16 overs yesterday in the heat. None for 65. Some good pace. 
which we expected, but how is the teenager going to back up? Bowling to David Warner with two slips. Warner lets that go outside the off stump. And uh, we'll have a, an eye on the speed gun throughout this over that warm-up around the 140 kph. Yeah, I mean, he's got a lovely action, but uh, I don't know how fit he is uh, and how the body will react uh, after a 16-over burst. Uh, he put in everything yesterday. I mean, he, he, he looked energetic and he came back strongly uh, in, in every follow-up spell. But this is, this is a different ball game, test cricket. It tests you out completely. Gully in as well with those two grippers behind David Warner, who's 152. He stands tall and defends on the offside. And that one around the 140 as well. His first over yesterday, at the end of it, he was up around the 148 kph, which was the quickest of the, the bowling we saw yesterday. I just hope they don't tell him to reduce pace and look to pitch the ball in one area. I think uh, you, you lose Nassim completely. I think you've got to just keep it simple for him. The task and the brief has got to be simple to just go out there and bowl as fast as you can. Um, around the stumps now, so different angle. Uh, and why not? Yeah, I, I mean, his USP is pace. So you, you can't drop your pace for line and length. You've got to get into rhythm by bowling fast. So the Stuart Broad line for the 16-year-old Nassim Shah around the wicket to David Warner. 152 knot, Nassim delivers yeah, yeah, yeah. into the body of Warner and he works it off his hip to mid-wicket for a comfortable single. And Shaheen Shah, Alfredi comes across from it on to do the fielding. So now that doubles David Warner's contribution today. He scored two runs compared to Manus Labashain's 30. Uh, almost a second slip, isn't it? How would you describe that field behind the wicket? <laughs> uh, yeah, a, a first slip, a fourth slip, first slip and then maybe a gully. He hasn't flicked wristily past the square leg umpire, brings a deep square leg into play and Labashain's through for another gentle single, keeping things ticking over and Australia one away from the 400 mark now, just three wickets down, weighed on 30, Labashain 105 post-lunch crowd are sort of amusing themselves down there it's a it's a spotty beach ball all the colors of the rainbow in giant polka dots on a transparent uh, ball. Oh, I think the, the stewards got it no uh, not yet uh, yeah, <laughs> not it won't yet. be long <laughs> won't be long before the stewards uh, take that yeah the stormtroopers were bouncing it around and that's yeah. when it made its way onto the outfield Gosh. now again the field constantly switching because of the right hand left hand combination and we're seeing that the same field again so cannot bolt the stumps no with this field matt wade waits taps his bat against the ground imran is in that's better he's pushing it across the left hander but wade's happy to let it go through to the keeper but at least there the line that was where he needed it to be but the key to having a plan and i don't mind if, if they're going to stack the offside field and and bowl channel that's fine but a captain's got to be able to trust that his bowler can implement that plan. And, and at the moment, I'm just not sure that if, for one reason or another, Imran, Imran Khan hasn't been able to implement the plans that have been put in place by, by you know, well, he, he's worked in conjunction with, with his captain. Just hasn't, at the end of the day, just hasn't got the skill right. Yeah, he's bowled that, he's bowled 17 overs so far. Uh, the fewer of all the, the Pakistan bowlers, none for 54. Uh, Nassim Shah's bowled 20, but one for 68, the value of the, the wicket of David Warner. It's immeasurable, really. Well, his point of difference is his pace. Yeah. So you're, you're happy if he's, if he's leaking a few runs or he's not quite getting it right. I mean, he's 16 years of age. He's not going to get it right all the time. Iftikhar Ahmed, a bit more spin. He's knocked into the onside for a square leg. No run. And there are a number of players in the Pakistan team who can roll their arm over with a bit of spin just to try and vary things a little bit around the wicket a little bit quick at that time Not by Labashain turning again to mid-wicket finds Baba Azam and there is no run again that's Labashain just looking at a picture of calmness really out in the middle if to cut he just well, held his palms up to the skies if say come on Manas are you not ready I'm ready to bowl 
Marlis is ready now, and if the car comes in, quicker yeah, 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 again. Lavashen moving forward, yeah, using his wrist, yeah, turns it to Baba again along the ground, out towards yeah, yeah, square yeah, leg. Lavashen is maiden test century, brought up in the morning session, in the hour before lunch. Yeah, Top yeah. edge, but it'll be safe. He's turned around the corner, looking for a little paddle sweep, finds Nassim Shah down at fine leg, and he's gone three for one. And that takes Australia to 400. Dominant, dominant display with the bat. They're three for 400 in reply to Pakistan's 240. So extending that lead. All the wicket's still in hand. Travis Head will be due in next, mm. South Australian. Of course, the captain, uh, Tim Payne. Come in, Stark, Hazelwood, Lyon. And of course, if, the, if Pakistan do start to take wickets, the innings may well run its natural cause. But otherwise, Dizzy, what are you thinking if you're oh, yeah. Tim Payne about how much... Longer to bat four, looking at time as well. If to go around the wickets and Wade going back, plays into the offside no run. Yeah, it's a good discussion. But I, I, I think you're right. I, I think that the, the innings will just take its natural course. I think, you know, Pakistan take a couple of wickets and, you know, the, the Australians should not look too far ahead and just focus on the, on the moment. Slipping short leg in place. If to go in quicker again. I think that was Wade coming forward, working into the onside finds a fielder so no run but there is a bit of an urgency about Matt Wade's batting that's his sort of natural instinct isn't it to attack because, because we had a little bit of a discussion after play last night and, you know, what, what is the uh, game plan for the Australians looking forward and, and we were discussing it on the ground and, you know, for me I, I look at those situations and you can, you can sort of assume things and look a little bit too far ahead rather than actually just, just keep playing the game just, just staying in the moment not looking too far ahead the, the two guys out there just develop a partnership, just grow that partnership. Scoreboard, you, you, you play well, the scoreboard will look after itself. And then, you know, come tea time, then you can reassess. Yeah. Imran Khan again, 7-2 offside field to Labashain. He bowls on length and it's turned up to mid-on. He's outside that off stump. Shaheen is there to pick up. And uh, Imran Khan again, and I... Oh, Sounds like I'm picking on him a bit, but it, it's just too short. Like, uh, a gabber, you know, if, the, if a batsman is constantly playing the ball off his back foot um, from a hip height, it, it's just too short. And we see it a lot. International teams come to Australia, and they're almost always the bowling attacks bowl too short. Why is that? I mean, it's a, it just a something that gets in their minds about the pitch or the bounce. That's a little bit fuller, but it's flicked wristily out through the vacant mid-wicket region by Labashain. Uh, brings Nassim in off the deep mid-wicket boundary. He's taken one. I think it's a couple of things, and I think you used to see it at the Wacker as well. Yeah. I, I think it's twofold. One, I think international bowlers I, I seem as they come to a place like the Gabba or the Wacker, they see the bounce and carry, they get a little bit carried away and think, well, how good is this? The keeper's taking it around his <laughs> shoulder height. Whatever, but but also I think because in Australia the the, the pitches are good and and the ball isn't moving around as much. I, there seems to be this thing bowlers don't like being hit back down the ground, being driven back down the ground. Um, but surely that's got to be better than being cut and pulled. Mm, seeing the ball disappearing to the boundary. Uh, over the wicket now and pushed across the left-handed Wade into the gloves of Rizwan. Wade leaves it well alone. And I, I just think there's a, a little bit of little bit of that that creeps in that don't want to be hit back down the ground, but but I think it's a risk versus reward. Like I, I look at someone like Dale Stane, who I think is one of the best bowlers that I've, I've ever seen, um, and one of the best bowlers that played the game. Um, I reckon he's probably been driven as much, if not more, than any other seamer in the world. But he creates wicket-taking opportunities off the front foot, so he pitches the ball up. And I just don't think we see, we've seen enough of that by the Pakistan seamers in this game. Two slips, the gap to the gully. As Wade crouches low and he's letting that one go again. That was almost a lavishane like leave, just bringing the bat across in front of his body. The only Aussie batters, they like to add a little bit of mayo, a bit of <laughs> mayonnaise to their leaves, don't they? There's just a little bit of an extra flurry. Maybe the, the Steve Smith effect is just... Mm, it seems to be trickling down <laughs> through the team, doesn't it? Trickling down through the team. They see Steve do it. Yeah, they just add a little bit of mayo to their own specific leave. We've seen Manus do it. We've seen Wadey 
There's got to be a little bit of risk attached to certain <laughs> leaves. I mean, the reason isn't there why the leave is so often raising the bat above the head and out of harm's way. We've seen you know, those batsmen who sometimes then leave by raising the bat and bring them away. Sometimes you see that periscope effect. Uh, in running again, left alone once more by Wade. He brought that back forward. So it ended up pointing down the pitch at the non-striker's end. That was rather Steve Smith-like. I, I remember years ago bowling to the great Courtney Walsh. Mm. And um, he had some very elaborate uh, leaves. I'm not even sure if he was trying to leave the ball, but um, <laughs> it, it was quite it was comical in there, the way he would go about the, the leaves when, when he was batting. He wasn't, wasn't known for his batting, of course. No. Did he get bat on a few when you were bowling to him? Uh, yeah, he, yeah, he was all right, Courtney. He was okay. He, tail ender to yeah. fast bowler to tail ender, fast bowler. Gee, I didn't want to bounce him, that's for sure. Mm. Uh, Imran, in again, up past the umpire, Wade's leaving that one alone too. It's just pushed across the left-hander. So when, he, when he's operating that line, yeah. then, yeah, it's tying up the runs at least, and Spot Wade isn't on. being tempted. But, but it's just, uh, I suppose the point I'm trying to make, is that there just hasn't been enough consistency with that. You know, you talk about l looking to hit a spot on the pitch, you know, it's about the size of a size of a tea towel, I suppose. You know, late on a good line, good length. You know, Imran Khan bowling for the left-handed Wade going across it because he bowls quite wide of the crease, doesn't he? So he sets that offside field. If he could just keep in that, in that channel, in that corridor and be disciplined, yes, he's doing a job for the team. But I think where the criticism has been for from me to in this game has been he hasn't been able to do that often enough. Iftikhar into Lavashane. He goes to that paddle sweep. He connects it well this time. Down to fine leg. That's what he tried to do in the previous over. But a misfield from Shine Afridi. Right on the boundary edge. Sends the ball over the rope. He tumbled over. It didn't really time the stop. Uh, well executed by Lavashane. In the last over, the ball took the top edge and ballooned, albeit safely. But that time he connected well. And he's on 1-1-1. One, one, one. Nelson, that would have had oh. umpire David Shepard, Shepard hopping. Hopping on his, yeah. <laughs> One foot to the other. Well, it's quite comical, that, watching. Talk about you know, batsmen having superstitions. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, an umpire superstition. Uh, leg slip is in place now after that sweep. Labashane oh. this time comes forward and strokes it gently oh. into the onside oh. defensively. And there's no run. So just going to try and anticipate on... Or, Maybe even prevent Lavashane from playing that sweep. A bit of a short arm jab past mid wicket this time. Takes a single out to the deep. The throw comes in and gathered by Rizwan over the stumps. Australia a three for 406, leading by 166. And Lavashane building on his maiden test century on his home ground here in Queensland. 112 not out. Looking composed. He's played beautifully, hasn't he? It's been, been a very fine innings. Got an update here on the New Zealand-England test match Ooh. going on at Mount Manganui. Well, you'd be and interested in that, Ali. Yep, keeping half an eye on it. If the <laughs> car around the wicket a little bit quicker, oh, no. Fuller and Wade brings his bat down, defends. Uh, New Zealand are trailing by just 37 now. Five for 316. Oof. England made 353. They had a bit of a late order collapse, didn't they, at the back end of yes. the England innings. Tim Southey took a few in quick succession. As if the car is around the wicket yeah, again, yeah, Wade coming yeah, forward. Yeah, yeah. Mothers of all defends back up the pitch. Uh, VJ Watling, 79 not out, and de Gronholm is on 65. Of course, New Zealand coming over here to play yeah, Perth, Melbourne and Sydney. Talk about great names in cricket. Colin de Grundham is, <laughs> is, is up there, one. isn't it? car in way, going back, cutting past the umpire. Out through deep point. Two men in hot pursuit. The ball's racing away, though. I think that's before. Was that pulled in inside the rope? Just. Just been saved. I'll go back and have another look, but the throw comes back in. And the score's moved on to 409. Yeah, Sean Massoud down there doing another I think work. He's over this. Yeah. It's really good effort, that. Got down on his front, timed the slide. The little drag back, the pullback with his fingertips. And then the, the relay throw went back into the middle. So three for 400 and. Nine. Oh, just a little bit excited. Just a Queensland Bull coach, Bulls coach, Wade Second. Oh, he's joined us. 
I've snuck in. I wasn't standing, I was sneaking in, but I was walking yeah. past and saw Mitch Johnson and he just dragged me in. Yeah, so, so, so you saw you the, in the media area before. Mm. Didn't think I'd see you again today, Chuck. No, no, I was trying to get in, do what I had to do and get out and, <laughs> right. and, and listen to it on the, on the radio. That was my whole plan. I don't need to be speaking on the radio. You are now. Welcome. Yeah, <laughs> Here's Imran Khan. Oh, and this time Wade comes forward looking to manoeuvre himself in a position to work that through mid-wicket, but it comes off the outside part of the bat into the ground of the offside. Azar Ali is there to pick up. I should introduce myself to you, Wade, because I haven't met you before. Alison Mitchell. Nice Hello, to Alison. meet you. How are you going? Love meeting people on the air. <laughs> this is your home ground, of course. It yeah? is. So, it is. Yeah. What a great ground. Doesn't look good today. Yeah. And, of course, looking after... I mean, you must be absolutely proud as punch of Marnus Labashain. Oh, how good. Yeah. How good. <laughs> finally, finally cracked his, uh, the three figures. Um, great for him. Great moment yeah. for him. So he's at the non-striker's end at the moment as Wade settles over his bats and Imran bustles up to the crease. It's a little bit fuller, pushed across him once more and Wade's content to let it go. And he remains on 33. Yeah, we were talking about his celebration. He was talking about his celebration, just saying how he had planned in his head or thought or dreamt, you know, what you would do when you reach three figures in a test match for Australia and then it really didn't go to plan at all. He didn't really know what he did. <laughs> Not rapid, but... They just, those pitches just felt so quick and there was always a ridge just sort of back of a length. So, yeah, they were not nice to bat in. Um, I actually hit David Warner on the finger there and broke his finger or thumb before a one-day series. Yeah, I was, I was about to say, Wacker Net Sessions have got a history of that or had a history of yeah. that over the years. Yeah, they're, they're a bit, bit shady. Yeah, I see a shot. Starts a new over. Lyon plays a delectable late cut to third man for four. Waited. Opened the blade and glides it like a number three down to third man. Beautiful shot. See, he's got the technique. He would have said to Paddy Cummins, I'll just hold up this end, mate. Take the spinner and you take the quicks, mate. Yeah, nice shot. Didn't overhit it. Just use the pace. Lead is 327 at 8 for 5, 6, 7. Line to 5 with that beautiful shot. Yassir's response has him defending on the offside. Yeah, the cricket's great loss with the Wacker not hosting as many test matches these days is that there was always some story before the test, so it seemed in the nets at the Wacker as line is forward pushing on the offside. Yassir Shah has just reached a record at this venue. He's now conceded 195 runs in his spell. Bowling over the wicket here. Beats line. Spins past the outside edge. Well bowled. He's in his 47th over. Has figures of one maiden, three for 195. And that's the most conceded in a spell by a bowler at the Gabba. He whirs away and Lyon turns it down the onside of the pitch. Mushtaq Muhammad conceding 194 back in 99-2000. So another Pakistani player being replaced at the top of that list as Yasir Bowles left alone by Lyon outside the off stump. That did spin. It's starting to grip and bounce a bit late on this third day. End of the over. 8 for 567. Mitchell Johnson's gone. Jason Gillespie's coming in. It's those Wacker net sessions. Used to be a feature before the test match. It was almost like cameras must film Wacker net sessions. Or you might miss getting the, the footage of the batsman getting cracked on the forearm or the digits. Do you ever whack anyone there, Diz? Can't remember hitting anyone there. I do remember a net session when uh, Shane Watson was bowling to me once and I noted that he was bowling no balls so I took the stumps out and I moved them back a couple of feet and then stood right back because I needed every metre of the <laughs> to be able to play the ball. Chain 15 from a double. Oh, he's not going to get there. It's two in a row now for Shaheen. And heartbreak at the Gabba. 
for Marnus Labashain. No issue. It's going to have to go, though. I mean, the last probably four or five minutes from Marnus Labashain, a little bit streaky. You put that down to being tired. Oh, that's yeah! a good over. Little edge and way goes. Harris breaks through. A wicket from nowhere. And Matty Wade departs for 60. See in the replay, was he just trying to just, just trying to open the face and work it and got the faintest of feathers. And off uh, Rizwan's pads, he caught it the third attempt. Got him down the leg side. A strangle. And Travis Head knows it. Harry Sahel with his second wicket. Deep into this innings. It's not the most spectacular dismissal mode that you'll ever see, but to watch the wicket keeping here. There's turn, bounce, and a little feather in perfect position there, Rizwan. Well done, young man. Is there any bat in it? They like it. And given. Umpire Richard Kettlebrook puts the finger up. And Shaheen Afridi gets his first wicket. Tim Payne. It's a frustrating way to be dismissed for the Australian captain. This occasion, just a little bit unlucky from Tim Payne there. Just a little under edge onto the thigh guard. Goes up in the air and second slip. He's in the right spot and uh, they're pretty confident. Seven run lead. We're seeing a fourth innings. No, I don't believe so. Yeah, I think you're in the majority. <laughs> if you think otherwise, get on the SMS zero four six seven nine two zero triple two or any other thoughts. They're welcome here. Q, I'd like to just give a shout out to my son. He's thirteen. He's playing today. His first senior cricket match so down wow. where we live down on the Fleurier Peninsula the, the Yankalilla Cricket Club the Yankalilla Tigers so he's playing a I think it's a 35 over game today or 40 over game what's his name Jackson 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 Gillespie, Gillespie. is uh, I, I haven't been able to kill been looking on my cricket I haven't been able to keep up to date and Hasn't uh, put, the scores haven't been put on yet, so I hope they're going well. The Yankalilla Tigers. Hazelwood faces defends Imran. Gets a run, in fact, off an inside edge towards the square leg umpire. So the big hoff is off the mark. Well, if if you're around the Yankalilla Tigers today, mm. zero four six seven nine two zero triple two on the SMS. Yes. Let us know how Jackson yep. Gillespie went. Yes, let us know the score because I know that they won the the game this morning. So he played the under 16s this morning. Mm -hmm. And what's his proficiency? Uh, he enjoys bowling. Yeah, he enjoy, he's um, he, when he goes into bat, he tries to hit a six first ball. He okay, just goes in and slogs. So the junior ponytail express. Yeah, well, he did have a long hair. Um, just like that. A year ago, uh, it was quite long, um, but he 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 cut it off. It's he, but he's in the process of growing it again. He, well, he good. liked the he liked the the hair with the he wear the headband. Yeah. He, wow. Yeah. Just like Jacko, Jack. yep. Australia nine down, leading by plenty. 3.28 to be precise. Imran the line. Down the leg side, is there a feather there? No. Rizwan takes it, no appeal. Right arm? Right arm? Yep. Yep. Yeah, he's a right armer. Tall young man? He's, yeah, he's, um, yeah, he's, he's about a centimetre off. Uh, he, he's nearly overtaken his mum. Mm -hmm. Um... My wife Anna, she's 5'9", so okay. Jackson is, is fast approaching. He's At 13 years of age? Uh, yes. He, um, yeah, I think he's going to be a big unit. I think all our boys are, to be fair. Mm. Uh, um, they're going to be tall lads. They're taller than their old man, I think. Wow. Mm. Speaking of big men, Nimran's quite the figure. Running, bouncing line, pulled nicely on the bounce. 
One bounce to fine leg for a single. Line moves to six. Nine for 569. That's the end of the over from Imran Khan. Played that pretty well, Nathan Lyon. Just, uh, just helped it on its way. Although Imran Khan not bowling overly quick. Four seasons for Shane Watson in Tasmania. Four seasons. As a Tasmanian's about to join you, Alistair Nicholson. Don't miss a moment. ABC Grandstand's coverage of the cricket. Australia versus Pakistan. On your radio, Grandstand Digital. And on the ABC Listen app. I could almost visualise you playing that in a former life, Dizzy, when you were the, the long-haired fast bowler. <laughs> nice riff. Nine for 569. Yassir is bowling here to Nathan Lyon. Oh, he defends back to the bowler. Lyon is six. Hazelwood one. And we're in for an exciting end to the day here because Pakistan will be batting at some point. Yassir over the wicket line, back in his crease, pushing to the offside. And there's no run. So Shan Masood and Azhar Ali will be mentally preparing themselves, Diz? Uh, it'll certainly be in the back of their mind. There's no doubt about that. Two slips for Yassir, tossed up, driven, back past the bowler. He just got a fingertip to it, Yassir Shah, and Nathan Lyon's able to get through for a single. He moves to seven. Nine for 570 is the score. The lead is 230, 330 runs. I think that these, these are freebies for Josh Hazelwood for Lyon. Give himself an opportunity to hit a couple of big shots. Fine leg up. There's deep square leg, a short leg, and a slip. Yassir to Hazelwood. Hazelwood oh, defends okay. on the front foot. Third man up. Cover, mid off, and a long on. And there's a mid wicket as well on the onside. Up comes Yassir from the Stanley Street end. Hazelwood. Gotcha, gotcha. Pushes forward in defence and there were cries of catch it, but the ball did pop up. It's straight in front of him and no realistic opportunity for the short leg to dive and take that. Babar Azam is under the lid. Shan Masood had predominantly done the work in close under the helmet during the Australian innings. Hazelwood winds up and drives and drives well. He beats Imran at mid-off and that races out to the boundary. Hazelwood goes to five and Australia nine for 574. Fine shot that. It was, it was well flighted by Yasu Shah and Hazel just rocks onto the front stool and hits through the line. Great shot. Five runs off Yasu Shah's oh, over. 48 oh. overs he's bowled. That brings up his double hundred. Three for 200 for Yasu Shah. Already the most expensive bowling figures in test history at the Gabba, and now up to 200. Who's going to operate here from the Vulture Street end? Imran Khan's yep. coming up. Yep. Nathan Lyon will have the strike. The western side of the ground, about the first 15 metres or so in from the rope now in shade, but the rest of the ground still bathed in sunshine here at the Gabba. Imran wandering to the top of his mark down beneath us. And he's on approach. From, and about just outside what would be the 30 metre circle. Pull shot from Nathan Lyon, but pr protection out at deep forward square leg in just one. Nine for 575. The Lyon has moved to eight. Hazelwood's five. Yeah. Could have a bit of a conversation. What would Nathan Lyon be saying here to Josh Hazelwood? Uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually. Not. I thought only the top water uh, yeah. batsman did that. Well, we, 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 you know, the tail enders. You go down there and you, you pretend you know what you're doing, know what you're talking about, and it's like when you see tail enders go down and tapping the wicket. Like, what is that all about? Well, we were watching some footage earlier, Quentin Hull and I of uh, the great. Courtney Walsh and some of his antics at times. <laughs> and you were actually bowling. 
I remember. This might have been the 99 series, I reckon. Imran bowls, and he beats the outside edge of Josh Hazelwood's bat. He was... I don't know what he was doing there, Hazelwood. Just sort of dangled the bat and almost said, nick me off. But there was one leave in particular where... <laughs> Courtney Walsh came forward and threw the bat under his arm like an umbrella, like he was swishing it as he went down the street. That's right. I, I, from memory, I think that was in Barbados, and it was in 99. It was that when, if you remember, Brian Lara hit yes. 53, not out. Um, yeah, we, oh, we threw everything at the West Indian players there, and, and Lara was just far too good. He was What a wonderful player he was. But, yeah, Courtney, uh, yeah, he gave us a little bit of mirth. <laughs> Two slips in a gully. Imran bowls. Hazelwood swats, but straight to Yasir Shah at cover. And there's no run. He was having a good old time out there. And there were lots of shots of Steve Waugh. Lots of tight shots coming up. And the Aussie captain, I don't think, was enjoying his day at yeah, the Yeah, there, there were a couple of teapots and arms folded. I mean, look, we, we were... You sort of sense we were witnessing a pretty special knock. Yeah. So I remember getting the ball to reverse swing, like, quite late. Um, but Brian, and I, I was trying to go into Courtney to try and... I had about four or five balls at him to try and knock him over, but he, to be fair to him, he, he hung in. Imran's coming around the wicket to the left-handed Hazelwood, who attempts to drive, and he's beaten outside the line of the off stump. Um, what were your methods to try and, and bowl to a Brian Lara? Or, I mean, what was it that made him so hard to bowl to? <laughs> what I always felt with Brian was... Because he, he, he was a very adaptable player to the conditions, the surface. He, he would change his pre-ball movements um, and adjust those. Um, but you always felt that if you bowl your best delivery, he could hit it pretty much anywhere he wanted to, depending on the mood he was in. That always made him a challenge. Up comes Imran Khan. Bowls to Hazelwood, who pushes off the back foot straight to Yasir in the covers again. So yeah, how he used to do you well, he would, if you remember, sometimes you have a big exaggerated movement right across his stumps. And, and then you'd think, OK, well, I might just adjust my line a little bit outside off to invite the, the edge. Um, especially if the ball wasn't swinging back and you know LBW may not have been in the case. So you'd go a little bit wider, but he's, then he'd change his pre-ball movement so he wasn't going as far across. And that created the whip for him. And then he'd lace you through the offside. And you think, all right, what do I do now? Then I get straighter. And then he goes across his stubs and whips you through the leg side. It just, it, it's almost like just toying with you. <laughs> Hazelwood waits him run, bowls a short one outside the off stump that he flashes at with minimal footwork and misses. And that is the end of the over. One run coming off at 9 for 575 Australia, a lead of 335 runs with Hazelwood 5 and Lyon 8. The batsman dismissed for Australia. Cummins 7, we'll go in reverse order. Stark 5, Labashain a brilliant 185, Payne made 13. Head 24, Wade 60, Smith 4. Amazing that Smith made only 4. And what's well, been <laughs> such a good surface when many have cashed in and worn up the first to go today for 154. Yasir Shah is going to bowl again from the Stanley Street end of the ground. Rick's given me the list of bowlers who've conceded 200 runs in an innings in Australia. So Yasir... Has done that here with three for 200 as he bowls to line. Line plays to square leg. Sean Masood fields no run. Murali went for 224 at the Wacker in 95-96. Yasir unfortunately has the indignity of being on the list twice, Oof. having done so at the MCG in the 2016-17 series. And here is Nathan Lyon sweeping him away through Ford square leg for four. It's absolutely time the years off that. Nathan Lyon. Jeez, he's hit that hard. He's got down on one knee, in front of square, in the air, to be fair, but well clear of the fielder that's up at square leg. And that's raced away to the boundary. Nine for 579. He's now making them shift the fielders around, Dizzy. They've sent Sean Masood out to deep forward square leg. <laughs> He is dictating terms, Nathan Lyon. Yassir bowls over the wicket. Lyon comes forward and drives and drives well out to deep cover. 
but there is a sweeper and he'll only pick up a single. Line moves to 13, it's 9 for 580. So Yassir at the MCG in 2016-17 went for 207. Now Yassir again here at the Gabba. And has conceded right, over 200, 205 as it stands at the moment. The other bowler on the over 200 list here in Australia, Brett Lee, 201. What venue is that, Rick? In Sydney. Yassir bowls. Ah! And he's hit Hazelwood on the pad and he's been given out. But that sounded very woody and Hazelwood immediately, immediately. reviews. That was very clear, That's the sound of wood coming through TV on Pikes the effects microphone, it would seem LBW dizzy, but... Mm. On-field decision is out. Can we start with the front foot first, please? It did sound woody, didn't it? That's a fair delivery, thank you. Can we have front on spin vision? Looked like he got a half decent stride in Josh Hazelwood. OK, nothing conclusive with that. Can I have um, leg size? Sitting fairly low available? on the pad, but did it hit the bat mm. first? Well below the knee roll, so not going over. Yeah, just rock and roll that, please. <laughs> now, the short leg field okay, is obscuring no, the hot spot. Confirm that, please, with Snickle. And we get to where we should have probably got to in the first place, well, Snicko. Now, all the way through to the pad. There's a flat line all the way, so I'm satisfied to move through to ball tracking when available, please. Ball tracking. Call that has not hit the bat. Pitching in line, impact in line. Ooh. That is going Small to be out. Call and hitting the wicket, so I'll get you to stay with your original decision of out. I'll let you know when you're on screen. Well, I don't know what that sound was, Dizzy, but that is yeah. the end of the Australian innings. All out for 580. Australia with a first innings lead of 340 runs. Hazelwood, the last man dismissed for five. LBW to Yasir Shah, who went for over 200 but finishes the innings with four wickets for Pakistan. Australia all out for 580 in 157.4 overs. Jason Gillespie to sum up the state of the game in that Australian innings. Yeah, just a, a good decision in the end by um, umpire Illingworth. And sort of just uh, came in a little bit of a flurry at the end there, the Australian wickets and and you just sense for this game, it, it's it's probably the right time for Australia to actually get the bowlers out there and have a, have a bowl. There's it's 3:54 here, so they're starting after 4 p.m. Not sure how many overs are left in the day, but there'll be a real opportunity for with Australia's lead of 340. There'll be a real opportunity to make some headway tonight if they bowl well. Well, you'd have to think they're going to go to 5.30 again. It's just been the stock <laughs> standard, hasn't it? You wouldn't expect anything else. Uh, 17 overs remaining, we're hearing, today. And we've got an hour and five minutes until the scheduled stumps. They're not going to get through the 17 in that time, I wouldn't not, have thought, particularly the way the quicks bowled for... Yeah, not quite, but they won't do too. I think it'll be before 5.30. OK. If, if Australia get through their overs, because I want to have as many deliveries as they can. So play's going to recommence at four minutes past four local time. That's in nine minutes from here. So we'll take you through the scoring details with Pakistan dismissing Australia for 580 after Australia resumed at one for 312 today. Warner was caught behind off the bowling of Nassim Shah, who did eventually get his first <laughs> test match wicket, having <laughs> felt like he got Warner yesterday on 56, but a no ball prevented him from being dismissed 154 for Warner Smith followed he was bowled by Yassir for four then Wade caught behind after lunch off the bowling of Harris Sahail for 60 Travis Head caught behind off Harris Sahail for 24 at T it was five for 532 Payne fell in the final session caught Assad at second slip off Shaheen for 13 Labashane then went caught Babar at Gully off Shaheen for 185. Stark LBW Yassir for 5. Cummins caught behind off Imran for 7. And Hazel with the last to go LBW to Yassir for 5. The bowling figures for Pakistan. Let's start with uh, the man who took 4 wickets but also was the most expensive of any test bowler here at the Gabba in the history of matches here. 4 for 205 of 48.4 overs for Yassir Shah. He bowled 1 maiden. 
Then we'll take you down the list. Two for 96 for Shaheen off 34 overs, seven maidens for him. Imran bowled 24 overs, three maidens, one for 73. Nassim, one for 68 off uh, 20 overs. He bowled just the one maiden. Iftikhar bowled 12 overs of spin, none for 53. And Harris Sahail, 19 overs, one maiden, two for 75. Australia dismissed for 580. The lead is 340, so Pakistan will need to make more than 340 runs to make Australia bat again in the game with more than two days remaining. Back for Pakistan, second inning soon. But now, let's head to the latest from the ABC Newsroom. Jamil Wells in the newsroom. Federal Opposition Leader Anthony Albanese says Labor will request a formal briefing from intelligence agencies following claims of a Chinese spy ring operating in Australia. A report commissioned by the South Australian government has found the federal government will have to spend half a billion dollars to relocate submarine shipbuilding from SA to Western Australia. The people of Bougainville are voting on whether to seek independence from Papua New Guinea and opponents of a deep-sea oil drilling project in the Great Australian Bight have taken part in nationwide paddle-out protests. ABC News. The Country Hour. I've gone up around it. Connecting the country to the community. I think it's a great way to stay across agricultural issues around the state. The places... Macquarie Island is a, is a sentinel. The people... You know, at the moment doing around that 40 to 50,000 litres a year. The stories. It's really quite rare. Up until February this year, it would have been equaled the world record. The Country Hour. It's a great way of spreading the word. Weekdays at noon on ABC Radio and the ABC Listen app. ABC Grandstand's coverage of the Test Series. Australia versus Pakistan. Shaheen comes again outside the off stump in the air and caught it. Gully. And Labashane falls for 185. He's leaning on his bat handle. He does not want to go. Barbara Azam, a shake of the hand. In fact, this is really lovely. All the Pakistan players coming forward to shake the hand of Manus Labashane before he departs the field. What a nice touch that is. The spirit of sport is alive and well at the Gabba. And this will be the reception for Manus Labashain. The Gabba rises to him. Baba took the catch. But Manus Labashain, he's turned a maiden test century into a whopping 185 on his home ground. And the crowd are bringing him off. A day Manus Labashain will never forget. We're in the innings break. Australia all out for 580. It's a whopping lead of 340. Pakistan's second innings not far away. But time for us to quickly head around the grounds back to the Newcastle 500, the last round of the supercars this season. Ben Homer. Yeah, thanks, Karen. The penultimate race of the 2019 Supercars Championship has just got underway, and there has been some drama on this very technical course. Jack LeBrock crashed out in the opening laps. The race is extremely tight. Fabian Coulthard is leading the way at the moment. He is, of course, the teammate of Scott McLaughlin. They are leading the way in the team's championship at the moment up against Triple Ace. Triple Eight Race Engineering, Shane Van Gisbergen, and also Jamie Wincup. So it's Coulthard in first. He hasn't gone to the pits, though. And then McLaughlin in second, Wincup third, and Van Gisbergen fourth. Those three drivers have gone to the pits. So Fabian Coulthard will probably drop back. But as it stands currently, Scott McLaughlin will be leading the way once his teammate drops to the pits. So Shane Van Gisbergen and Jamie Wincup have got some work to do if they are to claw back some points in the team's championship. Thank you, Ben, and happy birthday, Ben Homer, as well. It is stumps on day three of the first test between New Zealand and England at Bay Oval in Mount Monganui. New Zealand six for 394. It's a lead of 41. BJ Watling is on 119. Mitchell Santner is on 31. And two results in the WBBL this afternoon. The Scorchers over the Sixers by 52 runs at Lilac o o Hill in Perth. Player of the match, Nat Siver, innings of 52 and also 1 for 27. The Scorchers 5 for 152, the Sixers 9 for 100. And in Ballarat, it was the Melbourne Stars by 7 wickets over the Melbourne Renegades with 4 balls to spare. The Renegades 3 for 165, the Stars 3 for 169. The player of the match, Anna Lanning of the Renegades, top scorer for the match, she made 73. So wins to the Stars and the Scorchers.
players in the WBBL today. So taking you back to the Gabba now, what can Pakistan do with the bat in their second innings after nearly two days in the field and trailing by 340? Let's take you back now to Chris Rogers and Jim Maxwell. Thank you, Karen, and uh, welcome back here. They've got the trophy that's being awarded to the victorious team in their series on display out there, but it's, it's not a real trophy. I mean, you've got to have a trophy that's named after Chris Rogers or someone, haven't you? Uh, I mean, who should it be named after? Australia-Pakistan trophy. The Javed me and Dad Dennis Lilly trophy, I would have thought. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be, doesn't it? That would be excellent. The Lilly... The Lily Javed Trophy, yes. That's How was their relationship post that incident? Oh, I think it was always cordial. Was it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was very funny that day when it, it occurred in Perth. Um, but we need you know, proper trophies, n not to sponsors trophies. It's like South Africa and Australia, there's no trophy, and yet Australia and Zimbabwe plays for the Southern Cross Trophy. If they ever played Test cricket again, <laughs> um, and uh, okay, we've, we've got the Ashes and the Frank Worrell Trophy, the Wisden Trophy for Eng England playing against uh, the West Indies, uh, Border Gavaskar of Australia against Pakistan. Um, we play for the Trans Tasman Trophy later this summer against New Zealand. They need names, and not sponsors' names, please. But. Um, Anyway, that's my little carry-on. So that's it, boys. Boys and girls, Pakistan, Australia, get together. And the Javed Lily Trophy. Javed, me and Dad, Dennis Lily Trophy. Well, we're pushing for that one, OK? You got any thoughts on any other? Name you'd like to Excellent probably? start to this stint, Jim. OK. Looking forward to the next 20 minutes. Yes, well, I've got a bit more value here because <laughs> I know you like dogs. <laughs> Isn't that true? You love dogs. Sure. I like yeah. dogs. Yeah. Okay. I've, I've got something here. But I'm going to watch Mitchell Stark. Uh, so he gets, gets the cue from the umpire that he can start things going. So 340 is the deficit. And uh, it's um, as he's facing this first ball. Ouch! Heave on the body. Oh, that was quick, short, sharp. And where did that take him? On the ribs? Oh, no, just above Whereabouts. the hip. Oh, just in the stomach, just above the hip. He's right. He was a left-handed batsman, so... That's not a funny bone there. Well, it could have been. It could have caught the top of the hip bone, maybe. Ooh. Yeah, I think it was in there somewhere. I got hit by Sean Tate there one day. Oh, my God. That's... I can still... Did you just ever see the ball from the remember, time it left uh, his hand? I squealed, I remember. <laughs> they, they say, don't rub it. Oh, phew. I threw the bat. I was down. I was rubbing it like anything. But facing Sean Tate was a interesting prospect. Next ball. Stark on his way. And oh, another oh. bouncing delivery goes through outside the off-stump of Sean Massoud. And he just dropped his gloves. It, it's just funny. You, you've been in the field for nearly two days watching the opposition make hay. You think this, this pitch looks pretty good to bat on. And yeah. they come out... You've got a f fast bowler running in, steaming in, and gives you the first two balls. Just nasty. It's got his Pitch. work cut out for him here. Pitch has quickened up a bit. It looks like it has <laughs> in 10 minutes. Well, the short leg is there. He might get something. Stark charges in, and he's round the pad and away to the onside. That's a good clip. He went for the Yorker, and it's been clipped out to the mid-wicket boundary for four. That's uh, what happens. Risk-reward. Pitched up, and he watched it and met it and flicked it away to the boundary. None for four. I think that was an excellent bit of cricket. Mm. Mitchell Stark, a full straight one. It's probably hitting middle stump. But Sham Masood, that's his strength, actually. Hitting through the leg side, square on the leg side, just the way with he sets up, so... You don't want to get too straight to him, um, but equally Stark can accept being hit for four if he's hitting the stumps. This might be a bit shorter, let's see. Stark on his way up, bowls to Masood, and it's around the pads and he flicks him off and away for four more. 
uh, to deep backward square leg. Just got the line slightly wrong and he went with it and flicked it away. So um, it's all duck or no dinner with <laughs> uh, Mitchell Stark. And at the moment it's dinner for the opening batsman, none for eight T boundaries. I guess one of the things you know as a, as a batsman here is the bowlers are going to attack you. So you don't really have to make the play. You can just counter-attack. <laughs> Pick the bowler off if he gets too straight. Maybe this will be short. Stark goes in and bowls to him, and he walks across watching a ball that's pitched on the stumps and pats it out there on the offside. So Australia going on to their highest score against Pakistan at the Gabba. 580, according to Rick Finlay in the ABC Cricket Magazine. I just read it. It'd have to be right, wouldn't it, Rick? Yeah. 5.75, I think, was the previous. And they got 5.80. Manus Labashain, 185 of those. Here comes Stark. He's bowling to Sean Masood. A short lifter, he lets it go. Dropped his gloves at the death as it fizzed through. So a bit of entertainment in that over. A couple of rib ticklers, a couple of snorters, and a couple of fours. It's none for eight. Now, I've just got a little message here that I have to read. It's and not from Jen, is it? No, I told you. You like dogs? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jim. It's Freddy, your four-legged friend here. I'm very much enjoying your call, listening to the cricket in the car and around the house. Looking forward to seeing you in Sydney at coffee next week, maybe even Monday morning if Australia can press on their advantage today. I'm still slowly recovering from rupturing my ACL. So not going on any long walks. It takes a lot of time to mend when you're an old dog like me. But that toast you slip me under the table when my master isn't looking is very good medicine for me. Good luck to you and the rest of the team for all the tests this summer. Licks and wags, Freddy. You like dogs. <laughs> I thought you'd enjoy that. <laughs> Excuse me. Get serious. It's a test match. <laughs> now, Azir Ali is facing and uh, away from the top end. Pat Cummins is coming in and he bowls outside the old stump and it goes through to the keeper. Freddie is a 14-year-old spoodle and uh, he, he's on... Three and a half legs at the moment, poor bloke. He did, a, he did his hammy. Yeah. Sounds like Freddie has his ACL. exceptional grammar as well. Yes. Yeah. No, but when, when he arrives with his master, it's, it's always, hey, who's that with you, Freddie? Who's that bloke? <laughs> it's Freddie. Who gets all the attention and the toast that's sneaked under the table. You've got to love a dog. Cummins goes in, and Azarali plays back into short leg. Has <laughs> picked up a glass. <laughs> oh, dear. And you'll be pleased to know. Okay. That when Freddie's there, you, have, you ever, have you ever touched a spoodle? Uh, you go very soft with your hands right. when you pat him. That's... Please. Okay. <laughs> How's it I got into trouble for that? Yesterday. Did you? Yeah, well, you were being the naughty one, not me. No, you just, you got a guilty conscience. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Cummins runs in again and he bowls down the leg side. He may have flicked the pad as it went by and taken by the keeper. Are we allowed to talk about the cricket? Yeah, Cummins is bowling, not Hazelwood. Yes. Good choice. Um, interesting, isn't it? What's the, what's the rationale behind Cummins starting? Uh, well, uh, he got more wickets than Hazelwood in the first innings. What is the rationale? That's pretty good. Should have a reward system, shouldn't you? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Did Cummins, <laughs> Cummins get more runs than Hazelwood too? Cummins runs in now and he bowls in behind, goes Azarali, he steers it down through Gully for a single. He's off the mark and the score's none for nine trailing by a lot mm. by that logic though we'd, 
Well, I would have played in a few teams that we would have reversed the batting order. Well, they they used to when there was a sticky pitch, but you don't have such a thing anymore. Does that also mean... Is there a game where... The blokes who can't bowl, bowl? If the blokes who can't bat, bat? Cummins in... And he leaves outside the off stump, Shan Masood. Was there a game where Jeff Lawson declared it none for none? There was. Yeah. What was the reason behind that? Uh, well, what was it? Rain. rain. Go on, Rick. Rem remind us. He'll look it up. There was, was a game where he was supposed to uh, declare, but it didn't, against South Australia when there was a, a ruse, I think, between the two captains <laughs> to bowl, bowl a, a bit of floss after lunch. As uh, Shan Masood runs in, and bowls wide of the off stump. And, um, you know, New South Wales allegedly were going to declare short of the South Australian total to set the game up for... A, but they were going so well with Matthews and uh, Taylor, Peter Taylor, that they kept batting. <laughs> and... Um, Hooksy kind of lost it. Yes. He was he was heard to swear. And, um, yeah, they started bowling down the leg side, bowling wide. I mean, they all got out of control. And Steve, Steve Wall called it the sting. Great sting. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a person on Twitter, Rob Moody, who mm -hmm. puts on a lot of old footage. Have you seen, have you seen that? And... Um, the one I saw last was um, Jeff Lawson against West Indies, where he stood on his stump oh, twice. Oh, yes. I've seen that. And In wasn't Perth. giving out, giving out yes. either occasion. Yeah, the square leg umpire lost his specs. Now, Stark charges up and bowls a bouncer, which Azar Ali gets out of the way with a, a nervous little uh, reaction. It went well wide of him, as it turned out. Yes, that was extraordinary. He kicked, he kicked the his second one. Out. He, he stood yeah. on. It was, I think they thought the win was the first one, and then the second one. He stood properly on his stump. I think it was off stump. Was leaning quite a long way back, mm. and he just stood there in his crease as if nothing had happened. <laughs> Got away with it. Yeah. Quite extraordinary. Sort of WG Grace moment. Stark goes in again. Azirali leaves the ball outside the off stump. He's bowling pretty rapid here. 143 Ks and Pakistan 9 without loss. Australia 580. Okay, Rick? 1991 um, at Sydney. Yeah. It must have been rain. Tassie declared at 7 for 144. New South Wales forfeited their first innings. Right. Bowled Tassie out for 116, but then were bowled out for 212.48, run short of a, their outright target. Was Mark O'Neill playing in that game? No. Oh. Mm. Earlier, I think. Playing in that. Yeah. Anyway, they got bowled out, so it didn't work. Why did the off stump again from Starkey? Let's Played a game, it. It. So how many overs did they face to get those? 65 overs for the 220. All oh, right. Yeah, so they had plenty of opportunity, that number of overs, to, to score the runs. Well, that's not such a bad idea no, for the rain-affected that's, that's, game. That's, that's, that's legitimate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other one was uh, interesting. But you would have played county cricket where they were bowl bowling blamanges? Oh, no, declaration I, bowling? I don't think I ever faced any toss-ups, but I, mm. I've seen it happen quite a bit, yeah. Stark bowls, and he's driven through the covers for four. That's a lovely stroke. And it uh, goes out to the boundary at a deep cover, extra cover. Nice half volley, and he... Smacked it, none for 13. Well, it's not quite swinging as much as it did in the first innings for Mitchell Stark, is it? And he's, you can see what his intent is. He's just trying to mix up the batsman's feet, bowl a few short balls, then throw up the full one and hopefully hit a pad or find an edge. But it just seems to be sliding on to the bat quite nicely at the moment. So Stark trying to find that swinging Yorker. He runs in, Azarali gets... Oh. Hit on the pad, how was that? That's out! Uh, is he going to review it? 
he was right in front of his stumps. He's coming down to see if there's any support from the non-striker about that. And uh, I don't know whether Sean Masood is saying, hmm, yes, oh, he has. He's given him some help. Maybe it's going to go over according to the non-striker. What do you think? Uh, Thanks, Richard. I, I was TV thinking more. Director, we have a player review for LBW. Which an outside leg stump. Out. Uh -huh. Can we start with the front foot? So you don't think there's much doubt about height? Uh, I think it's probably hitting the bales, to be honest. But That's he's given it out. This is what we have, we have to remember. Is. So if it's trimming the bales on the umpire's call, he's on his way now. Where did it pitch? That looks like it's pitched in line. Okay, nothing conclusive. Oh, I think that. he's in we trouble. Have side hotspot, please. I think he's in a bit of trouble looking at this replay. I think that's close to pitching outside. Just leg rock and roll that again, please. Well, we'll see. It's certainly yeah, not hitting the again. bat. So okay, nothing on hotspot. Can we confirm that, please? With yep, they're looking at Snicko. the hotspot and Snicko and all the technology yeah, they've got. There's a flat line. You can't so find that there's no bat involved, any evidence of an inside edge. Now, now it's a please. question of where oh, it pitched, now, and it pitched, pitched in line, line, and where was it hitting it's or missing? It was hitting. Hitting the bales. You that is now, out. You can signal out now. Azir Ali, uh, not for the first time, is out LBW. Stark gets the break, and it's one for 13. Uh, we talked about that in the mm. on day one, didn't we, Jim? This Azir Ali he just seems to shuffle across his crease a little bit and present his pad. And on that occasion, and it just Mitch Stark got that in the perfect area. Just pitching in line with leg stump. Going on to sliding on to hit the bales, which is an excellent delivery. So here's the here's the new guy out there. Is this Harris Sahel? Yes. Coming out to bat. And he looked like a tail end wicket in the first innings, I have to say. Didn't well, he, he just convincing. he lunges onto the front foot. He wants to hit the big drives. He hits he hits straight, but he's he looks like he wants to feel bad on ball and, and being a, a, a top order batsman in, in Australia sometimes that can be a bit dangerous with the bounce so Stark gets the breakthrough Stark picking up uh, four for in the first innings Cummins three for four for 52 Cummins three for 60 and Hazelwood two for 46 so Pakistan with a massive task to stay alive here. And uh, how many more overs for the day? Rick, uh, as we a look at the countdown. Well, this is the third over, and if it's 17, I guess it's another 14. Yeah. Okay. And it's about 20 past four local time. So left-hander Harris Sahail out there to face Stark, and he's forward, pushing the ball away tentatively towards cover. And Matthew Wade darts around as they get a single. So he's off the mark. One for 14. Let's see what he was coming across the, the ball there. His bat mm. was heading towards mid wicket and the ball went out to cover. Uh, if that ball had just straightened a touch more, that would have been plum, I think, for Harris Saha. So Stark gets a bit of applause. If we had a crowd number today, what have we got? Oh. That was, this is the bloke who uh, used to count the crowds at Leichhardt Oval. 13,000. 13,000. 13,000. It has been 13,000 every oh, it day, just, hasn't it? just varied it a little bit, you know. 13,098, 13,207, 13,508. Yeah. Okay. 13,000. Hmm. That's, you know, almost 40,000 so far for the match. Now, Pat Cummins around the wicket. He runs up and he bowls to Masood, who lets the ball come and hits the edge. It goes down to third man. And uh, they're going to get four. No, they're going to turn four. Three is uh, um, Harris Sahel, rather, getting a thick outside edge down to third man. And it was well saved with Labuschagne chasing back alongside line. A bit of teamwork there. Three to Harris Sahel, who's four, and the score is 17. Mm. Uh, we, we're quick to jump on the umpires too, Jim, but Richard Ellingworth got that one spot on. Mm. Yep. I liked it. 
just the tactic, just... Okay, straight away we're coming around the wicket to the Pakistan left-handed batsman. So Cummins tries again, and on the back foot he's cramped, but gets a run here, Shan Masood forcing the ball wide of Lyon out there at point. Didn't time it, but uh, he did get over the bounce as it came back in towards him. One for 18, and Shan Masood is nine, and Harris Sahail four. And you don't always have to come over, come around the wicket to left hand batsman. That's what I'm, not what I'm saying. But I I just remember back to Davy Warner opening the batting with all the troubles he had to Stuart Broad around the wicket, and Imran Khan started over the wicket and bowling wide of the crease. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Cummins again moves up. Has a hail forward, running it away to Lyon in that position behind point. More for the outer part of the bat and the, the fiercely hit back cut and uh, co he collects the ball there I'm, I don't think you're lasting long if you're playing those shots, Jim He's yeah. that ball is a good length ball outside off stump, it's probably another stump, set of stump width outside bow height and Harris Sahal, his head's nowhere near the ball he's just putting his hands out there and backing his skill but it only has to bounce a touch more and he's going to edge that. Cummins in, Harris Sahail forward, middles that, out to Wade in the covers. So we've got Burns, Smith, Labuschain and Warner in the slip cordon, and uh, Pakistan with his very tough assignment, trailing by 340, Azirali out in the previous over, leg the four to Stark, Australia all out eventually for 340, a 580. Warner only added three. 154. Smith bowled for four. Wade 60. Head 24. Payne 13. Cummins running in. And behind it goes Harris Sahail to play to the covers. Cummins just seven. Stark five. Hazelwood five. Lyon 12 not out. And Labuschagne, that maiden test century, turned into a, a whop up. 185, and uh, Yasir Shah bowled a lot of overs. 48.4 overs, 4 for 205. Nassim only bowled, what, 4 overs today. The young quick, 1 for 68 of 20. Imran, 1 for 73. And Shaheen, 2 for 96. Cummins bowls a bounce, so eh? he ducks underneath it, and that is the end of the over. I'll leave you um, with Chris Rogers, the acknowledged dog lover, and Quentin Hull's going to come in and join him. ABC Grandstand's coverage of the Test Series. Australia versus Pakistan. On ABC Radio. Grandstand Digital. And on the ABC Listen app. It's like you're about to face military medium, having had Jofra Archer from one end and Mitchell Johnson the other. <laughs> when I come in to call with you after being with Jim, you just see... The shoulders relax and you just loosen up in your stance. He's been, he's been into a bit this test match, Jimmy. I'm not, I don't know why you say this test match. <laughs> <laughs> Mitchell Stark bowling with the vultures behind him. He bounces Sean Masood who pulls him nicely with great timing and oh, a wonderful piece of cricket sliding out along the rope. The athletic Patrick Cummins saves a boundary. And they come back for a couple. Our Pat getting a roar from the Gabba faithful late on this Saturday afternoon. One for 20. You know his nickname, Pat Cummins? Uh, tell the story for me. No, it's, it's Winks. Winks? Yes. Because he's the best. Okay. There's nothing too deep in that, just because... Winks. That's a pretty good one. Three slips in the galley. Stark bowling to Masood. Turns it on the onside and takes a quick single. Nice batting. Gets the boundary. Gets the single. And moves to 12. One for 21. But it's just things like that. When he's down in the boundary. You, how many fast bowlers would you see just dive over that? But, I mean, he's, a, he's an amazing fast bowler. Combat and exceptional fieldsman. Justin Langer gave him the nickname, apparently. Yeah. Yep. Not bad. I think the best nickname in Australian sport 
of recent times belongs to the former Wallaby captain John Eels. Stark oh, bowls. Harris Sahail pokes it backward of point. Lions on the chase to try and run that down. It's racing away in the shadows towards the boundary and it gets there for four. Harris Sahail is up to eight. One for 25. Nobody? Yes. Why was John Eels nicknamed Nobody? Nobody's better. N no, because nobody's perfect. Oh, yes. Well, there you go. I got that wrong. Oh, that's okay. You come from uh, the Australian football I read state. his book. So, but that was years and years ago. Mm. Yeah, but Winks is pretty good. I like that. Dan Christian was one of my favourite. Siri. Because he knows everything. <laughs> Thinks he, thinks he knows everything. Riverina so. boy, Dan Christian. Yeah. Well travelled. What a, what a beauty. Siri. Siri. Okay. Crescent shade about a third the way across the western side of the ground. Three slips, two gullies. Stark to Harris Sahail. Edge is caught by Payne. He's gone. Two for 25. Harris Sahail nicks off for eight. He's just standing there. He's not... He's finally walking... I don't know what he's, what he's thinking because, I mean, that's just so predictable. You can't play like that on a bouncy pitch. Look at that. His head's nowhere near the line. I shouldn't say look at that on the radio, but his head's nowhere near the line of the ball. So he's playing outside his eye line, and that's the, the one thing you, you find so hard to do on bouncy pitches, the, the whacker and the gabber. If you, you're playing shots there away from your eye line, they're going to go to the slips often. So, the double for Harris Sahail, one, caught Payne Bold Stark first innings, eight, caught Payne Bold Stark in the second innings. Mitchell Stark, two for 20. I, I was surprised um, Harris Sahail was picked in the first place. I thought Iman al -Haq was going to play. It just would op offer a bit more in terms of um, grittiness, um, someone who could get in and fight hard and defend and particularly you know in the first test on the on the gabba that's that's maybe one of the qualities you want so just looking at the way that harris sohal played that he's probably more set up to play on the pitches that don't bounce as much well this man was amazing in the fourth innings back in december of 2016 asad shafiq 137 he made on that occasion. Batting down at number six. Here he is at number four. Coming in at two for 25. Still trailing by 315. He's got a lot of batting to do if Pakistan is to save some face. Yes, and... and to be in at the fifth over, uh, uh, the number four against a, a ball that's still almost brand new. That's, it's asking a lot, isn't it? Was the class above in the first innings, making 76. Next best was Azhar Ali on 39. So Stark, two slips, gully, short leg, bowling to Shafiq. Oh. oh, that's a wild bouncer that Payne takes brilliantly. Diving to his left. That almost missed the cut strip down the leg side. And Tim Payne flew athletically to gather that in. How's that not a wide? That's another very good question. <laughs> How is that not a wide? I was using a little poetic license to describe the pitch point of that delivery, but it was a foot in from the cut strip down the leg side and kept going. Do you know what, what it's called if it does bounce off the cut strip? I'm looking forward to you telling me. Can Stark get the radar right here? Bowling to Assad. On the back foot, he pushes, but straight to point. That ends the over. Another successful one for Mitchell Stark. Three overs, no maidens. Two for 20. Pakistan, two for 25. In deficit by 315. What's it called? No ball. And then Will Sullivan did it the other day in a Marsh Cup game and it was a no ball free hit that went for six the next ball against 
Alex Ross, I think it was. Um, yeah, I, I was. I only heard that rule this year as well. I'd never really thought about it. I, I must have that it was a wide. My son's ten and plays junior cricket, and a lot of the time the kids can't hit the pitch. We just call it a wide. Yeah. In, in junior cricket, but yeah, to the letter of the law, professional cricket, it's a no ball. No ball. Did you know that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch, did you know that? He didn't know that either. Yeah, I would have thought it would have been a wide. Surprise, Mitch does not. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Josh Hazelwood's into the attack. Right arm around the wicket, bowling to the left-handed. Masudi turns on the onside, no run. So, the field for the hop. He's got three slips, a gully, a point. Mid-off, short leg, mid-wicket, fine leg. Josh Hazelwood's the best six months of bowling I reckon I ever saw was... Because we went to South Africa after, and they had an unbelievable batting lineup, and he... It was made them look like great groups. We, we had them four for four for twenty, I think, at first first innings. It was like, oh, what is this? These are excellent players. And Ryan Harris bowled with bone on bone late in that series. Yeah, he put his he, knee through. He he got us the Ryan Harris got the, the Michael Clark two, batting with a broken wins. back, getting a hundred. Broken back? Was it a back? Oh, shoulder. A sh shoulder. That's right. Broken shoulder. Hazelwood around the wicket. Turned on the onside by Shan Masood. No run there, although Asad Shafiq was backing up a long way. Sent back as Cummins does the fielding. Two for 25. Yeah, there was some, there was some pretty big stories <laughs> in that series. Back. Well, I was just trying to remember what it was. Just broken shoulder. He got hit on the, on the yeah. shoulder blade, though. It, it looked like he got... Cool, yeah. Yeah, he got hit on the, well, as the back portion of his body. Born yeah. Morkel was a nightmare to face. It was shoulder blade, wasn't it? It feels like it's coming from the second story. You mm. just never... You can't... You can't practice facing for that. It's, it's hard work. Three slip, short leg. Hazelwood around the wicket. Masood cuts on the bump to line at backward point. That ends the first over from Josh Hazelwood. It is a maiden. Pakistan 2 for 25. If you've just tuned in, Australia bowled out for 580. A lead of 340. Lubbershane 185. Warner 154. And after Burns was dismissed for 97 yesterday, Matthew Wade made 60 today among the better contributors. Yasir Shah taking four for 205 from 48.4 overs. And here already Stark's got two poles. Azar LBW for five with the score on 13. And Harris Sahail caught by the keeper for eight with a score on two for 25. Different mood now. Ramiz, welcome again. Thank you. What can be said? Um, well, they needed to get off to a good start. Opening partnership was going to be critical. Um, change of mindset. You know, back yourself. Cummins running in. Short, and Asad Shafiq defends off the high part of the bat on the offside. Yeah, I mean, chance to become a hero. That kind of stuff should have been spoken uh, in the team meeting. I'm sure... Uh, the numbers are stacked against Pakistan to survive this, but fight they must. Um, and tell yourself that, you know, the challenge is how to wipe out the deficit. Not to play out the next two days, but how to get to a 350 score. I think that should be the target at this stage. Good logic. Three slip scully, point, cover, mid on, short leg, fine leg. Cummins to Assad Shafiq and lets it go. Oh, well, it's uh, not a pink ball, it's not under lights, but batting second last time here, Pakistan made 450. Yeah, and Assad Shafiq uh, had a big role to play then. Um, let's see whether he can face up the challenge it's going to be tough because straight away you see pressure being exerted by Australia bowling the Australian links I think that is what Pakistan need to look at to be a competitive side here Cummins in his third over has none for five runs into Shafiq oh. drives misses that went in between bat and pad and Payne tumbles low to take a ball that I think came back from outside the off stump yeah it's about surviving sessions it's, it's not about striking a beautiful boundary through the offside it's about batting defensively uh, and, and, and managing that balance between defense and a little bit of attack you, you want to be instinctive you want to be as relaxed as possible as um, you know as you can be but 
I think you've got to manage that fine balance. Cummins running away from us at the Volta Street end. Bowls to Shafiq. Oh. Edge has caught it second slip. Steve Smith, eye height. Three for 25. Asad Shafiq, a duck. Pakistan crumbling at the Gabatoire. Yeah, not a good shot. His back came down at an angle. Didn't play with a straight full face of the blade. It was a half-hearted half attempt at leaving the ball or playing it. Caught in uh, two minds, I guess, in the air. And uh, the extra bit of bounce, a zip from Cummins, taking care of Hasid Shafiq. Ooh, dear. Three for 25. This is looking rather inglorious for the tourists as now the white ball wonder trying to establish himself in the traditional form of the game, Baba Azam. But this would be some statement if he could show us his white ball best here. Indeed. Never, never a better opportunity for him to say to the world, by the way, I'm not just mm. a 20 and 50 over basher. Let's play a, a test innings of significance. Here's the opportunity. Three for 25 in deficit by 315. So oh, absolutely. I think, I think he's got to stamp his authority and let everybody know that he's got potential really to be a good test player as well. Um, he's got serious talent. It's just that he needs to convert that talent into numbers now. Um, is he mentally strong because test cricket demands are different three slips and a gully so you, you just can't get it wrong outside the off stump just the one ton in 22 tests averaging 34 so the numbers certainly aren't powerless but you can only be well seduced encouraged depends which way you look at it by the way he dominates yeah. In white ball cricket. Cummins has him in his sights. Three for 25. Babar is up. Facing the Australian quick defence from the crease. Yeah. Usually his balance is very good. And he thrives on, on, on good balance. Um, all he has to do is just restrain himself from driving frivolously outside the off stump. I think Australians would know you know the subcontinent mentality pitch the ball up and you get a reaction straight away whether a uh, batsman is in uh, for 10 minutes or not one ball left in the over for Pat Cummins one for five having claimed three for 60 in the first innings he's in he bowls outside the off stump too wide to tempt even Baba Azam's blade well Ramiz doesn't look good Three yep. for 25. Azagon for five. Harris Sahail eight. Asid Shafiq for naught. Masood 12. Azam yet to score. Al Nicholson coming in. Don't miss a moment. ABC Grandstand's coverage of the Test Series. Australia versus Pakistan. On your radio, Grandstand Digital. And on the ABC Listen. All happening here at the Gabba. The wickets are falling. Three for 25. Pakistan. In early trouble here as up comes Hazelwood. And he bowls to Shan Masood who pulls. He doesn't time it. And luckily for him it bounces short of Stark at wide mid on. Saw the short one and went after it there. Australia led by 340 on the first innings after being dismissed for 580. So Pakistan needing 341 to make Australia bat a second time. Three for 25. Masood 12. Baba no score. Played a little recklessly in the first innings. Baba Azam with all the, the hype and interest surrounding him and how he would perform here in Australia. Up comes Hazelwood around the wicket. Bowls to Shan Masood. Turns it away to mid wicket. Stark fields no run. So here is the opportunity and he could not afford, I would imagine, Rummy's Raja to to go out in the same fashion, playing a reckless shot in this situation. Mess it up. and Yeah, I mean, and that shot will be ringing in his mind. I must not play that shot again. And that's extra burden that you carry with you, with you when you walk out there to face a really good bowling attack. He was caught by Burns at first slip off the bowling of Hazelwood, slashing at one, a classic white ball shot like he was playing at 20-20. Hazelwood bowls and Shan again defends into the onside and straight to Mitchell Stark. Got a bit of a 
familiarity about it. You bowl to me, I hit the ball to Mitchell Stark on the onside. Three for 25. Jay Burns has been tossed the helmet by Travis Head, who's come out from short leg and he's going out to deep backward square. Pat Cummins is down at fine leg. There are three slips in a gully. Burns at first, Smith at second, Labuschagne at third, Warner in the gully, and at backward point is Nathan Lyon. And then in front of the wicket on the offside, Matthew Wade is at cover. Stark mid on. Wrapped on the thigh pad, this delivery hits Sean Massoud as he tries to play away to the onside again. No run. Well, if got a square leg in position for the attempted pull shot he's he's a good player of the shot ball uh, but under pressure you never know um, you know he could have a change of mind um, but I also would want to have a shot leg in place for him for bat pad maybe uh, get a fielder off from point place it at shot leg well, with Hazelwood bowling around the wicket and, and digging a few in. This one is off the edge and bouncing. Just short of Marnus Labuschagne at third slip. He dives to his left and manages to take it essentially on the half volley. But Hazelwood, that one kept a fraction lower and took the outside edge of Sean Massoud's bat. Yeah, once again, I mean, that bat coming down at a wrong angle uh, on the ball, uh, like the first innings dismissal. And on the bounce to uh, Labuschain. So he, he's feeling for that deep square leg fielder. And I think the tactics are just about working well here for Australia. Hazelwood shuffles up again. And Sean Massoud knocks the ball through square leg. From the deep head comes in to collect. And they take a single off the last ball of Hazelwood's over. One from it, three for 26. Sean Masood is 13, Baba yet to score, and those dismissed already. Azar for five, Harris for eight, and Assad for no score. Yeah, the, uh, the other advantage of having a shot leg in for Sean Masood is, is, is that last ball single that he took. I, I think you'd want him to be on strike right throughout the over, so that would prevent him from taking that run and being on the non-strikers end. Shadows are creeping across the Gabba ever further from the western side of the ground. And the, the angle of the grandstand almost creates a, a curve around the slip cordon. Perfect uniformity there. As Cummins runs in around the wicket from the Vulture Street in a short one that's well pulled away by Sean Massoud. Fine leg, Hazelwood makes the chase and he collects a metre from the rope. They're coming back for three. That's a good piece of running. Abar was going to the danger end and they got home. So Shan moves to 16. Pakistan, 3 for 29. Yeah, I think that's a good option for Shan Masood. If you, if you can pull the ball, uh, then I think you can do that because it's a, it's a good batting surface. There's uh, not a lot of variation. Uh, and to avoid that bat pad, at short leg, I think you're better off really pulling the ball because when you're looking to hook the ball, you're looking more at the ball also. So um, that's the other advantage that you carry with such a shot. Baba waits. Cummins over the wicket, angles it in towards the stumps, and it's defended. Back down the pitch by Baba Azam. That didn't hit the middle of the bat, it's safe to say, but he kept it out. So what he's trying to do is to play that half cock half uh, front foot uh, defensive shot uh, and just make sure that his balance is good he's not really striding forward uh, because I, I think at the back of his mind he's afraid that he'll edge one if he just lunges forward aimlessly so he's, he's trying to remain within the stumps area short legs in Cummins bowls and Baba down the leg side tries to help it on its way but can't get any bat onto it, and it's taken by pain. What can you tell us about Barbara Azam, the, the man, the personality? Well, um, 
I, I did an interview with him and um, he told me that uh, from a very young age his coach told him not to throw his wicket away and to bat and bat. So he likes batting uh, and he's been very consistent. His, his power game has improved quite tremendously in the last 12 months or so. Uh, he can hit the big six and that's why he's, he's been a success at to T20s and 50 over. Cummins bowls, Baba leaves outside the off stuff. Um, but obviously, I mean, I mean, and he's qualified through the under 19s, under 17s. Um, always marked as a talented uh, batsman. Played extremely well in South Africa. I think he got a couple of 50s, really did uh, play Dale Stain with a lot of authority. On a similar track where the ball was. Uh, bouncing they yeah, made 221 at 36.83 against South Africa yeah 71 in the first innings Centurion Cummins bowls to Baba and he defends squared up a fraction he runs the ball down to mid on and there's no run also made 72 in the second innings of the second test in Cape Town and the couple of half centuries and he also got 49 in the first innings of the third test. So decent contributions in, in all test matches without going on and posting that really big score. He averages over 50 in one-day international and T20 international cricket, but in the mid-30s in test match cricket, although that appears to be trending up, Ramiz. Yeah, absolutely. Cummins runs up wide on the crease and bowls, and Baba leaves outside the off stump. Have you seen a significant shift in his game in the, the test arena? Three for 29 at the end of that over. Baba yet to score. Shan Masood, 16. Yeah, I mean, uh, they tried him at number three. And, I, I, you know, he was too raw, really, to handle that pressure of a number three batsman because clearly he's Pakistan's best batsman uh, in all the formats. And then they pushed him down the order and got 100, I think, against New Zealand or against Australia, I'm not too sure. Um, in UAE, he batted beautifully. Um, so is this his test career is upwardly mobile uh, there's clear improvement in his temperament Hazelwood starts a new over bowling to the left-handed Shan Masood a short one he pulls away and it's just wide of Mitchell Stark at wide mid on it's going out to the long boundary on the western side it's hauled in by Stark they run three Shan Masood moves to 19 it's three for 32 that century was 127 not out against New Zealand in Dubai in no, that's right. 2018 yeah. and just having a look he batted at, at five in Cape Town that was the second test he batted at six Centurion in the first test so sort of more settling into the middle, middle order, order now I think eventually they'd want him to bat at number three you know gain a little bit of experience exposure get a hundred or two under his belt so that he feels comfortable playing uh, at this level three slips in a gully Hazelwood bowling over the wicket to Baba Baba defends with a straight bat down to mid on and Mitch Stark he's yet to score he's faced the eight deliveries Crowd's getting a little rowdy late in the day that's the other problem with a guy who's played a rash shot in the first innings you you try to overcompensate and get into a shell i hope it doesn't happen with baba hazelwood starts his approach in the shadows from the stanley street end and bowls to baba who again leaves outside the off stump not being drawn into a stroke having a good look here there is no time pressure mm. leave as many as None. you like ramis <laughs> yeah absolutely but you've got to have a special talent to do that, special metal. Yep. You know, to, to just make sure that you just leave those outside the off stump, ball after ball, over after over, session after session. Well, Chris think. Rogers was talking earlier about Harris Sahail and his compulsion to play yeah. at everything. He wants bat on ball. Yeah. Up comes Hazelwood, tries again. And that's well wide of the off stump and left. It could stem from the fact that he's not comfortable against the short ball. So you, you, when you fail for the, for the short ball, you lose the sight of the ball in a way you don't pick the length up early. 
because you're only looking for that short length. Uh, and so that is how you, the fast bowlers usually operate. Ball one wide outside the off stump to check his footwork, and his footwork has not been great in both innings. Imam al Haq is yeah. waiting in the wings. wings. Would I, you I would have, him to play? I would have played three openers here. Because the real battle is against the new ball and against fast bowling. Barber on strike, oh. beaten. The ball angles in and goes just over the top of middle stump. What a delivery. Ooh. Unplayable. Looked like he was late on it. And bat and pad a fair gap. It went between the two and over the top of the stumps. Oh, that was close. Oh. Millimetres away from taking the bales on the way through. Hazelwood will gain confidence from that. Baba yet to get off the mark. He's faced 11 balls. It's 3 for 32. Right arm over the wicket. And Baba defends again squared up. The ball dribbles out to point and Nathan Lyon fields. Three runs off the over. Pakistan 3 for 32. Baba... Yet to score, Shan Masood is 19 of 25 deliveries for Pakistan. Azar was out, LBW to Stark for five. That was in the third over. In the fifth over, Harris Sahail caught behind off the bowling of Stark for eight. And in the seventh over, Assad caught Smith at second slip off Cummins for no score. Three for 32, Australia. 340 in front after being dismissed for 580. And still 308 runs ahead. Rick Finlay's found a very good stat for us on Grandstand Test Cricket relating to Steve Smith and all the interest around how big he could go this Australian summer. Come and starts a new over and he bowls and Sean is driving and getting an inside edge that runs down towards third man and not too far away from collecting his stumps. That was well wide of the off stump. He went to cover, drive it, took the inside edge and he takes a single. Yeah, so from Sean it's the other way around. Um, because in the first innings he was um, he was pretty sedate. He, he, he just wanted to occupy the crease and nothing more than that. And in this innings he wants to score runs of every delivery. He's 20. Pakistan's three for 33. Cummins back to the top of his mark. So averaged over 100 in the Ashes series. The leading run scorer by a mile. Steve Smith made over 700 runs. Cummins right arm over the wicket to Baba, and he gets away. A ball behind square. He'll pick up one. He's coming back oh, for the second oh. here. This is dangerous. The throw coming in from the deep from fine leg was not a particularly good one from Hazelwood. But Baba got back for two as Payne had to take that high above his head. It's come off the pad, has it? They got two leg buys in the end. So Baba yet to get off the mark. But he was charging back for that second leg by three for 35. So Steve Smith, in Australia's first innings, he came out. It's aggressive early. He belted Yasir over the top on the onside for a boundary. Baba waits. Cummins bowls. Baba drives and drives beautifully. That's the way to get off the mark. Down through mid off to the rope for four. Baba, a boundary to his name, and Pakistan three for 39. Yeah, that'll give him a lot of confidence and boost. Didn't have to really go wide outside the off stump. This was on that off stump uh, line and it was driven beautifully. Didn't try to overhit it also. So Rick Finlay's statistic on Steve Smith today. The first time in his test career that he was the 11th highest scorer of the innings. Cummins bowls. Baba defends and the ball dribbles into the slip cord and no run. I don't think that'll sit very well with him somehow, knowing his personality. <laughs> he was uh, had some pent-up energy yesterday because he'd watched his fellow top-order batsman about the whole day and amass a mountain of runs. And at the end of play, he came out and he was running all over the place, kicking the footy and got his chance to come out today and sort of tried to hit one from well outside the off stump away through the onside and he got beaten by Yassir and clean bowled. Yassir has got him now six times in five test matches. 
Cummins up and bowling to Baba, who leaves outside the off stump. That is only two less than the, the bowler who's dismissed him the most times in Test match cricket. That's Stuart Broad. Yeah. But in so many more Tests, Ramirez, I think Broad and Smith have played against each other in well over 20 Test matches. Yeah, Broad 24 matches against Smith. He's dismissed him eight times. Anderson has dismissed him six times in 22. And then for Yasser, it was six times in five matches coming in. So now seven Seven. times in six matches. And he signalled it as well. Uh, Did you see him after getting... Notice that. Yeah, he said five and seven. Well, well, well. There's the rivalry building. Glorious shot, Baba Azam. As Cummins bowls wide of the off stump and he drives it out through the covers. Wade and Lyon give chase. They'll work together to deny a boundary. Lyon picks up two metres from the rope and they run three. Baba's away to seven now. It's three for 42. And that is the end of the Cummins over with seven runs, two leg buys and a single coming off it. I mean, he's aesthetically very pleasing, Baba Azam. Um, Good to watch. Um, He wants to be like Virat Kohli. He's openly admitted that he's Virat is his uh, favourite batsman. Uh, wants to be as consistent as Virat has been in Test cricket. So here's a chance for him to make a name for himself. So Shan has played a few shots. He's on 20. Within the, the Pakistani batting order, it is quite a long tail. Mohammad Rizwan batted well before being dismissed dubiously by Pat Cummins. What many thought was a no ball in the first innings, but Yasir at eight. Shaheen Afridi, Nasim Shah and Imran Khan those to come after Rizwan so much it would appear hinges the Pakistan whatever improbable hope the tourists have of saving a draw here that relies on these two batting for an awfully long time yeah, moving forward I think that is one area where Pakistan would want a tremendous improvement eking out runs from the tail because it, as it is, the, the batting lineup is not great. It is brittle. A- and so the opposition know that if you can get rid of the top four or five, then job is done. Start of a new over with Stark into the attack from the Stanley Street. Andy bowls to Baba. Baba turns it off the hip, gets it forward of short leg. Travis head in the helmet, goes and chases it through mid wicket. They take a single. Baba to eight. It's three. For 44. Earlier, Australia dismissed for 580 after having Pakistan in the field for 157.4 overs. The lead was 340 when Australia was dismissed. The top scorer for Australia, Manus Labashain, 185. His maiden test century was a big one. David Warner was dismissed for 154. Matthew Wade made 60 on day three. Nasim Shah, the most expensive figures, sorry, not Nasim Shah, Yasir Shah. The most expensive figures in Test match cricket at the Gabba. He did pick up the four wickets, but four for 205 from 48.4 overs. Shan Masood on strike. Stark bowls a bouncer. Shan easily gets out of the way of it. So two slips in a gully for the left-handed Shan Masood. Line at backward points. Wade at mid-off. Heads at short leg. He's a mid-wicket. Manus Labashain's directing traffic in there. He's moving the field around Manus. He's had a good day and he's <laughs> decided that means he can take captaincy duties for a while, perhaps, Ramiz. Yeah. There are two catches, um, two fine legs on the rope, essentially. About 15 metres splitting Hazelwood and Cummins, and it's worked away by Shan Masood. Fine to Cummins all the way along the ground, a single taken. Shan moves to 21. It's three for 44. I worked with uh, the uh, Indian coach um, not so long ago, Ravi Shastri, when we were covering the test series in India, and he spoke about being a, a youngster listening to cricket on the radio, and he was actually able on long wave radio to hear the test matches from Australia. Did you have... A similar experience, yeah, Ramiz? absolutely, yes. Um, still remember um, listening to... Stark comes up and bowls to Baba. He defends back to the bowler. 
uh, this would have been 76 series here, Pakistan versus Australia, uh, where Imran picked up 10 or 12 wickets at Sydney. Distinctly remember. They won that test in yeah. 77? 77, yeah, that's right. Early on, my brief memory, you know, I was around 10. Uh, this was 72-3. Um, Ian Chappell um, versus Pakistan. I remember listening to that piece as well where he absolutely nailed into Khabalam. Bouncer from Stark. Baba gets underneath it. It was on a leg stump line and moving further to the leg side as it passed him. So you'd sit round, you'd huddle round the, the yeah. family radio? That's right, yeah. My father played cricket, my grandfather also played cricket, and my elder brother was a test player as well. So, I mean, uh, so it was cricket bond. And um, uh, um, I remember listening um, uh, to Australian cricket or Australian radio, BBC. Stark bowls. Baba gets another bouncer. That's more on a middle stump line, but it's well above his head. And he gets underneath it easily, and it's called a no ball. Umpires do call no balls. Yeah. <laughs> that one not for overstepping. Well, that's for more than um, the required doors of over the, over over the, the shoulder. shoulder. Yep. Pakistan three for 45. Baba eight has the strike for Pakistan. Up runs Stark. And bowls to Babar, and he turns it away behind square leg. The chase is on for Cummins from the fine leg boundary. There'll be a couple of runs on offer here. Babar moves to 10, 3 for 47. Even today, Ramiz, it's amazing where we have text messages from those listening all around the world to ABC's coverage of Test Match Cricket. They've done it for so long, sending us text messages on 0467 2 in far-flung places where no one's got any idea what cricket's about. The people on holiday, Australians want to know what's happening. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Rummy's Raja, great to get his insights as always on Grandstand Cricket. He's stepping out and Mitchell Johnson's stepping in with Pakistan 3 for 47. Shan is 21. Babar Azam is on 10. Left arm of Mitchell Stark made a very productive start here for Australia, picking up the opening two wickets. Picked up four in the first innings as well, Mitch. And he had to bide his time during the Ashes series, just playing the one test. Have you seen his bowling performance on return here at the Gabba? As Hazelwood starts a new over, bowls to Shan Massoud, and he turns to the onside. Ford of square leg for a single. Shan's looking quite comfortable. He moves to 22. It's three for 48. Yeah, I mean, he has changed his action slightly with that bowling arm. That's something that he's very fresh at, at the moment. I just feel like he's still bowling within himself and trying to be as comfortable as possible. Um, I like when he... I, I feel like he's bowling better line because of it, um, because of all the technical reasons I've sort of spoken about with him being a lot tighter with that arm and that back foot landing, etc., um, he'd probably be a little bit disappointed he's gone for a few runs, but he has got two wickets in the column, so that's, that can tend to happen when you're attacking. So they've switched Hazelwood to the Vulture Street end, and he's up right arm over the wicket to Baba Azam, who bangs it away off the back foot, out through backward points. Lions chasing, but I think this might just trickle to the rope. Lion keeps pursuing, and he collects a metre from the boundary. They run three, and Babar's away to 13 now. Pakistan brings up the 50. In 12.2 overs, three for 51. And Hazelwood, just both deliveries. He's bowled from this end, this Vulture Street end. His uh, foot placement, well, he's landing in someone's previous uh, foot placements be quite annoying sometimes you can see a couple of marks as the well we can see a couple of marks where we're sitting of the the foot marks of the run-ups uh, and at the crease as well he, he did start around to the left hand up deep backward square and fine leg on the rope here with the left hand up Sean Masuda gets a full one he drives but on the bounce straight back to Hazelwood 
So now they're going with three slips in a gully again for Sean Massoud when initially they'd I mean, recent overs just gone for two slips in a gully. Yeah, I think that's just he's over the wicket. Hazelwood, he gets good bounce. Just hoping for one to go across and, and bounce a bit more and always I feel like especially with a new ball, three slips on a pitch like this, when it's going through, it's bouncing. Three slips for sure. There's also backward point, mid-off and mid-on as Hazelwood bowls, and it's cut but straight to line at backward point. It was a sweetly timed shot from Shan Masood, who is middling them. He's 22, Pakistan 3 for 51. So Australia's lead... Still 289 runs required by Pakistan to make the Australians bat a second time. Iftika Ahmed is in next, and then Mohammad Rizwan, and not an awful lot after that. Yasir Shaheen, Nasim, and Imran Khan. Hazelwood runs up again, and he strays on the leg stump, and it's worked away. Shan Masood goes through for one. And that will be a leg by. Yeah, Three Sean, for 52. Sorry, Al. Uh, Sean Masood, I, I liked his innings so far. He's uh, taken on the short ball a couple of times. I think that's probably a, a conscious thing. Uh, we, we, we keep hearing that he does like to play it. But it can be difficult when you come to conditions like this where it does bounce and it's a little quicker. And He seems to have got the pace of the pitch. So he's not going to let Australia bully him in that way. If we might see Nathan Lyon before too long as Hazelwood runs up and bowls to the right hand of Babar Azam who's not tempted into a drive, a full ball outside the off stump to complete the over. 3 for 52, Babar is 13 and Sean is 22. Grandstand Test Match Cricket live from the Gabba with Alistair Nicholson and Mitchell Johnson in the chair describing the action for you. Now, Spot on. Nathan it is off. Nathan Lyon, okay. Good call. We're going to see him from the Stanley Street end. Lyon in the first innings picked up one for 40 off his 17 overs. You can see that the pads have been brought out for Marnus Labashane to get under the lid. Yeah, I think this is a good move. Yashi Shah. Got the ball to spin on occasions. He's not a big turner of the ball, but we saw him spin uh, the ball uh, in his bowling innings. Uh, so there's that variation there for sure. So what can Nathan Lyon do? If he just gets a couple to spin early, we know he's not a big turner. But he does get that extra bit of bounce. He does like bowling here. This is really well set up for him as well. Uh, a second innings at the Gabba. It's you think back to those times where we'd come to the first test match at the Gabba and you would have been playing at the time, you would have been one of the first pick, but it was always that discussion around, will they go with the four quicks <laughs> and discussion, would Nathan Lyon play, would he not play? Now he's just an absolute lock, isn't he, Nathan yep. Lyon? Yeah. He's bowling around the wicket here to the left hand of Sean Massoud with a slip and a short leg, defended by Sean. Back to the bowler. Yeah, he's uh, come a long way. I remember him getting his first wicket in Sri Lanka for, with his first ball. Surprising Sangikara. Not a bad one to get either. Lyon passes the umpire wide on the crease and bowls. Shan defends to mid-wicket where head fields no run. Yeah. Sorry, you, you were about to... I was going to describe no. the field, but no. if you've got a train of thought, go far gonna, away. I won't describe the field, but... I was just going to say about Nathan Lyon and his confidence. I mean, it has grown over time, and he's been able to back his ability. Like I was saying, he's not a huge turn of the ball. He hasn't got a lot of variations, different variations, but he, what he does is he changes his pace and his length subtly, and that's, um, that's key for him. There's a silly mid-off now and a short leg as Lyon bowls a full one outside the off stump. Sean Masood leaves, and Tim Payne cries as if that wasn't too far away, when in actual fact... It was nowhere near hitting the stumps. Just trying to build a bit of perceived pressure. Gamesmanship. Line in again. Men around the bat. Smith at slip. And that's defended off the edge into the pad. He didn't know a lot about that one, Sean Masood. 
promising start from Nathan Lyon. Third man's up. There's a points cover. Mid off. Whitish mid on. A square leg. It's Lyon bowls. And Sean stretches forward and leaves outside the off stump. Tim Fane's having a bit of fun. He just tossed the ball to Marnus Labashane under the helmet at short leg and Marnus dropped it. Not paying attention and Tim said, well done, Marnie. He did well today. 185 for Marnus Labashane. Around the wicket comes Lyon again and that is defended on the front foot by Sean Masood. A maiden to start with from Nathan Lyon. 3 for 52, Pakistan. Sean is 22, Baba 13. A change in commentary on Grandstand Test Cricket. Jim Maxwell to come in and join Mitchell Johnson. Don't miss a moment. ABC Grandstand's coverage of the cricket. Australia versus Pakistan. On your radio, Grandstand Digital. And on the ABC Listen app. Hey Mitch, how are you? I'm good. You like dogs? <laughs> dogs at home. You got a couple? Yeah. Alaskan, yeah. Alaskan Malamutes. What are they? Alaskan Malamutes, or Malamute, I say. Can you, you got a photo that you can show everyone? <laughs> uh, they look like, what do they look like? They're the um, wolf, like wolf dog. They oh, look yeah. like a wolf. Yeah? Yeah, they're pretty cool. Uh, my phone's not on me. We'll, we'll get there. We're watching uh, Hazelwood from this Vulture Street end in the shadows of Stumps. He bowls accurately, and he's played away on the offside by Baba, who's 13. Shan's 22. It's three for 52. Sled dogs. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So there's Alaskan Malamutes, which are the bigger, uh, broader dog. No, it's not yeah, a husky. Hus huskies are the smaller, uh -huh. smaller version in a way. Yeah. They're smaller. They're smaller. Well, there's a big dog then. Uh, yeah, they, they are quite large. Yeah. 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 Oh. What's the attraction of them as a pet? I like wolves. You like? Oh dear! Yeah, right. Dancing with the wolves. Uh, uh <laughs> not really that one. No, but just. <laughs> yeah. Here's Hazelwood bowling to Baba wide of the off stump, and he lets the ball pass. More, more like a, a wolf pack. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was living with uh, Brendan Nash when, when I when I was uh, here for Queensland playing for Queensland. Ah, yes, the fellow who went on to play for the West Indies. Yep. Yes. Uh, lived with him and and the guy Nathan Remington. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were a wolf pack, so we like wolves. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just leave it at that, I think. No, no, no. It's, it's, just, <laughs> it's just interesting that the dogs have been in the conversation today. I've been, been called a pack of dogs before. Oh, yeah, and worse, I'm sure. Oh, definitely worse. Hazelwood comes up to Baba, who drives him through the covers. That's a good clip. It's running out to deep cover for one and two and now for three on the throwback there by Matthew Wade to the bowler's end so Pakistan mounting a mini recovery after being three for 25 and they trailed by 340 after Australia went on to make 580 on the back mainly today of Manus Labuschagne his maiden test century 185 and uh, very quickly, Australia struck. Stark two, Cummins one wicket. And now these two, the tall left-hander and the accomplished right-hander trying to recover. Hazelwood around the wicket. He bowls down the leg side. Short, bouncy, no offer. So close to stumps on the third day. A big repair job needed by... Pakistan to uh, stay alive here, to make Australia bat again, yep. which will be an achievement, you'd think. Yeah. Uh, uh, just watching, watching uh, Josh Hazelwood here, he's, he hasn't quite got his radar. Uh, right. I'm not sure he's enjoying the Vulture Street end. I, I think the footholds at the crease uh, are annoying him a little bit. Mm. Mm. Here he goes, this ball. Around the wicket, he bowls to Shah Masood, who defends down the pitch. Back to the bowler. Yes, in England, they're always filling those holes in, aren't they? Can't do it here? Uh, you can. And it, it does get done. But I don't know if it's because it's so hard, the, the surface here. They do bang it down sometimes, like where the footballs yeah. are. But it gets so hard because of the heat and 
it dries out. So a little bit different to England, but they can, England, they can they still... England, they just put the cement in. I think they just replace it with another bit of turf. No, around the wicket, he goes... Uh, has what he's pushed away to the onside, and uh, they get a single. Uh, I remember going out to um, Old Trafford at the end of play one day, I think 2015, 13, whenever it was, and the groundsman was repairing the footholds. It's three for 56 at the end of the over. And he had this kind of cement, which was a mixture of marl and, and whatever, and he was just pouring it in like, you know, the, 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 um, the truck that comes along from right. think, think Pink or whatever it is and tipping it in. And it quick drying stuff. Yep. And, and and that restored the area back to what it was. Right. Got kicked out again the next day, but it gave the bowlers <laughs> some footing because they get serious footholes over there, don't they? Quite yeah. deep. Oh, definitely. With the softer soil. And, and, and some of the quick bowlers with their big boots. Mm. I mean, We've got some uh, large spikes in there as well. Now, Lyon is bowling short. Off the back foot, it's clipped away by Shan Masood, and it's racing out to the boundary for four. Uh, that was an on offer from Lyon. Under pitched, and Masood moves to 27, and it's three for 60. Nice little shot off the back foot. That's what Pakistan need, having lost Azir Ali for five. Sahail Harris Sahail for eight and Shafiq for a duck caught by Smith second slip lots of fielders around the bat watching and as the push comes it goes to silly point where Travis Head is fielding in close there uh, they get a under the nose on the offside and the road block, block on the onside and two slips for Nathan Lyon. He bowls into the shadows and beats the edge. Good delivery. Zipped through. Bounced. Turned enough. Too much. Missed the edge. Well, but that's what all he needs to do. Nathan Lyon has really turned one here. And that's mm. bounced a lot as well. A little puff of dust. But now that makes Masood think, OK, I've got to play the ball that's out just on the off-stump line in case one does go straight. He bells again. Now says Ford caught it. Slip. Yes, I think there's an appeal. Did it carry? I don't think Steve Smith's confirming that it carried. He took it, but looked like he may have tagged it on the bounce. The thought, batsman was walking. Yeah, I thought he caught it. Well, but he's 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 not sure. So they've got to have to go up here. Warner pointed to the ground. Yeah. Well, with Smith gave the impression that perhaps it didn't carry and others did too and there's some doubt as they're going upstairs to the third umpire uh, Richard Kettlebrough is giving an indication that Thanks, he doesn't think it's out uh, so we need to get some pretty strong evidence on the replay for a dismissal here but they don't look very confident he pushed at it hit the edge the same glove or edge I well, I heard someone say glove. Okay, that's a yeah. fair delivery. Can I get your best angle of the catch, uh, please? Yes. They're looking at whether or not Steve Smith has taken a low catch at slip or whether it, it bounced. It came off the keeper and it went low. And it's okay, bounced, um, I think. we've got a zoom with that, please. Looked like it may have bounced as he took it. What do you think? Yeah, just looking at that, I think it's bounced. Uh, and the replays that they're showing here. That right. Uh, just a catch, please. Yeah, it's a it's a fair catch. It's it's an up high review. They're going to go for the forensics here, going in magnifying, getting in close, and that looks like Is that the half best volley. angle that you've got for me. Have you got anything side on for me, if possible, please? I don't think he got his fingers under that in time. From the, the look of the replay, what do you reckon there? Any conclusive evidence that this is carried as uh, the soft uh, signal is not out? Yeah, the soft signal is not out. So. Mm, I don't think this will be out. Okay, yeah, I didn't like else for me, please. I don't like that first view that they showed us front on. It's so mm. pixelated. Yeah. But it did look like it it bounced. But he did get his fingers in the area. But you can't. Is is, is that the best angle? It's that you have? so hard looking 
front yeah, on okay. of this to okay, tell just, uh, and whether he got his fingers frame, under. Just take it back and, fr frame. and frame and as well. Forward again. It's almost like it's missing forward a frame. frame. It's gone and low. He's got forward. his fingers under it, yeah, but it, it does yeah, look as though it's bounced Somebody to make my as his fingers got screen. there. I don't know whether he got under it in time. I think they'll stay with the on-field on decision here. There's, there's no look of disappointment out there on the field. I think this will be not out. As Yes, it's not out. So he survives. But he, he was walking. As soon as he played the shot, he turned and walked. But the, um, the evidence is such that uh, he survives. The umpire said not out. Soft signal not out. And the replays confirmed that there wasn't enough evidence for him to be given out as he gets forward to the next ball and plays down the onside. But that was all due to the mm. previous ball as well. Nathan Lyon spinning it so hard and it bouncing out of a little bit of dirt. Mm. And it just drew him into playing that shot. He was a bit cautious. He went softish hands at it. Lyon bowls again. The big lefties forward pushing away to Manus Lobichain at short leg. So we've got another over. There's one more over to come tonight. It's three for 60, wherever you're listening around Australia, around the world, on the BBC Test Match Special Sports Extra there. It's been another strong day from Australia. They got to 580, a lead of 340, and Pakistan now wobbly at three for 60 with one more over to come. Jim Maxwell and Mitch Johnson here. The shadows are across the ground covering um, most of the square as Hazelwood starts this last over. He's moving in. He bowls to Baba, who's back, and he's running it away wide of slip down towards the third man boundary, and it goes for four. Had control there? Uh, oh, sort of. Sort of, I think. It didn't really look convincing. I think it was. Sort of, I think he tried to play, play it that way, but it's a it's a risky shot. Yeah, yes. Sure. He, he, more edge than middle. More edge than yeah, middle. <laughs> <laughs> but he was able to steer it between third slip and gully, and away it went to the boundary. So An annoyance for a bowler mm. more than anything. What? Go in there again as Hazelwood bowls Baba leaves wide of the off stump. Three for 64. Baba Razam is 20. Shan Masood is 27. I'll just give you the uh, details of the Australian innings today. Uh, David Warner looked a bit weary out there. He was around for about 40 minutes and only added three to his overnight score. He was getting a, a very quick bouncing ball from Nazim, who only bowled four overs and had him caught behind by the keeper for 154. Hazelwood runs in again and bowls a ball that's stabbed away by Baba, kept it out of his pads. That was threatening. Yeah, the angle, he, he came a little wider there, Hazelwood. Bowled the perfect length around that knee roll length. It almost went through. Hmm. Excellent delivery. Steve Smith missed out today. In fact, his four was the lowest score in the innings. That wouldn't have happened too often. First time in his test career, Steve Smith was the 11th high score of the innings. Okay, thanks, Rick. Here's Hazelwood, wide of the off stump, but lets it go. So he hit a four from Yassir and then tried to hit him back down the ground somewhere and was bowled. Played over the ball and it hit his off stump. So Smith made just four. Wade caught Rizwan bowled Harris 60. Head caught Rizwan bowled Harris 24. Payne caught Shafiq bowled Sh uh, caught Shafiq bowled Shaheen for 13. Lavishane was caught Baba in the gully off Shaheen for 185. Hazelwood running in and Baba forward playing the ball away into the covers. Cummins caught Rizwan bowled Imran for seven. Stark leg the four to Yasir for five. Hazelwood the last one out LBW Yasir for five. And Lyon was an immaculate 12 not out with two fours.
and he became today um, the highest scoring non-50 batsman in test history apparently did you know that Rick he scored uh, over a thousand runs not 150 I think he went past Wackai units as the, the, the highest score without a 50 Hazelwood charges in bowls a good ball on the stumps it's defended and that's the end of the over so 580 was the lead of 340 and as you can hear the stumps going over with the call of time Azhar Ali LBW Stark 5 Harris Sahail caught Payne Bolt Stark 8 as um, uh, Shafiq caught by Smith or Cummins without scoring Shan Masood is 27 Azhar is 20 it's 3 for 64 as I mentioned the lead was 340 so they need another 276 to make Australia bat again so another strong day Mitch Johnson from Australia um, and there are handshakes all round out there at the moment as the players head off the field so that's nice to see as it was when Alaba Shane was out for 185 and all the Pakistani players came over and shook his hand yeah great sportsmanship there and great spirit happening out there in the middle and Australia on top here they've batted again well today great to see Labuschagne uh, play with that grit and determination and he thoroughly deserved that score today and the bowlers Mitchell Stark getting two two early wickets and Nathan Lyon looking very dangerous towards the back end there so I'll be interested to see how it plays tomorrow that pitch if there's going to be much much change but yeah Australia on top here Pakistan need to fight hard they need this partnership to start well tomorrow and I think they can they, they've definitely got the skills to do it um, but whether they've got the the mindset tomorrow two more days left and uh, it's a big assignment for Pakistan to try and make Australia bat again. They've been completely outplayed so far after winning the toss and making only 240 and then they're under the cosh from the top three Warner, Burns and Labuschagne who played with distinction today. He was the seventh batsman out for 185 and Yasir, uh, the leg spinner, had the best figures four for 205 and Stark at the moment has two for 25 out of three for 64. So stay with us for Grandstand at Stumps. Let's go down to Alistair Nicholson. A career day for Marnus Labuschagne as he made his maiden test century. He finished with 185 as Australia piled up a huge total against Pakistan. All out for 580 in the first innings. Marnus Labuschagne walking past us, waving his baggy green to the crowd. You can hear the applause. Many have stayed here in the members to acknowledge the local boys' efforts today. Pakistan batting in survival mode late on day three. They went to stumps in the first, second innings at three for 64. Manus Labuschagne is going to join us shortly on grandstand at stumps. Alistair Nicholson alongside Chris Rogers and Jason Gillespie walking off the ground knowing you've made a ton and seeing the fans absolutely loving every second of your output. What's that like, Buck Rogers? Oh, I think it's an incredible moment. Um, as I said a, a couple of hours ago, it's, it's something you, you, as a player, you just dream of. You spend so many hours thinking about it. Well done, Marnus. Marnus has come yeah. across to join us on Grandstand straight away. I mean, we'll ask you what it's like. I was just asking Chris Rogers what it's like coming off the ground when you've had a career day, you've made your maiden test century and the, the crowd have stuck around to, to applaud you as well, Marnus. Take us inside your head at the moment. Um, yeah, I mean, it was really nice to finish off like we did. Um, uh, like I said this morning, uh, uh, obviously, when you... You probably sleep the best night, you know, you're 55 not out overnight. You, you know, you got a bit of hard work too in the morning and, and, and you can capitalise on a really good day. Um, you know, I was able to get through that early patch this morning when they were coming hard and, um, you know, there's a few hiccups along the way where I, I went away from my plan, but, um, you know, luckily there was guys around me to make sure that I uh, stayed on the path. 
and your celebration when you got there, when you squirted one fine down to the third man boundary and you rock back in that big fist pump, the emotion was overflowing then, I'm sure. Yeah, look, I even actually thought about it, you know, if I was to get 100, how are you going to bring it up? And that was not the way I was going to do it. <laughs> I, I was thinking, you know, like a run through, but... You know, like I said, I was I was sort of with the feel they had. I knew if I got one full and I could just punch it through the cover and then I got too greedy and tried to go too square and I nicked it and I just looked back and it just rolled right in the middle of them and I was, it was always just relief because, you know, you, you always, everyone's nervous in the 90s but when it's your first one, it's, um, you know, it, 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 it's very special. Marge, you had a really productive time at Glamorgan. I remember you scoring a heap of runs against us at Sussex down at, at Hove. I know you did some work with uh, Matty Maynard. What, what was that like and any anything specific you worked on there? Uh, yeah, there was. He would be absolutely blown up that I didn't get a double. He sprayed <laughs> me that day at Sussex for not getting a double. Uh, and he actually sent me this morning, you know, the like the two double hundred emoji. Um, so he'll be blown up that I didn't get that I didn't get it. But yeah, look, he, he's been terrific. Um, just a summer. ABC Grandstand. His little drop kick shot away towards the boundary. Four runs. Hi, this is Steve Smith. You're listening to ABC Grandstand at Stumps. Well done, Marnus has come yeah. across to join us on Grandstand straight away. I mean, we'll ask you what it's like. I was just asking Chris Rogers what it's like coming off the ground when you've had a career day, you've made your maiden test century, and that the crowd have stuck around to, to applaud you as well, Marnus. Take us inside your head at the moment. Um, yeah, I mean, it was really nice to finish off like we did. Um, uh, like I said, this morning, uh, uh, obviously, when you you probably sleep the best the night, you know, you're 55 not out overnight. You, you know, you've got a bit of hard work too in the morning and, and you can capitalise on a really good day. Um, you know, I was able to get through that early patch this morning when they were coming hard. And, um, you know, there's a few hiccups along the way where I, I went away from my plan. But, um, you know, luckily there was guys around me to make sure that I uh, stayed on the path. And your celebration when you got there, when you squirted one fine down to the third man boundary and you rocked back in that big fist pump, the emotion was overflowing then, I'm sure. Yeah, look, I even actually thought about it, you know, if I was to get 100, how are you going to bring it up? And that was not the way I was going to do it. <laughs> I, I was thinking, you know, like a run through, but, you know, like I said, I was, I was sort of with the feel they had. I knew if I got one full and I could just punch it through the cover and then I got too greedy and tried to go too square... And I nicked it, and I just looked back, and it just rolled right in the middle of them. And I was, it was always just relief because you know you, you always, everyone's nervous in the 90s, but when it's your first one, it's um, you know, it, 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 it's very special. Marge, you had a really productive time at Glamorgan. I remember you scoring a heap of runs against us at Sussex down at, at Hove. I know you did some work with uh, Matty Maynard. What, what was that like? And any anything specific you worked on there? Uh, yeah, there was. He would be absolutely blown up that I didn't get a double. He sprayed <laughs> me that day at Sussex for did not he? getting a double. Uh, and he actually sent me this morning, you know, the like the two double hundred emoji. <laughs> um, so he'll be blown up that I didn't get that I didn't get it. But yeah, look, he he's been terrific. Um, just a summer over there, um, just learning how to play in English conditions, learning how to play the swinging ball, really tightened up my technique a little bit. And, um, you know, obviously playing here is your home ground for Queensland. It's, you're always getting tested, so it's a really nice challenge when you're playing shield cricket here because um, you need to work really hard for your runs and, you know, it's all come together really nicely. There has probably been a lot said about you over recent times and, and people have a lot seen you since you've started playing for Australia, but... There's been a whole heap of development, hasn't there? Like going all the way back, and I'm sure you've, you know, you've done a lot with your father, Andre. But Neil De Costa's another one. What's what's a secret to your success, and particularly your improvement so significantly uh, in recent times? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I hit a lot of balls. I, I, I love training, um, but I think it's really probably up top. Like mentally, I've just, I've really, I've really become a lot more process driven rather than you know when I was younger or even coming through as that development I had the ability I, I would have thought but it was just you know I wasn't as patient I, I wanted to get outside that box and we saw glimpses of that today when I tried to hit one over cover and you know try to get a little bit too funky with it and um, you know all those people you know Matt Maynard, Neil, um, everyone you know would always just say just take the runs that are on offer. You know, they got five men back and I'm trying to go over cover. That's not high percentage cricket. <laughs> Just hit down along on, run, get down the other end. So So is that is that 
particularly them, or is it you? What's, uh, I know that's a tough question, but uh, are you, have you made a conscious decision about that, or has that just been your natural involvement? Um, no, I, I definitely with uh, I need those guys around me. That's for sure. Um, I think this year in the in the Shield game, I um, uh, no in the first one uh, one day, and I played a lap and got bowled, and then I reverse swept one and got caught, and literally I, he just sprayed me. And he was like, "What are you doing, mate? Like just smack it down a long on and run down." And um, back innings, I played here for Queensland in the one day where I got a hundred. That's literally all I did. I didn't even try and do anything. I just tried to hit it down the ground. And it was, a, it was a good reminder. I think those are the people you need around your corner because you can always try and justify it to yourself that it's a high percentage option and that that's the shot you want to play. But um, for those guys to keep you really focused on the bigger picture and, you know, uh, as you would know, you know, lots of runs, getting big scores is, is the key to, you know, the, that really high-class players. And you probably have the best role model of all in your side to, to emulate. And I know the boys, the boys um, actually joke around and, and call you Steve Smith, you know, mini Steve Smith, and you don't, you're not allowed to leave the nets until he's left the nets, <laughs> that, those kind of things. But is that, do you look at him and think, okay, well, that's what I have to do? Yeah, I, I, I've, I've said it for a long time. I think Johnny Besto um, sprayed me in, in the ashes for, for like leaving the ball like him. I just said to him, I said, well, it's not a bad person to copy. You know, bloke averaging 64. Um, if that's something you can aspire to, then, then that's it. Um, look, I've learned a lot from him and just watching him bat. Uh, sometimes I actually, you know, Neil tells you, can't watch him bat too much because, like, I literally subconsciously just do things. Like, I'm a visual learner, so I, I subconsciously pick stuff up very quickly. So I need to make sure that not watching him too much. But I've learned a lot about the game and how he thinks about the game and, and really, you know, the, the ins and outs of, of why he does things and, and how he manipulates the field. Marnus Labashane's with us on Grandstand at Stumps. You made 185 at the Gabba today. Your story's well known, Marnus, that you moved out to Australia from South Africa as a youngster. We had your father, Andre, on Grandstand today. He was so proud of your performance. Your wife's here as well. Have you had a chance to catch up with him post your innings? No, 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 uh, not at all. Um, but, you know, like I said, I can't do it with, um, without all that support. That support network is key because when you're going well, they're the ones keeping you grounded, and then when you're not, when you're kicking them, uh, they're the ones behind you picking you up. So, uh, and that's not just my mum, my dad, but that's my my parents-in-law, my brother-in-law, and, and and our whole family, and and all my family back at home. So, there's a lot of encouragement um, in these good times, but you know they're they're, they're the key people, the cornerstone um, to to keep you keep you up when you're down. We better let you go and see them. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Marta Slavishane, after a career day for him on Grandstand at Stumps, terrific to speak to the key man from the day. Day three at the Gabba with Australia amassing a huge total of 580. Marta Slavishane, 185. A few of those moments from his innings well worth revisiting. You, you do sort of think about how you want to celebrate 100, you know, when you're a kid, how you're going to do it. And then when I nicked it, I look back, I don't know what happened, something took over because that's not what I was planning to do. Labashane on 97, Shaheen in, he's driving a thick outside edge through the gap, wide of third slip to the four down to the third man boundary. Labashane on his home ground. It's his maiden test ton and the gap arises. Andre Lubbeskakny with me, who's just seen his son, Manus Lubbeshain, score a ton. Oh, it's an amazing experience. It's just an awesome outcome. Lubbeshain on 149, strokes the ball to point, takes the single. 150 for Manus at the Gabba. What a day for this young man on his home soil. First test ton. First test 150. And he points his blade to all points of the Gabba. He's the sort of guy that actually, he organises backyard cricket, he has garage cricket, so if he's got a day off cricket, he gets his mates around. And I say, mates, it could be 15 or 20 of them playing garage cricket. I'm not sure many test players still do that. Shaheen comes again outside the off stump in the air and caught a gully. And Labashane falls for 185. He's leaning on his bat handle. He does not want to go. Baba Azam, a shake of the hand. In fact, this is really lovely. All the Pakistan players coming forward to shake the hand of Manus Labashane before he departs the field. What a nice touch that is. The spirit of sport is alive and well at the gather. 
And this will be the reception for Manus Labashain. The gather rises to him. Baba took the catch. But Manus Labashain, he's turned a maiden test century into a whopping 185 on his home ground. And the crowd are bringing him off. He resumed today at 55. And as Ali called there, he went on to make 185 as part of that montage you heard from his father, Andre, and also Wade Seckham, the Queensland coach who we had in the grandstand commentary box earlier today. It was a nice, natural, instinctive century celebration, Jason Gillespie. Not too many histrionics, I mean it. Yeah, but, but, yeah well, batters don't need to do that. They don't need to preconceive any ideas about how they're <laughs> going to celebrate innings. You know, what sort of player would do that? <laughs> Yeah, but then what's... No, I won't even go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest, you were disappointed he didn't ride the bat, weren't you? A little bit, yeah. Part of me was just thinking that, 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 would, be, that would be fantastic. But no, look, he, he played wonderfully well, didn't he? And it was, uh, it was great to see. I think it came through the radio. You could, I'm sure you could hear the smile of Marnus oh. Labashain, the pride, um, the sense of achievement, Bucky. Well, I just, I don't think we'll give him a microphone again because he, <laughs> he couldn't hold it still, could he? He was just... Animated. Yeah, animated. Very animated. But, animated. It, but I guess you could just, yeah, you can get the emotion out. And it, it actually gives you a good feeling to see just the pure elation, you know, hear the elation in his voice. And, and I like the fact he just thanked a lot of people because he, he knows how important they've been on, on his journey. Number three is a really tough spot to bat too, particularly in an Australian lineup that has had an unsettled top order. Yeah, and, and I mean from that first ball with a Joff, Joffrey Archer, you know, hit him in the head. I mean, just to think now, to think, you know, if you'd seen him face that first ball and then thought, okay, after the first test in, in the Gabba, this guy's going to, you think he's actually one of the best batsmen in our side, you probably would have laughed at the time, wouldn't you? But he's just come so far in such a short time. And I do think it's down to the fact he has such a, a good growth mindset. He's always pre- prepared, prepared to, to um, take one step back, to go two steps forward and, and to challenge himself. And, and, you know, that's the result. Bucky, as a coach, what have you seen specifically that he's worked on to, to improve his game in the last 12 months? Oh, look, I, I think there's a lot talked about the, the technical changes, but uh, that's not... that. To, be, to go out and do what he did, I think that that's, yeah, there's going to be some technical changes there, but it's, it's as much to do with just his mindset, growing up, maturing, um, and being able to make good decisions over and over and over. You see a lot of good, good players who can hold a bat and they can play great shots, but they'll just make silly decisions. They'll, they'll try and play a, a drive to a good length ball swinging away, but he's making good decisions over and over and that's probably setting him apart from a, a lot of other good players in, in Shield cricket. I think you make a really good point there because certainly as a, as a county coach, uh, he was playing and I touched on he played for Glamorgan uh, over the winter and had, had a really good time there. It's one thing that really stood out for me as a coach was his decision making on and around off stump. You know, I'd seen some footage of him and some dismissals of him pushing at deliveries just outside off stump, being caught behind the wicket. Um, you know, I thought a real feature of his game in county cricket was his ability to leave the ball. Yeah. And, and to actually shelve your ego, that's the other thing. Is, is he, he even mentioned in, in the interview there about you know, playing the reverse paddle or the sweep yeah. or something like that when, when actually the percentage play is just to knock it down to deep long on and take the single and just keep going, keep going and keep going. And that's what I'll, I'll never forget. Um, I played in a game where Mark Ramprakash got 300. And it was actually later that night, I was thinking back, I can't remember actually any of the shots he played. All I can remember is we just were never going to get him out. And that was what kind of stood out to me as being a, a, a really good player. So you're seeing the fundamentals, the technique, the mental approach of a player who, who could have a a decent career at number three in the Australian side. I don't know players go through their peaks and, and troughs, but are you seeing within Marnus that he's got the makings of a long-term player? Nah, he'll be one of the best players in the world, no doubt. Yeah, I completely agree with that. So I put my bowler's hat on and I see a guy who's, who's in control of, of his game and look, I think he's going to score a lot of runs for Australia at number three. High praise from Jason Gillespie and Chris Rogers on grandstand at Stumps. The other significant contribution from an Australian point of view, most of those runs compiled yesterday by David Warner. He was 151 not out overnight. He added only three when Manus Labashain this morning was doing the bulk of the scoring. 
Nassim Shah, the 16-year-old, the youngest player to make his test debut in Australia. Thought he had Warner on 56 yesterday. Today, he finally got him on 154. Warner's on strike. He's on 154. Staring down at his feet. Now looking up as his eyes meet. Nassim Shah bowling around the wicket. A short one and he's hit. Warner didn't take the glove. It's taken by Rizwan. And he's given. David Warner's been given. And Nassim Shah, has he got his first test match wicket? I'm sure they'll look at the front foot again. Has he got David Warner again? Warner is walking. 154 for David Warner. That was a superb bouncer. We wait to see. He got David Warner yesterday on 56. But he overstepped. A good take by Rizwan behind the stumps, moving sharply to his left. It is a legal delivery. Nassim Shah has his first test match wicket. And an outstanding test match innings comes to an end. David Warner dismissed for 154 in his return to test cricket on Australian shores. Warner waves his bats and receives all the plaudits from the Gabba members as he makes his way off the ground. So David Warner dismissed for 154. Joe Burns makes 97. He puts on 222 opening stand with, with Warner. And Lava Shane at number three makes 185. So the top three for Australia has combined for over 430 runs in this game. And you go back to the Ashes series and the ball was moving around and the difficulty for the Australian batsman was staying in for long periods of time. It's certainly been a different case here, Jason and Chris. Yeah, it certainly has, and I, I think it must be said that obviously the conditions are different, but I think the standard of pace bowling is, is, is very different as well. I mean, you know, Warner having, you know, coming out here playing wonderfully well, let's not take anything away from him, but, you know, I thought Stuart Broad and, and the England seamers had, had really clear plans to David Warner, but importantly, they implemented them to a tee, and, and he was just found wanting a little bit, but it was nice to see him uh, score some runs here. Imran Khan comes out and bowls first up to David Warner and, and he's bowling over the wicket to him and we saw what Stuart Broad was able to do to David Warner bowling around the wicket. Yeah. Did they get their plans right? Well, one, I don't think their plans were, were, were particularly good. Uh, but, it, but to be honest, it was hard to know exactly what their plan was because the, just the, the bowling that we saw... Um, you know, we talked a lot about the lengths uh, that the Pakistan seamers bowled, the lines... Um, the lines were poor. I thought the lengths were poor by, by and large. Um, and I know, you know, look, we've got an opening batsman here uh, who opened with distinction would, would know that's the type of bowling you want. You, you want the tucks off the hip to get off strike. And you, you, don't, you don't want your front, uh, you know, your front foot defence challenged. Um, you want to be able to leave a lot of balls and, and get your eye in. Yeah, it's... I mean, they, they might have got their tactics wrong. You, you don't know what they're, they're, they're thinking, but... Equally, tactics don't mean a lick if you, if you can't put the ball in the right area, and they didn't. Yep. No Muhammad Abbas has been a talking point. You wonder whether he would have at least brought some stability and some dot ball pressure had he played for Pakistan in this test match. You'd have to think he'll be playing in the second test, the pink ball test in Adelaide. Well, in this run fest for Australia, would you believe it? Rick Finlay pointed out during our coverage today that for the first time in his career, Steve Smith, in an innings contributed the 11th most runs. He was dismissed for four today, Steve Smith, after his wonderful Ashes campaign. He comes back with so much hope and expectation around what he could do in the home series, and he fell cheaply to Yassir Shah. Shah bowls to Smith. Smith is oh. bowled right through him. He sit all over that. Uh, that is a big wicket for Pakistan Smith invited to dance again by a well plighted ball, and uh, he's been deceived by Yasir Shah. That's a huge wicket. He suddenly looked a bit anxious out there, Steve Smith, what? and he's out for four. And he's out here on the Gabba again, like yesterday. He feels like he probably didn't have enough to do. He hasn't spent enough time out on the Gabba, so he's doing another extensive. Array of footy training drills here, Steve Smith, and the crowd sticking around. The stormtroopers are still here watching on, just watching Steve Smith kick the footy, and it's 
He's equally captivating no matter what sport he plays. Pick up a tennis racket, a golf club, I'm sure you'd just watch Steve Smith do anything, Dizzy, wouldn't you? Yeah, I, I, bet he's a, I bet he's a gun footy player, but he's a gun tennis player. Is he? Yeah, I, I don't know, but I'm assuming he is. Yeah, yeah I reckon uh, so. yep, Just getting a yes from Matt. What about his approach today, Buck? I mean, the way he came out, obviously wanted to target Yassir Shah. He dances down the wicket, he whacks him over mid-wicket for four, and then trying to go after him again, got cleaned up. Yeah, I, there was probably... You know, they, it's sometimes I guess you go out there, it's just not enough riding on it. You know, he's he's had so much success but batted under so much pressure. Today probably probably wasn't a lot of pressure. I thought Pakistan actually got some pretty good strategy in there, the way, the way they went about it. They actually they had no one behind square on the leg side when Yasir was bowling, almost asking him to play a sweep shot. And in the end, he, he tried to flick one across the line and he missed it and bowled off stump. So you know he's trying to drag it from a long way over. So yeah, they, they they've got some tactics for him. It'll be interesting to see how he responds. I don't I don't think it's going to worry him too much. It's just a, maybe a touch more patience. And Yasir Shah, his figures the most expensive in a Test match at the Gabba. He did take the four wickets in the end, four for two hundred and five, and and historically hasn't performed very well in the Southern Hemisphere. He's performed so well generally with over two hundred wickets to his name, but hasn't done well here in Australia. How did you see him? He bowled the best part of, of fifty overs, Jason Gillespie. Yeah, it, look, he was okay. I thought as the as the innings was going on, we saw he was getting a little bit of turn. Thought he was, I thought he he bowled okay today. Um, and look, if you're going to bowl basically half the overs, you're probably going to take a few wickets, aren't you? And um, look, he look he he, he bowled decently, um, but I, I don't think that that surface was was brilliant to bowl spin on. Doesn't help when you're bowling and it's none for either. I mean, yeah, that's the other true. thing. A spin bowler. Ideally, wants to be starting up against a new batsman. So to, to, to be bowling when Australia are none down, on top, you know, it's, there's a lot to lose there, I think. So Pakistan lost early wickets. Uh, they've got a lot to do to try and make Australia bat a second time. At the start of their second innings, needed 340 to make Australia bat again. Azar was out, LBW to Stark for five in just the third over. Harris Sahail caught behind again off Mitchell Stark for eight in the fifth over. And Assad followed... Court Smith at second slip off Cummins for no score. After 6.4 overs, Pakistan was 3 for 25. But a bit of a steadying partnership late in the day between Baba Azam, 20, and Shan Masood, the opener. The left-hander is 27. Pakistan at stumps, 3 for 64. Still needing another 276 runs to make Australia bat again. Did you see anything encouraging tonight from Shan Masood and Baba Azam that suggests they could at least take this game a little further than, than maybe many would think? Oh, I'm not sure about that. What, I think one of the things that was just a little bit exciting was the fact that Baba Azam played pretty well then and uh, I think there's going to be a lot to come from him. He, he looks like another one who could be a very, very good player um, and I, I managed to see a bit of him in the, um, the, the warm-up games for Pakistan and he stood out. He was, he was another, another level above and you do, you want those players around the world. You want some of these players who are, who are very successful. That's why the, the likes of Manus Labashain coming through as well is exciting. So I think to see Baba's name just play the way he did tonight was, was quite, quite exciting. The problem for Pakistan is that the tail is, is quite a long one, isn't it? Yassi is coming in at, at number eight, and then they don't have too much after that. They've still got Iftikhar to bat, and he made some runs in the, the warm-up games. They've also got Mohamed Rizwan, who, who looked OK in the first innings. It's very hard to make a case for Pakistan, even batting out the day tomorrow. But what about the surface? Is that going to deteriorate at all, or will it still be a pretty good one to bat on tomorrow, do you think? I, I, I think it'll be pretty decent to bat on for the, for the best part tomorrow. You just nearly got taken I, out by Steve I, Smith I, on the lead. He took a very I, I good mark, kick. puffed out his chest. He's looking <laughs> tired. He's we looking we were just pumping tired. up his kicking before. How you going, Steve? Having a kick of the footy? Nita Steeden. <laughs> 40-20 specialist, but not so good with the drop punts. Nice little cameo there from the Australian number four, Steve Smith. He's kicking the footy with Cameron Bancroft out there but, at the but, moment. But I, th I think what we'll see, we might see the odd uh, ball misbehave tomorrow, but look, I, I still think that the surface will be good. From the, the Australian point of view, I think the, the bowlers, particularly not to look too far ahead, just focus on, on their process you know, their, their plans, their disciplines, and they will create enough opportunities. So then they've got, you know, and 
Got a three, four down, a few more wickets to get and get into that tail. Um, yeah, as we've said, it is a long tail, so we'll see what happens. And it's a perfect storm for them, really, because they, they get an hour to bowl. Everyone gets a little bit of a crack and they go home, they, they rest, they sleep, come again. They're, you know, it's just ideal, uh, dizzy, isn't it? It's just the way that it's played out. You get two cracks with it fresh. Yep. So the, the bowls will be still fresh, as, as Bucky said, and they can come out. They can, you know, uh, Tim Payne can rotate his quicks around nicely. He's got Nathan Lyon there. Um, you know, if, if he wants to rotate the quicks from one end, he can have Nathan Lyon there to, to hold that, go at two and a half, three and over there, just rotate the boys at the other end, and they'll, they'll create enough opportunities. And what a luxury that is for Tim Payne. You contrast that now with Pakistan's attack, and, and knowing... Albeit this is a two-match series, but we only do have a matter of days between the test matches. The second test coming up, a pink ball test at the Adelaide Oval. And Pakistan's bowlers have been out in the field, toiling away for the best part of two days. 157.4 overs they bowled. Almost 50 of them bowled by the spinner Yasir Shah. But what sort of a psychological and, and physical effect can all that bowling have on that attack, do you think? Well, knowing they're going to go to Adelaide Oval, which is, although it is a pink ball game, it, it is a good good cricket surface and, and tradition, pretty good surface to bat on by and large. You know, yes, there's certain times of the day when it, it can be a challenge to bat, but by and large, it, it'll, it'll play pretty nicely. They know that the Australians have had some success against them in this test match. Um, look, it, it will be interesting to see whether Pakistan management do decide to make a change with their bowling attack. Look, we've spoken a lot about you know who is and isn't playing in their lineup. But you'd expect, with with Australia scoring the amount of runs they scored, being out in the field for over 150 overs, you'd expect they'd tweak that bowling lineup. Would you be expecting a minimum of two changes, Chris, in that Harris Sahail might lose his spot, Imam Al Haq would come in, and then surely Mohammed Abbas plays in Adelaide. Yeah, and that's the side I would have picked originally. Um, I, I think on. they've they've got their tactics wrong. Um, the only way they can they can get anything out of um, the Adelaide Test is if they win the toss and somehow get to put Australia in under lights um, when they're fresh. But apart from that, you can see the, the golfing class between the two sides, in, particularly in Australia. Well, in Australia, yes. The thoughts of Chris Rogers and Jason Gillespie on grandstand at Stumps. Jason Gillespie, we have one of the great social occasions on the calendar coming up tonight. Tell we us do. all about it. We do. Damien Fleming. Um, it's called a fast bowlers meeting um, at, at a local establishment. So it um, looks like the, a number of us uh, who are here. How uh, many are you, you talking? Well, there's a few uh, former um, fast bowlers that are, that are currently working in the media at this game uh, are all coming along. Um, yeah, and I, I think a, a former left-handed batsman wicketkeeper is, uh, is trying to Nuzzle okay. his way in. Gilly to, wants a piece. Yeah, he it. wants a piece. Uh, yeah, so we'll have to wait and see. So it should be, uh, yeah, Michael Kasprovich has organised a venue. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's all systems go tonight. Very exciting. I know uh, there's been some nervous anticipation uh, down the corridors in the uh, uh, up in the media centre. So, yeah, it should be a bit of fun. Our executive producer, Matt Clinch, is standing <laughs> beside us. Has he given you a, a late mark tomorrow? You, you've got to sleep in tomorrow, no, 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 I'll be here bright and early, ready to go. First up, first up. I'll be up. first up. That's fine. And what's the criteria? I mean, do you occasionally allow a batsman to come along and attend these all-important fast bowlers cartel meetings? Yeah, I, they're there to take minutes, generally. So, <laughs> um, so the last time it was Michael Hussey. He uh, he took minutes from the from the uh, fast bowlers meeting. Yeah. All right, we can't wait to hear all <laughs> about it tomorrow on Grandstand. We hope you can join us from day four at the Gabba, 10.30 in the Eastern States, 9.30 local time here in Brisbane. Pakistan to resume at 3 for 64. You can download Grandstand at Stumps from wherever you get your podcasts. Can't wait to talk to you again tomorrow from the Gabba as Australia pushes for a series lead. Now, away goes uh, Hazelwood, and that's a good defensive shot, shot from Shaheen. And uh, he pushes away on the offside. So can they sneak another nine runs somehow to make Australia bat again? I'm sure they're mindful of it. But you're not too sure how these runs are going to come. No. It looks like Shane Afridi has taken it upon himself to, to face the majority of the deliveries here. He's left Imran Khan with a couple of balls last over. Yeah. Um. 
Well, we've got a fine leg, a deep backward square, a deep square, sort of widish mid on, but two slips in the fourth, and Hazelwood bowls the bouncing ball. And they're going for a, something around that line, whether it's an uppercut or a snick. But um, the old fashioned Yorker, sparingly used, it seems, these days. They like to bowl more on their own half than the other half of the tail enders sometimes. Just get it up on a length. Pitch the ball up. I mean, the, the well, old saying, if it's, good, if it's good enough for the top six, it's good enough for the bottom five. <laughs> yeah. Well, if he, he bowls it short and he throws his bat at it, it, it could go for six down here. Hazelwood bowls to him and he swings, and uh, that was agricultural. And he now decides to pick the ball up after hitting it into his pad and he lobs it to David Warner. Well, it was a, it was a very full length. This the line was out well outside off stump then. So maybe the intent there from Hazelwood <laughs> was to bowl the Yorker. Yep. So they've got to this position because Baba Razam made an excellent century, 104. Rizwan, 95. And Yassir Shah, his highest test score, 42. But they were 5 for 94. Hazelwood runs in again. He swings. Where's that gone? Straight up in the air to cover, and he's caught by Cummins. Yep. I think he had a little bit of premeditation that time. He decided he was going to have a crack, and uh, he didn't get hold of it. He hit it straight up in the air to cover, and Shaheen is out. They still need nine to make Australia bat again, and it's another wicket for Hazelwood. Four for 63. And Jim, it looked like a hit high on the stickers of yeah, yeah of Shane Afridi's bat. Very simple catch to Pat Cummins. That's Josh Hazelwood's fourth wicket. Mm. The innings four for sixty-three for him. Yeah, six wickets for the match. Stark and Cummins have two apiece. And uh, as they say, the end the end is nigh with Young and Azim Shah coming out to bat. And he looked, um, yes, uh, a, a little unlikely with the bat in the first innings, but he did survive the hat-trick ball from Mitchell Stark. And now he's got to try and survive long enough, you would uh, hope from Pakistan's point of view, to make Australia bat again. But there's a couple of opening batsmen out there who will be wanting that not to happen. <laughs> So, I'm look, not even sure if the Pakistan bowlers will want to go out and bowl yeah. again. Yes, it could have been one of those one-run chases or something if it happens. But here's Hazelwood trying to get the last wicket. He bowls to Nassim. He swings and misses. He had a mighty oh. wallop at that, and it went straight over the stumps. It did everything but bowl him. He was a bit lucky. But uh, that was certainly premeditated. Um and Nathan Lyon below us says he's a very fine third man. He could be in the frame here if he somehow wick, wicks one with a big swing like that. I think if this ball's at the stumps, I think Josh Hazelwood will get his fifth wicket. Mm. Nine needed to make Australia bat again. Josh Hazelwood on the verge of a fiver. Here he comes. He bowls to Nassim, and Nassim plays straight. He stayed where he should have and uh, the ball hit his bat and went down to mid on well, so we're going to have uh, Imran Khan facing the music here with nine needed well you got what you wanted Jim that was an attempted Yorker by Josh Hazelwood mm. Mm. dug out he watched it the young fella he watched it dug it out yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so um We've still got you know, plenty of time is not the issue here today. It's just a matter of a, a win. Um, and, of course, whether or not they can sneak or bang or get lucky or something, another nine run. Starks decided to go around the wicket, which is usual, usually his most lethal method against uh, nine, ten and Jack. And he's got Imran Khan down there. Here he comes. Stark runs up, Imran swings at this. Hits him straight back over his head for four. A good old slog from Imran Khan. And he's picked up a boundary. Five runs needed. Not happening, Jim. <laughs> what a good slog that <laughs> it was. was. 
He was nowhere near that Imran Khan. <laughs> Absolutely nowhere near it. Front leg cleared, put it towards mid on. Now, the, the pressure on Stark here to finish this off. But uh, who will. knows where the ball's going to go? He will. Stark goes in. Imran swings again. And he's got a good piece of this, but he will be caught down there by Matthew Wade. He's under it. He's got it. It's all over Australia. One by an innings. An innings and five runs. Mitchell Stark did get the last wicket. He finished with three in the innings. Pakistan all out for 335. And Australia going one up in this two-match series with a comprehensive win inside four days. They've won by an innings and five runs. Yeah, almost identical delivery there by Mitchell Stark. Imran Khan clearing his front leg again. Just hitting it straight up in the air. Matthew Wade, well judge catch. Mm. It was, went very high. Very high. And that, that is a very fine win for the Australian cricket team. Yep, they've done um, what they threatened to do from uh, day one when Pakistan batted first and made only 240. And uh, they grabbed the initiative with an opening partnership of 222. And then they've, they've never really lost control of the game, even though we had that excellent batting today from uh, ba, um, Baba Azam and uh, Rizwan, Mohammed Rizwan, playing just his second test. Australian bowls made to work hard today, Jim, yeah. for, the, for the victory. Um, you know, the, the two batsmen you just mentioned played very well, worked really hard against some... It must be said, it's some very good bowling throughout this whole test match by the Australian bowlers. The Australian seamers completely out bowled the Pakistan seamers. So the Australian players just um, quietly going about their business of uh, enjoying the moment. And Manus Labashain has uh, souvenired a stump, as he should, in what has been an extraordinary test for him in front of his family and his home crowd. And uh, Australia very gently and uh, with some grace moving towards the area where we will have some interviews and uh, a little presentation. The Pakistan players are out on the field shaking the Australians' hands for uh, competing in this game. And uh, Pakistan just struggling to match Australia's great quality with the ball and that's been a big difference the ammunition that Australia provide these days in a test match so an innings and five runs and we'll have a wrap down on the field but Dizzy what did you make of this game well what we did see we saw some fantastic batting and application by the Australian lineup Joe Burns coming in home ground Tess Marnus Labuschagne batting three and I think the return to Test match cricket in Australia of David Warner and Steve Smith. Steve Smith missed out, obviously, but David Warner, I thought it was a... It, it, I, I genuinely think it was one of his better knocks. Um, and the reason I say that is, while the bowling, I don't think, was as, as lethal as maybe some other bowling he's faced, but I, th I think it was his, his movements, his decision-making. It, it, he didn't look at all like he... Uh, premeditated at all it was more about he was trusting his trusting his decision making trusting himself to simply react to the ball um, and while you know there's been some talk that he you know maybe a bit slower it was his slowest test hundred or one of one of his slowest test hundreds I think the way he went about his game I think it was it was very mature batting um, overall I think the Australian bowlers bowled very well very nicely I think Mitchell Stark, did he finish with six or seven wickets for the match? He finished with seven. On a pretty benign surface, you know, we we're talking about, you know, players that have performed well in this game. Bubba Azam, 100 today. Rizwan got 90, 90-odd. Um, 90 um, and obviously the Australian batsman who scored runs. 
you know, the seamers, you know, got got lots of wickets. Hazelwood six, um, and Mitch Stark seven for the match. So Pakistan started the day three down, and they quickly lost well within the hour a couple of of wickets. Um, with uh, first of all Sham Massoud caught by Payne off Cummins for 42 Iftikhar Ahmed only four balls caught by Payne from Hazelwood then the recovery led by Babar Azam caught Payne bold Lion 104 Yassi Shah caught Wade bold Hazelwood 42 Rizwan caught by Lion off Hazelwood for 95 Shaheen caught Cummins bold Hazelwood 10 Imran caught Wade bold Stark for 5 with Nassim Nort not out 3-3-5, three, three, Stark 3 for 73, Cummins 2 for 69, Hazelwood 4 for 63, Nathan Lyon the one wicket for 74 and Labuschagne none for 38. So let's go down onto the ground for grandstand at Stumps with Al Nicholson and the team. Australia has started the two test series against Pakistan with a convincing win here at the Gabba. And the kids down on the ground are pretty excited about it down near us. They're calling out to the players, Paddy Cummins and others, to come and uh, sign autographs. And why wouldn't you after Australia's commanding win? An innings and five runs, Pakistan really did fight hard on the fourth day to try and at least make Australia bat a second time. It fell the five run short, dismissed for 335 in their second innings. Alistair Nicholson, Chris Rogers and Mitchell Johnson to dissect the first test with you on grandstand at Stumps. We'll bring you the presentations. We'll also have Tim Payne, the Australian captain, very shortly for you. Mitch, Bucky, how did you see the day? And then more broadly, how did you see the test match? Well, the day went a little longer than I probably expected. Um, I was probably getting a little too far ahead of myself. I just thought... Australia through this uh, this test match have performed quite well. I know they can get better in a lot of places, and they'll look to do that. They started the test match; uh, they were put in to field, uh, so they did really well there. They was it 240, I think it was. They got Pakistan out four, and um, then they just piled on the runs. I just think, yeah, it was a, it was a great batting performance overall, and they'll be pretty happy with that. And and look, they can still get better with the bowling. They were within five runs. Uh, it was a flat pitch uh, but um, I mean that'll give some confidence to Pakistan I think with uh, some of that middle order batting. Yeah it was just a pretty ruthless display from Australia in the end. I mean they're always going to be favourites uh, at home particularly at, at Brisbane um, but they, they went about it the right way. They lost the toss, they had to bowl well, they were challenged at lunchtime on day one um, but they came back well and then and then I think the most pleasing thing for Justin Langer will be the batting. It just, I think there's been musical chairs going on with that batting lineup for a while, and, and he just wants a bit of stability. Um, and people at the top to, to take the pressure off Steve Smith, and that's what they got. And they, I think they've unearthed a star, an absolute star in the making in Manus Labuschagne, uh, who's going to be there for a long time to come. So some really good signs. It's the runs he brings, it's the way he goes about it, Bucky, but it's also the energy around the group. He seems to be a really positive person within that, that playing group at the moment. Oh, I just think the Australian public's going to love him too because it's, there's a whole lot of innocence there as well. I, I think when we, we interviewed him after the game, it, one of the things that stood out was just how grateful he was to the people who'd, who'd helped him along the, along the way. So um, that's just a, such a good quality. Speaking of good quality, Pat Cummins has come for a chat. Welcome to Grandstand at Stumps, Pat. Thanks for having me. Well, what do you make of uh, the first day or first days at the office in Test Match Cricket on Australian soil for the summer? Yeah, brilliant. Um, you know, extra day off tomorrow. Um, I thought, you know, really complete game. Um, you know, day one, thought we did a really good job to get them out for 240 on what I thought was a pretty good wicket. And then, you know, the batters went to work. They were absolutely outstanding, um, not only scoring big runs, but... Gave us bowlers a couple of days um, off our feet, which, which is always nice going in the last innings. Obviously, there was a lot of emphasis on the batting coming into the Test Series, um, some positions to be locked away. Did we get some answers in this Test match? Do you reckon about who might be part of that batting line-up into the long term? Oh, you'd hope so. Um, you know, everyone's scoring big runs, so the top top few um, scoring big runs. and I think when you win a win a game like that by an innings, it's pretty hard to change the line-up, so... Um, Really, really happy with how everyone's going. It's a great feeling around the group at the moment. Well, what do you, what do you guys think of when you see Mardis 
Labuschagne and, and the way he's improved over the last period. What, what's the chat uh, amongst the team about where you think he can get to? Uh, hasn't been too much chat about that, but I, I can't believe when you see the side-on vision of him last year to this year, how in 12 months he's you know, basically changed his technique and he just looks so settled. And I think he's only 25, but he looks like a guy that's in total control of his game. Has all the shots, really you know, uses his feet well to spin and, and pace as well. So it's really exciting. He's um, you know, here on his home ground, showed what he, what he can do. I think mean, he's played 10 games, but um, yeah, he already looks like a, you know, really comfortable at this level. Uh, Paddy, how do you feel the pitch played throughout this test match? Uh, was it a typical Brisbane Wacker wicket? Uh, Gabba wicket, sorry. Gabba wicket. Uh, I've only played a couple of games here. Um, it felt, you know, day one looking at it, it, was, it had a tinge of green and, and a little bit of grass, but it was probably less sideways movement than I thought. Um, the ball actually... I don't know what it normally does, but it felt like it got quite soft after you know, 25, 30 overs, and then from that it, it was pretty hard to, to get too much life out of the wicket. But, um, yeah, it was, you know, the odd one bounced, um, but, yeah, not too much sideways movement. You weren't rotated in the Ashes, and you've been through a lot of cricket over the last period. Is you feeling good? You, you think you're going to play all the test matches for the, for the summer? Yeah, I hope so. The, the good thing after the Ashes, I, I had about four weeks you know, completely off bowling, um, which is as big a break as I've ever had um, without being injured. Um, so it was really nice, and the last few weeks has, has been a pretty good build-up. I played some T20s and, and a Shield game. So since the Ashes, um, you know, the prep's been basically ideal, and I felt as fresh as I felt for a long time coming to this Test match, so hopefully it continues. So was there anything that you worked on through that period then? Because that's a pretty good opportunity to, to work on some skills. Yeah. Think about some skills. Yeah, think about some skills. I think the good thing about the T20s, we, we had six games in a couple of weeks, and to be honest, it was probably the first block that I could just concentrate on on white ball for a few for a few weeks. Um, you know, especially coming off so much red ball cricket in England, I was pretty happy with that where that was at. So, yeah, concentrate on on T20s for a couple of weeks coming back, and then um, you know, I felt like the, the transfer back to here was pretty quick. Barbara's arm broke through a Test Match Century in Australia, his second Test Match Century. How did you find him to, to bowl to today? Yeah, I thought he played nicely. Um, you know, obviously, any width out there, he pounced on and hit the ball really cleanly. Um, yeah, he, he looks like a you know, guy who's again, knows his game quite well. Um, hopefully, it's uh, next week, pink ball. There's a, a little bit of sideways movement, um, and it might be slightly different, but I thought he batted beautifully, so did Riz one. Just on the pink ball and, and the set of challenges, I guess, and, and tactics that that brings to Test Match Cricket heading to Adelaide for that test starting on Friday. How do you, do you approach a, a pink ball match? I think it's largely the same. I guess the, the strategy sometimes around the night sessions changes. Um, you know, we've seen in the five or so years that it's been around, the ball just seems to zip around and be more lively at night. So trying to use those key, key moments. Um, but other than that, it's... Yeah, for most of the time, it's, it's pretty good hard cricket. Enjoy it. Congratulations on the win. Thanks very much. Ta. Pat Cummins with us on Grandstand at Stumps here at the Gabba as he shakes hands with Mitchell Johnson and, and Chris Rogers. Uh, the feature of, of Pat Cummins seems to have been of late. It's not necessarily that he's taking the big fifers all the time. He's just consistently taking two, three, four, that kind of thing. He did it through the Ashes series as well where he didn't take a fifer but was the leading wicket taker. And again, contributing with uh, wickets in this match, three for 60 in the first innings and and two for 69 in the second. Has he just become that really reliable fast bowler that Australia's always wanted him to be now? Yeah, I think he's a captain's dream. He, he's, when he gets the ball, you, you give him the ball, he knows what he needs to do. Um, so you, you, you almost let him set his fields, bowl to his plans, um, and he goes about and he, get, he gets the job done, and I, I think that that's just so important. And the, the thing is now, you have, you have three guys Three guys in that um, in that side who are all like that in in Hazelwood, um, Cummins and Lyon. So you have the luxury of being able to to, to play a Stark even if he's not completely on, because you're guaranteed good performances from the other three. So Hazelwood picks up four for 63 in the second inning. Stark three for 72. Uh, to go with a good performance in the first innings when he picked up four for 52, so he gets seven wickets for the match. And he was the one, Mitchell Johnson, who had to really bide his time during the Ashes, and he's, he's got significant reward here at the Gabba. Yeah, I mean, we've spoken about him uh, a fair bit throughout this test with his action just slightly changing and something that he's been very keen on. So 
It's, uh, it's been exciting to watch and um, to get wickets, that's his job. And um, we've just got Tim Payne just join us. Yeah, he looks very satisfied indeed, the Australian captain. Thanks for your time, Tim. Congratulations. Thanks, mate. I uh, would have liked to have been here a little earlier, but um, I thought they batted really well. Did you think, oh, no, we're not going to have to pull the pads on again, are we? Oh, I didn't mind. I'm hiding down <laughs> at seven, so it didn't bother me one bit. But I'll tell you what, there was two very happy men when we took that last catch. Joe Burns and David Warner celebrated harder than most of us. Obviously, you, you line up the first test of the home summer and there's a real emphasis on performing well in it. Did you achieve everything that you hoped to in this match? Uh, yeah, I think if you win an inning, win a test match by over an innings, you've done a lot right. So, um, yeah, I was really proud of the way we started the summer. There's certainly some things we could tidy up on. Um, I thought the way we finished our batting um, were a bit better than that. I think from sort of seven down, we pride ourselves on scoring a few more runs. We've got some talented batters in our bowling group. Um, and then today... Um, I thought we bowled well for most of the time, but uh, again, I would like to have finished a little bit earlier, but got to give Pakistan some credit as well. I thought um, Rizwan and, and Baba batted really well. Even, even though you said that you would have rather have been here a little earlier talking to us, um, it's probably not a bad thing for the bowlers to have a bit of a run like that on a pitch like that. Yeah. Um, and obviously now there's a, an extra day off as well, so going into that next test. So well, how did you see that? Like, they, they were working hard today. Yeah, I thought, again, I thought they bowled really well. I think we're um, just probably hold those four to a really high standard. So when they don't clean teams up, we think what's going on. And um, But that's, I suppose, one of the things that happens when you've got a world-class attack. Um, yeah, I think, again, they took 20 wickets. Um, they were awesome in the first innings. They were pretty good for most of the second innings. Uh, lost away a little bit with our lengths towards the end. But when the tail's slogging like that as well, it can be quite hard to, to hold your length. So... Uh, yeah, again, 20 wickets. Uh, they've been awesome. If we can continue to score that many runs, we're going to win a lot of tests with those four bowlers. Um, it, it was a ruthless performance. Um, you must be exceptionally pleased. But if you look at it as a whole, what's probably the most pleasing aspect out of the last four days? Um, I think I think our batting, to be honest. Um, there's been a lot of talk about it and a lot of pressure on our batting group to, to score more runs. Um, and not relies as heavily on Steve. So if we're honest, Smithy missing out and still getting 580 is a real positive for our group. Um, it's something we've been building towards. England was difficult. It was the first time a lot of our players have been there. But I think as, you, as you've seen the last four or five days, a lot of guys have come out of that tour, better players. Um, and I think we're, we're getting to the stage where we're going to be more consistently scoring big first innings runs. Um, and if we do that, as I said, with the four bowls we've got, we're going to be really hard to beat. Uh, and would you expect now Joe Burns and Davey Warner to see out the Test summer? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think they'll be scoring enough runs to um, both really good players. Uh, I said a few times I thought the way they, they set the tone for our batters with their running between the wickets and their energy. Um, I thought they batted superbly and um, you know, they've actually already been into Marnus today about making his, his innings a hell of a lot easier for him. But that's what openers do, but they wear the shine off it. Hopefully they can cash in like those two do and it makes it much easier for the rest of us. How did you find the decision with um, Josh Hazelwood hitting... I can't remember who it was on the pad, but it looked like live, it looked pretty out. Yeah. How, what did you guys discuss in the huddle before that? Yeah, so again, our, our, our thing is at the moment we have a bit of a chat and decide why it wasn't given out. Um, we thought the only reason he might have given it out is if it was going over, but um, we were all pretty happy with the height. But um, as you know, at the Gabber, it can be hard at times to get LBWs and... Um, I wouldn't say it was a wrong review. We got to keep our review, yep. so we've kept our record intact for the summer. <laughs> so you go to Adelaide and the pink ball. What's, what's your challenge, what's your worry with Pakistan heading into that match? Um, look, I think the pink ball, firstly, I think you've got to adapt to it really quickly. They've obviously had a game with it already this summer. Um, so we're going to have to, luckily now we have a day early, so we might be able to get there and have a bit of a look at it. But um, look, I think they've got some really skillful players. I think their quicks have got some real air speed. Um, they've got a world-class spinner. Uh, they look like they found a really good opening batter in, in Masood, uh, and their middle order's dangerous. So, um, as we saw today, if we're not quite on against this Pakistan team, they're going to they're going to give us a really good run for our money. So we've got to maintain our our discipline and keep executing as a bowling group, and um, and keep cashing in when we get a chance as, as as a batting group. So it's a pretty simple game. Tim, congrats. Good to chat. Thanks for your time. No worries. Thanks, mate. Australian captain Tim Payne with us on grandstand at Stumps, and uh, Barbara Zam is also been made available to us. Ramiz Raj is going to be having a chat with him in just a moment on Grandstand. Um, Ramiz, thanks to be, thanks to you for being with us and uh, Baba Razam as well. Welcome to you on Grandstand. Thank you. Thank you so much. Congratulations on your, your innings. I'll let Ramiz take you away through it. Yeah, I mean um, uh, Baba, it's a difficult work in this century and you had to stamp your authority 
वन डे के वन डे के बाद टेस्ट क्रिकेट में तो कितने आप खुश हैं आ, काफ़ी खुश हूँ क्योंकि अर्ली ऑन हमारी जो विकटें गिर गई थी उसके बाद हमें पार्टनरशिप की ज़रूरत थी तो मेरा यही था कि जब मैं और शान भाई खेल रहे थे अर्ली ऑन तो हमने यही कहा था कि पार्टनरशिप जितनी लगाएंगे उतना अच्छा है तो अगले दिन आके हम उसको कंटिन्यू करेंगे तो बस वही हुआ था जो अगले दिन आए तो थोड़ी छोटी पार्टनरशिप हुई लेकिन उसके बाद जब रिजवान आया तो हमारा यही प्लान था कि यार गलत शॉट नहीं माननी अगर अच्छा बॉल हो जाए तो वो फेयर इनफ लेकिन हमने वो लूज शॉट नहीं माननी तो बस यही प्लान था कि कितना जितनी हम पार्टनरशिप करेंगे उतना हमारे लिए बेहतर होगा सो आई आस्क द क्वेश्चन हाउ शफ्ट ही इज अबाउट स्कोरिंग दिस हंड्रेड Uh, and obviously he's extremely delighted the other thing is that he wanted to uh, get the partnerships rolling for pakistan the entire day so first one was with shan and then later when he was batting with rizwan it was asking him to just control his natural instinctive play which was to hit the ball and just take the the effort deep into in day 4 did he feel that even though pakistan was in a very difficult position from early on in this match that they were able to take something out of out of the match in the end mm. Uh, मुश्किल तो था पाकिस्तान के लिए मगर इस मैच से क्या आप लेके जा रहे हैं एडलेट जी बिल्कुल रमेश भाई जो गलतियां की हैं वो आगे जो एडलेट में टेस्ट मैच है वो वो ना करें लेकिन जो अच्छी कैसी गलतियां गलतियां हम एज बैटिंग जो अर्ली ऑन जो हमारी विकटें गिरी हैं वो ये कि अर्ली ऑन जब नहीं गिरेगी तो पार्टनरशिप जितनी लगेगी उतना बेहतर होगा नीचे वाले बैट्समैन को भी कॉन्फिडेंस uh, आएगा कि ऊपर अच्छा खेल रहे हैं तो वो जब uh, आप थोड़ा सा खेलते हैं आफ्टर टेन टू फिफ्टीन ओवर तो थोड़ा सा गेम थोड़ा सा आसान हो जाता है तो वो आप फिर आप उस हिसाब से आप अपना गेम प्लान करते हैं तो मेरे ख्याल से ये जो पार्टनरशिप है जितनी होगी उतनी अच्छी होगी सो स्पेंडिंग टाइम एट द क्रीज वॉज वैल्यूबल एंड मेक श्योर देट यू नो यू डोंट कमिट द सेम मिस्टेक्स लर्न फॉर योर मिस्टेक्स एंड सो दिल कैरी दीम forward into the early test and let's ask him the big one rami is what we all want to know for adelaide is surely mohammed abbas plays and, and what about mm-hmm. imam al haq as well yeah okay um aap kaptan to nahi hai na chief selector hai magar main phir bhi puch raha hu ki pura australia puchna jata hai mohammed abbas kahan hai aur kya imam al haq ki wapsi ho sakti hai aa dekhenge abhi jab ek do session hai mare ek practice practice hogi usme dekhenge ke jo team ka kya khayal hai mohammed abbas ko miss kiya ya nahi जाहिर सी बात है इन कंडीशन में हम वाकई उसको मिस किया था लेकिन जो टीम टीम का डिसीजन था वो हमें करना सामने रख के खेलना था कि वो आवाज खेल रहे हैं इमरान खान खेल रहे तो यही था कि जो खेल रही है उस पर बैक कर so uh, clearly a very guarded answer because he's neither the chief selector nor the chief coach is not a miss ball hack but he's aspiring to become one i think uh, Yeah I mean they clearly miss Mohammad Abbas because they needed somebody to bowl in that corridor of uncertainty as it's called uh and there's no response regarding Imam Ul Haq from him so uh, he says he'll look at the practice session who bats first and probably then he'll give us a clue whether Imam is batting or not whether he gets a go in the nets or not Baba we loved your performance congratulations thank you thank you so much thank you Brilliant. Baba Azam Brilliant. with us on grandstand at Stumps and thank you very much to Ramiz Raja for his translations a few reflections on the test match US dollars by the way <laughs> we don't pay in US we pay right, Australian in, we pay in lira yeah. lira all right okay so 250 million lira then <laughs> talk us through it from your perspective Ramiz how did you see this Pakistani performance in the first yeah, I think uh, it, it was a good hard cricket that they played today obviously there was so much at stake their reputation and it was an excellent uh, time for them to become heroes also you know your match winning innings are uh, memorable for you and for the fans but match saving innings are as much important so i'm sure you know the australian fans had a look at babar azam and what talent he possesses and so it's a, it's a great century for him and hopefully lots more from him uh, and also i think uh, rizwan i think pakistan have found a good one he's is gritty Uh, you know he is quick on his feet he played spin well and i i thought what was best about rizwan was his temperament because playing only your second test match with your back against the wall uh, you had to deliver and it de- delivered beautifully uh, and just in terms of selection from your perspective then with a i guess the the capacity to pass judgment maybe more freely than babar azam yeah. would you see those two changes that that i was asking about occurring for adelaide Yeah you've got to uh, play Mohammad Abbas you know um, even if he's half firing he's got experiences and he's bowled superbly um, against the Australians and the other thing that I think should happen is Pakistan need to play three openers because if the real match is how to negotiate fast bowling and that's going to be the key in pink test uh, match also then you've got to have them at 1 2 and 3 because Haris Sohail hasn't looked uh, 
the quality that you'd want at number three on these bouncy tracks. I agree with you, Ramis, but if you looked at the, the warm-up games and Imam Al-Haq played a, mm. a, a pretty good innings, even, even though it was against a, a younger opposition, but he showed those qualities. Why do you reckon that they actually went for Harris Sahal in the end over Imam? Well, you see, they, they feel that Harris has got a lot of potential and talent, uh, and his record is not bad. I mean, he averages in the 40s in Test cricket. Uh, last time he played for Pakistan in a test match against Australia, it was, I think, he, he, he got 100. Uh, so they wanted to carry him through and maybe establish him as a number three batsman. But clearly, I mean, he's looking for the short ball. The technique was all over the place. That's why he was uh, managing to feather those balls outside the off -stump because he was looking for that bouncer length all the time. So it's clearly a misfit. I would have another opener slotted at number three. Ramiz, it's been awesome working with Fantastic you across the course work. of the Thanks last so. few days, and you'll be with us again in Adelaide. We look forward to having you again there. Right. Brilliant to be here. Thanks a lot. Ramiz Raja with us, former Pakistan Test batsman on grandstand at Stumps. Um, Australia has won this match convincingly, the first Test, dismissing Pakistan in its second innings for 335, the victory by a margin of an innings and five runs in the end. Man of the match, unsurprisingly, Manus Labashain. We're going to hear from him in just a moment. Before we get to that, we will reflect on one of the bright parts of Pakistan's day, and it was certainly the knock of Babar Azam. Up to the wicket now to Barbara outside the off stump, and he's cutting away past line at backward point. That'll be four. Racing away towards the fence. Two slips, Gully Cummins into the attack. Bowling to Barbar on 92. Short and he pulls through mid wicket. Great shot for. A slip, the catching man outside the off stump. Stroke through, cover. That might be his hundred. It's racing out to the boundary. Baba Azam reaches triple figures at the Gabba. And he pumps his fist in the middle of the pitch. What a delight to see one of the great talents of world cricket transfer the white ball form to the traditional form of the game. He's 100 not out in a very, very tough scenario for his country. And he gets the plaudits from the fans in Brisbane, drops to his knees, kisses the turf, praises those around him. What a knock. Line bowls, there's the edge, there's the wicket. Payne a sharp catch and Bubba Azam, a fine innings, comes to a close. Lyon gets that all-important breakthrough and ends the partnership of defiance from Baba Azam and Mohammad Rizwan. Baba out for 104. A superb innings delivering on his immense talent and putting it on show here at the Gabba. It's six for 226. So Baba Azam made 104 for Pakistan today. A real bright spark for them and Mohammad Rizwan 95 as well. Their partnership actually did threaten to take this game a little further than many of us had expected. So there is perhaps some more spine to this Pakistan batting lineup than we first thought based on the first innings. Yeah, well they they actually dismantled Australia A. Eh? So they came in with some pretty good prep and I I think that they were quietly hopeful that they could um, do something that unexpected and, and, and cause a boil over but they came up against a, an Australian, particularly the attack, that's just on top of its game, and, and they got found out. I think a couple of the players who, who, who can play well just found it a little bit hard with the, with the extra quality. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to like. They've got some very good players. I still can't understand some of their selections. I think they, they didn't actually give themselves the best chance. But they'll go to Adelaide. I think that they will get the right side. Um, how they fare there, I, I think they'll need to win the toss and then somehow put Australia in under lights at some stage. I, I feel that they maybe were just a little bit too tentative at the start and sort of looking up at the scoreboard, um, 240 and 86th or 87th over and they got 335 within 85 um, uh, in the second innings. But I just feel like maybe they thought, oh, the Gabba, it's going to do a bit early, so let's just be really watchful. Maybe they could have just been a little bit more aggressive uh, with their batting. I don't know. I, I, just sort of thinking about it now more than anything. But, um, yeah, I, I'm the same. I think they were quite confident coming in after what they did in uh, Perth in the um, against the young guys there. But I, they're in the game with this pink ball. I think they're massively in the game. And if they could really, if they win the toss, they could go through Australia if they um, they've definitely got the talent they might you might see the ball swing a lot more as well and do a little bit more early on there so 
Yeah, we'll wait and see. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a little bit hard to expect them to come out and play shots, but I, I know what you're getting at. 80, to get 240 off 85 overs or whatever it is, you're actually having to do so much hard work. It's going to probably count against you at some stage. But you know what? They were none for 60 at lunch, I think, on day one or whatever. They'd probably take that. But then from there, it was Is that, that good enough, though? The, the pitch wasn't moving. There wasn't really any swing oh. either. Yeah, and they bowled well, like at times, Australia, but we even said that they didn't bowl their best. Yeah, it, it probably cost them in the end because they had a couple of guys who, I mean, they got out right after each other and, you know, it just looked like that they'd, they'd almost hit the wall a little bit with how hard they were they were, they were were trying. So you need to try and get that balance, yep. but, you know, they fought hard. There were, there were some... There were some times that they could have easily collapsed and given in, but they they held held on. There's there's got to be a bit more, no doubt, particularly with when they're in the field um, in Adelaide. But there's some some good qualities, and I do think Baba Azam will be an exceptional player for years to come. So Pakistan dismissed for 240 in the first innings after winning the toss and electing it to bat first. Australia then compiled 580. And then in reply to that, Pakistan all out for 335 in 84.2 overs. So they did collapse in the end, as predicted by Jason Gillespie when the second new ball was taken. So Australia's 580, multiple contributions of great significance. Joe Burns, 97, David Warner, 154. But the star of the show was the man of the match, Manus Labashain, who made 185. His maiden test century was a beauty. Let's relive it. You do sort of think about how you want to celebrate 100, you know, when you're a kid, how you're going to do it. And then when I nicked it, I look back, I don't know what happened, something took over, because that's not what I was planning to do. Labashain on 97, Shaheen in, he's driving a thick outside edge, through the gap, wide of third slip, the four down to the third man boundary. Labashain on his home ground. It's his maiden test ton, and the gather rises. Andre Lubbaskarpany with me, who's just seen his son, Manus Lubbershain, score a ton. Oh, it's an amazing experience. It's just an awesome outcome. Lubbershain on 149, strokes the ball to point, takes the single. 150 for Manus at the Gabba. What a day for this young man on his home soil. First test ton. First test 150. And he points his blade to all points of the Gabba. He's the sort of guy that actually, he organises backyard cricket, he has garage cricket, so if he's got a day off cricket, he gets his mates around, and I say, mates, it could be 15 or 20 of them playing garage cricket. I'm not sure many test players still do that. Shaheen comes again outside the off stump in the air and caught it, gully! And Labashain falls for 185, he's leaning on his bat handle, he does not want to go. Baba Azam, a shake of the hand. In fact, this is really lovely. All the Pakistan players coming forward to shake the hand of Manus Labashain before he departs the field. What a nice touch that is. The spirit of sport is alive and well at the Gabba. And this will be the reception for Manus Labashain. The Gabba rises to him. Baba took the catch. But Manus Labashain, he's turned a maiden test century into a whopping 185 on his home ground. And the crowd are bringing him off. Beautifully described by Alison Mitchell, as far as innings are concerned. It was certainly a whopper. A maiden test century for Manus Labashain, 185. And you do wonder what he's going to do from here. When you factor in, and we spoke about this during the course of the match, Chris Rogers and Mitchell Johnson, here's a guy who gets his opportunity under strange circumstances, unconventional circumstances, during the Ashes series. He absolutely seizes the moment when given that opportunity. And he uses that to build the platform and now cements, consolidates his spot at number three in the Australian test side. I mean, people talk about getting opportunities in strange ways sometimes. And Manus has certainly seized his, Chris. Yeah, he has. I mean, he had... They were tough conditions over in England and he did well there. I think he averaged 50. And then to come back and put his stamp on, on it straight away with that... For me too, I was lucky enough to to see them train um, leading into the test and you could just tell there's something different about him. He just has this incredible hunger that he wants to do well, he wants to get better um, and that doesn't always transfer into good performances but you can just see the way he's going about it, that he's giving himself every chance. Yeah, he's the right character, isn't he? Um, it's not just the performance on the field, it's what uh, he does off the field and away from the game. 
Um, that's what Justin Langer wants in this uh, Australian team, this lineup. So, uh, as as Tim Payne said, I think he was pretty impressed with the way the guys batted um, throughout this this uh, test match. Yeah, the other thing too, he, he's just such a, a friendly, innocent guy at the moment. Yeah. You know, like he. he he just brings this freshness, I think, that um, the Australian public can re- really enjoy and really get behind because he, you can see he's playing. He just, he just loves it. You know, he, he, he talks about being nervous, about how much enjoyment that 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 yeah, he's, pretty, what, he's quite open, isn't he? Which is good. Yeah, and and what you know, the normal person would be like if you were in that situation. We're getting a bit old TV here. It's the walk and talk that we're doing <laughs> on radio. We're wandering over to Manus Labuschagne because he's signing autographs over by the fence here at the Gabba. We're going to go and see if we can have a chat to him. He might be able to sign a few autographs while he's doing it as well. He's he's a good multitasker. And I reckon the kids will be happy to be on a bit of ABC radio as well. There are hats hanging over the fence and miniature cricket bats left, right and centre for the man of the match, Marnus Labuschagne. What do you reckon of Marnus, boys? Pretty happy with his output? He batted beautifully, didn't he? 185. He's going to join us on Grandstand at Stumps very shortly, so we look forward to having a chat with Marnus, the man of the moment. In fact, we'll try and sneak in while he's signing a few autographs here. If you can multitask for us a bit, Marnus. You can't do it? Can't do it. Well done, mate. We will let you get back to signing autographs very shortly, but reflect on the last four days. How's it been for you? Look, it was a great game. Um, like, as, as the game as a whole, I think our bowlers were fantastic. Um, you know, after there being none for on day one, um, to knocking him over for 240 and then, um, you know, for, for Joe and, and Dave to, to start like that, I mean, that's the dream um, start, you know, opening pair just brought back together and, um, you know, they really they really took the, the sting out of their attack and, and it, was, it was amazing um, to see both of them get, get big scores. Tim Payne was saying that they were trying to suggest that they were the reason for your big knock. Do you concur or do you disagree that they, they took the shine off it, they did the hard work? Well, look. As far as as far as that, that's the longest I've had to wait to bat for 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 a very long time. Um, you know what was I in the 64th over or 60th over, something like that. So that's you can't ask more. Though. That's amazing job from them, and and they both batted unbelievably. So um, credit to them. Uh, we saw you yesterday, um, Marnus, and obviously you're on top of the world. What did you do last night to to reflect, and and who did you get to celebrate it with? Uh, I actually just went home. I had a beer here and then uh, just in the ice bath and then uh, went home and just had some some pasta for dinner and then just chilled out and uh, went through all my messages, thanking everyone um, for, for all their, you know, obviously, um, what do I call it? Congratulations. 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 How many do you reckon you got? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Too many. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, it was just, um, you know, just, just going through that and then I probably watched my innings a few times again. <laughs> that um, would have taken a while. Yeah, oh, not too long, like half an hour package. or something. Yeah, highlights package. Um, yeah, just like I said, there's, I, I love it and I just love seeing, you know, the bigger picture as well, not just... What about, though, you, you, you spoke about, you know, being grateful to certain people you, and, and your family is one of them. Were they, were they there with you? No, not last night. Uh, my mum's actually only landing this afternoon so um, from South Africa, so um, I'm sure in the next day or so we'll have a bit of a catch-up and, and, and a dinner and, and celebrate. But, um, yeah, for now it was just I was just sort of making sure we stay focused on um, and make sure we win this game. And, just, and getting that first 100, it's, it's, I mean, it's always a special moment. There's always the unknown whether you can actually do it as well, and you've had a couple of close calls. What kind of confidence does that give you now that you've, you've got it out of the way? Yeah, I think, who was it? Um, I think it was Usman Khawaja that said to me the other, I said the first hundred's always the hardest um, because you're kind of going into the unknown. You don't know how it feels. You don't really know how to do it, although you've scored one for, for Queensland or for Glamorgan or for whoever you're playing, but you've never scored one for Australia, so it, it's a different pressure. It's a different feeling. Um, and, and to get it to get it here in front of, like I said, my family and and all my friends, um, you know, was, was awesome. So yeah. A, a less serious question um, <laughs> from a fast ex fast bowler. Uh, so, what are you going to do with your bat? Are you going to are you into your memorabilia? Will you hang that one up? Do you think, or are you going to keep using it? Look, I find it very tough to hang it up because I'm, <laughs> I get real attached to a bat. So. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna have to use that one till it till it breaks, and then and then maybe hang it up and and, and keep it. But yeah, for now I need it. I can't go <laughs> hanging it up. 
Was it a newie, Marnus? Because we saw you on the boundary line actually standing on it, trying to get some flex into the handle, because they can be a bit stiff at the start of an innings, can't they? No, it actually wasn't. It was actually an old bat I got um, at... I got during the Ashes, so I got these two beautiful bats. They looked like beautiful grain and everything, and um, one that one's handle broke, and so I got a new handle put in it. And when you put a new handle in an old bat, it's really stiff. It like because it's kind of not deteriorated the same time, so I had to try and loosen the handle up to just get some flex, so it wasn't so um, like so much vibration going through the bat. It worked. You batted beautifully. It was a joy to watch you made in Test Century. Congratulations. Now, look around because the crowd hasn't diminished, mate. I think it's actually grown. There are probably more kids here now waiting for your autograph. What do you reckon about the star of the show, the man of the match, Marnus Labashain, with us on the ABC? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. That's Marnus Labashain. Great to speak to him. Thanks to Sarah and Penny and the team at Cricket Australia for the great access. Post-match today as well on Grandstand at Stumps have been superb. And to get the insights of... The Australian captain, the leader of the, the pace bowling attack, Pat Cummins, and the man of the match, Marnus Labuschagne. I think we can tick a few boxes there, Bucky. Is that That's it? We're win. done? <laughs> Ramiz was asking for a pay rise. We might have to ask one for one as well after all of that. Um, just some further reflections on the, the match itself and, and what it means for Australia now. We've got the five tests this summer. The first is a commanding victory. And... I think most would have thought from the outset that New Zealand would present a greater challenge and they're going very well against England at the moment. Um, to build momentum early in the series during these matches against Pakistan, do you feel like that can be taken into the Test Series against New Zealand as well? Oh, no doubt. I mean, it, it reinforced the fact that Australia has a good attack, as good attack as anyone going around, but it's, it's the batting that that's has been the issue now, that, no doubt, and... To see what we saw, I mean, there's, it's still at home. There's still a lot of questions to be asked um, and answered away from home, but uh, they did really well. And, and, you know, I guess the fact, as Tim Payne pointed out, that uh, they could get 580 and Steve Smith not get, f I think he got four. Um, I yep. mean, that is just an incredible sign for, for Australia in the future. Yeah, I agree mostly with that, um, Bucky. And uh, I think going into... Uh, the pink ball test with the ball swinging around that's where it's, they're going to be tested the batsmen and that's where they need to stand up I think they can do it um, definitely with the, what we've uh, seen here in this test match and if their techniques are in order and they've got the right mindsets um, and I think having the extra day off as well is probably going to help them yeah and I think that also they, they, I mean, they, they bowled three out of four days in, in um, well t they bowled quite a lot over, the, over this period um, it's probably put to bed a little bit the, the all-rounder um, argument about that, that player who bats number six. So I think with Marnus Labuschagne also bowling his leg spin, I think that just allows them to the luxury of having Travis Head or, or whoever it is to, to, to bat at six and outright batsman. So James Pattinson wasn't eligible for selection in this test match. Um, he will be eligible from here on in. Mitch, what do you think the chances of, of seeing a change in the bowling attack across the course of, of this summer? Could Australia manage the pace bowlers through the entire summer or do you think that there will come a point where someone comes out and maybe Pattinson goes in? Uh, it's a good question. Oh, I don't see a change in this next one, I think. Um, I mean, who do, you, who do you change out of that? Um, yeah, it, it's a tough one. Oh, they'll try and look after the bowlers, I think, if if they feel that they need a bit of a break. But I'm always for, like, if you're playing and you're performing in Test Match Cricket, you're always putting your hand up. Uh, they, they did, ro uh, not rotate, I guess, they did manage quite well over in England with um, the, the bowlers there and a few guys got to go. And, and with, like we said, Mitchell Stark played one match. Um, so it was all based on conditions. Um, so I don't see a change in the next one. I think... A Mitchell Stark swinging the ball around, it's going to suit him so well. Um, it's really hard to change a winning team. Lads, had a lot of fun. Thanks very much, um, Bucky. Unfortunately, from our perspective, this is the only test you're doing for us this summer with, with all your work commitments up here as part of the Cricket Australia program. Thank you very much, and you are a key part of uh, our test match summer every year, and we hope to nail you down as much as your career is progressing outside of the commentary world very nicely. We hope to nail you down for a few more test matches next time. Thank you very much for your contribution, mate. Thanks, mate. Always a privilege to be a part of it. Chris Rogers on Grandstand at Stumps. Mitchell Johnson as well. Thanks to you. He'll continue to be part of the team. You're heading off to Adelaide, Mitch. It 
You I'm, don't want the pink rock in your hand, do you? You don't no, like I, the pink. I, I don't like it in a test match, but it'd be pretty pretty awesome when it's swinging around and flying <laughs> through. That's for sure. But, yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. It'll be a great uh, atmosphere there, I think. Yeah, to Quentin Hull and to Jim Maxwell, the leader of the team, Alison Mitchell, Jason Gillespie and Rummies Raja as well. Big thanks to Zane Bojack and, and Matt Clinch. Behind the scenes, along with Robert Apollonia and all the team back in the studio. That's a wrap from the Gabba, where Australia's strong record has continued. Still not beaten. In over 31 years now, our Grandstand at Stumps podcast will be available soon, including a special extra episode featuring Ed Cowan and Corbin Middlemass with their end-of-test overview, which they will continue to do at the end of each test match this series. Thanks again to all the team. The series now moving to the Adelaide Oval starting on Friday. I hope you can join Grandstand then for continuation of the test series against Pakistan. For now, let's hand back to Karen Tai in the Grandstand studio. Thanks, Al. Across Australia, this is ABC Grandstand. Great to be with you wherever you are this Sunday afternoon. We're with you for the next 45 minutes before we wrap up for our National Grandstand program. We were thinking perhaps we might have been on a bit earlier this afternoon, but Pakistan, a steely performance, uh, beaten comprehensively in the end, but uh, pushing the test match uh, much deeper into day four than a lot of us thought. A lot to tell you about the WBBL, both of those matches. We've got the uh, the wrap-ups and interviews from both of those games, the supercars as well. It's the final race of season 2019 at the Newcastle 500, so taking you to Ben Homer there very shortly and wrapping up other scores as well. We'll recap the situation in that first test between New Zealand and England over at Bay Oval in Mount Monkanui. Um, an amazing performance by New Zealand today, especially through their, their wicket keeper BJ Watling and also uh, spin bowler all-rounder Mitchell Santner. More of that in just a moment. A short break and then we'll take you straight to the supercars and find out what's happening there. ABC Grandstand, your home of WBBL T20, One Day Internationals and... Goes in and bowls to Smith, who works it away, there it is, 200. Remarkable, eccentric, extraordinary batsman who does nothing by the rules and is the best player in the world. Who said Test Cricket is dead? ABC Grandstand, Summer of Cricket. On radio, online and on the ABC Listen app. Across Australia, you're tuned to ABC Grandstand. So all over at the Gabba, Australia winning by an innings and five runs. Let's head straight to Newcastle now, the final race of the supercar season for 2019, the Newcastle 500. Ben Homer, what's happening? Thanks, Karen. Yeah, the, uh, the roller coaster ride is continuing, and currently, as it stands, it's Shane Van Gisbergen who is at the head of the field, but he'll have to go into the pits again, so it's going to change it all up. We've got 25 laps to run, and uh, just as we speak, we've got a crash. It's car 34. It looks as though it's Golding who has gone into the wall. That is James Golding from... Uh, Boost Mobile Racing. He's currently in 19th place. He is in all sorts. The front of that car is an absolute mess. So this is the first big crash we've had at the Newcastle 500 this weekend. And uh, it looks as though he's just reversed that away from the wall. And there's not too much damage. He hit the tyres. So it hasn't had too much of an impact on the front of uh, James Golding's car. So he might go into the pits and get that all sorted. But as I was mentioning, front of the race, Shane Van Gisbergen in first, Jamie Wincup in second. So that's really important because uh, this all comes down to the team's championship. Mm. Those two with triple eight race engineering. And uh, there's a 143 point gap to Fabian Coulthard and Scott McLaughlin's team Penske. Coulthard is in third, McLaughlin in fifth as it stands, and Tim Slade's had a great race. He's in fourth um, currently. So uh, Van Gisbergen's done well, but uh, we'll find out where he's going to sit at the end of this uh, next pit stop. But yeah, plenty to go here, Karen, and about 24 laps, and the course has been declared wet. There's been a little bit of drizzle, not too much rain, but it is making things a little interesting for the drivers here in Newcastle. And Ben, for people that may not be right across it, can you put it in a nutshell leading into this race, Scott McLaughlin, and he's been featured on Grandstand uh, through the summer with us, and, and Tim Hodges, he's taken the series title for a second consecutive year, but there's been a bit of a social media spat, hasn't there, between himself and also fellow driver Scott Pye? 
Yeah, so uh, Scott Pye and also Nick Perkett have had some interesting things to say about uh, Scott McLaughlin. They basically said uh, that well, they, they compared him to Lance Armstrong, effectively. And this all comes back to what happened at Bathurst a few weeks ago, uh, last month actually, where uh, McLaughlin was penalised for, uh, believe it was not releasing the fuel when the car was still uh, when when the car was up in the air. You've got to uh, release the fuel before it hits the deck, and they didn't, and they were penalised for that. But the the victory wasn't taken off Scott McLaughlin, and that's why they said it was a tainted win. And uh, Sean Se- Sean Seymour, the um, the supercar CEO, came out during the weekend and said that uh, it needed to stop. It was bullying and it was unfair on Scott McLaughlin. And uh, Cameron Waters actually defended Scott McLaughlin. So it's interesting. There's, uh, there's different drivers taking different points of view, and, um, and the CEO's not happy about it. So that's what it all um, stems from, Karen, and, and Scott McLaughlin, obviously. What a season he's had. Um, this afternoon in Newcastle, not quite the drama. Uh, he's probably happy about that. Not quite the drama that we've had the last couple of years. He, um, he was beaten by Wing Cup in 2017. In the last couple of laps, he dropped out of the, uh, the spot he needed to secure the title. Wing Cup went on to win it. And then last year, he was able to secure the title here. And this afternoon, he's able to enjoy the, uh, the scenic course here in Newcastle. Good on you, Ben. We'll leave it there. We'll come back for more updates and we'll get the result within the time we have left with you the next 40 or so minutes here on National Grandstand this Sunday. Ben Homer at the Newcastle 500. In other cricket news, the Women's Big Bash League, it's been fantastic that we can be your radio home and we're getting closer to finals action. So two really important games in terms of those sides in the top four at the moment. Wins to the Adelaide Strikers over Sydney Thunder. This match was played at a festival weekend at Bell Reeve Oval in Hobart, won in a super over by the Adelaide Strikers. And then at Lilac Hill in Perth, it was a win comprehensively by the Perth Scorchers over the Sydney Sixers. Two matches in two days between these teams, a win on both days to the Perth Scorchers. Today it was by eight wickets with four balls remaining. We'll start in Perth, uh, the closing moments here, and then a wrap of the game with Ben Cameron. Sivera awaits Ailey again, walks across her stumps, a straight delivery, flits it away, backward of square, it'll find the rope, and the Scorchers will win. Back-to-back wins over the Sixers on the festival weekend at Lilac Hill. And they get it done by eight wickets with four balls to spare. On the back of Meg Lanning and Nat Siver. And the Scorchers are catching fire at the right time in the WBBL. After losing yesterday's game in the doubleheader of the festival weekend at Lilac Hill, the Sydney Sixers start to game two could not have been any worse when Alyssa Healy was out for a golden duck off the first ball of the day, caught and bowled by Nat Siver. But there was a revival from the Sydney Sixers. Ash Gardner made 54 from 42 balls, including eight fours and two sixes. Erin Burns, the opener, was the anchor. She made 60 not out from 45 with seven fours and one six. But in the end, the Perth Scorchers in behind the Australian captain in Meg Lanning were too good. She made 81 from 50 balls faced, nine fours and two sixes. Nat Siver made 39 not out from 22, along with seven fours to guide the Scorchers home in the end. And Amy Jones, another good contribution at the top, 41 from 42. The Scorchers winning in the end, chasing down the total with uh, eight wickets in hand and four balls to spare as they move clear into third on the WBBL standings. Nikki Shaw, the former English international, watched it all with us here on Grandstand WBBL. Nikki, where was it won and lost? I think the first place it was um, won for the Scorchers was obviously the first ball of the game. Um, Nat Siva absolutely did Alyssa Healy with one. Uh, she, she, she caught and bowled it. And then after that, I thought that the girls batted well. I thought the Sixers girls got a really good target together however I think this was more of a 180 pitch and I think Ash Gardner and um, Aaron Burns probably should have pushed that partnership on a little bit more however it's the unstoppable Meg Lanning like she batted so well with Amy Jones and then again Nat Siver Nat looked like she just continued on from where she was yesterday and the, the girls had no answers so the, the Sixers girls had nothing. 
They certainly did not, and uh, Meg Lang, she continues that incredible record. When she makes runs at the top, the Scorchers win. When she misses out, they generally lose, but that is T20 mm. cricket a bit. When Absolutely. The, the wickets fall at the top and the top order misses out, you can tend to go down. Uh, some good news for the Sydney Sixers. They're without their captain in Elise Perry, but in the aftermath of the match, she is doing some run-throughs, just slightly cradling that right arm with the AC joint injury. But in the end... From Lilac Hill, the second game of the festival weekend. It was the Perth Scorchers winning by eight wickets with four balls to spare. They'll be back here next weekend as they try and cement their place in the four and push towards the top of the WBBL standings. Thank you, Ben and Nikki Shaw. And yes, while the Test match in Adelaide will also be on next weekend, Australia v Pakistan, our WBBL games, you can follow those ball by ball if you want as well via the ABC Listen app. So just look for our specialised pop-up station, which is WBBL, our ABC Grandstand pop-up station is where you'll be able to hear the test cricket. So the options there for you online as well, abc.net.au slash grandstand. Both Nikki and Ben talking there about the contribution this season of opener Amy Jones. She made 41 alongside Meg Lanning's 81. Let's hear from Amy speaking here with Clint Wilden. We've got Amy Jones with us. We'd lovely to have a chance to have a chat with her. Congratulations on today. Thanks. Yeah, obviously a good run, Chase. Um... Yeah, Meg, Meg looked brilliant today and obviously Nat finishing off at the end was yeah, good to see. We were fascinated with the change and we understand why, but not being behind the stumps. How did you find it fielding in the outfield today? Yeah, it was quite... It's, it's funny how quickly I can feel very foreign as a, as a fielder. Obviously did a lot in the summer with Sarah keeping um, for England. Um, but yeah, no, it, I definitely felt a little bit out of place. But, um, it... Wrapping up the day in cricket, this is ABC Grandstand at Stumps. Australia has started the two test series against Pakistan with a convincing win here at the Gabba and the kids down on the ground are pretty excited about it down near us. They're calling out to the players, Paddy Cummins and others to come and uh, sign autographs and why wouldn't you after Australia's commanding win and innings and five runs, Pakistan really did fight hard on the fourth day to try and at least make Australia bat a second time but fell the five runs short dismissed for 335 in their second innings. Alistair Nicholson, Chris Rogers and Mitchell Johnson to dissect the first test with you on Grandstand at Stumps. We'll bring you the presentations. We'll also have Tim Payne, the Australian captain, very shortly for you. Mitch, Bucky, how did you see the day? And then more broadly, how did you see the test match? Well, the day went a little longer than I probably expected. Um, I was probably getting a little too far ahead of myself. I just thought... Australia through this uh, this test match have performed quite well. I know they can get better in a lot of places, and they'll look to do that. They started the test match; uh, they'll put in to field. Uh, so they did really well there. They was it 240, I think it was. They got Pakistan out four, and um, then they just piled on the runs. Oh, I just think, yeah, it was a, it was a great batting performance overall, and they'll be pretty happy with that. And and look, they can still get better with the bowling. They were within five runs. Uh, it was a flat pitch uh, but um, I mean that'll give some confidence to Pakistan I think with uh, some of that middle order batting. Yeah it was just a pretty ruthless display from Australia in the end. I mean they're always going to be favourites uh, at home particularly at, at Brisbane um, but they, they went about it the right way. They lost the toss, they had to bowl well, they were challenged at lunchtime on day one um, but they came back well and then and then I think the most pleasing thing for Justin Langer will be the batting. It just I think there's been musical chairs going on with that batting lineup for a while, and, and he just wants a bit of stability. Um, and people at the top to, to take the pressure off Steve Smith, and that's what they got. And they, I think they've unearthed a star, an absolute star in the making in Manus Labuschagne, uh, who's going to be there for a long time to come. So some really good signs. It's the runs he brings, it's the way he goes about it, Bucky, but it's also the energy around the group. He seems to be a really positive person within that, that playing group at the moment. I just think the Australian public's going to love him too because it's, there's a whole lot of innocence there as well. I think when we, we interviewed him after the game, it, one of the things that stood out was just how grateful he was to the people who'd, who'd helped him along the, along the way. So um, that's just a, such a good quality. Speaking of good quality, Pat Cummins has come for a chat. Welcome to Grandstand at Stumps, Pat. Thanks for having me. Well, what do you make of uh, the first day or first days at the office in Test Match Cricket on Australian soil for the summer? Brilliant. 
um, you know, extra day off tomorrow. Um, I thought, you know, a really complete game. Um, you know, day one, thought we did a really good job to get them out for 240 on what I thought was a pretty good wicket. And then, you know, the batters went to work. They were absolutely outstanding, um, not only scoring big runs, but gave us bowlers a couple of days um, off our feet, which, which is always nice going in the last innings. Obviously, there was a lot of emphasis on the batting coming into the Test Series, um, some positions to be locked away. Did we get some answers in this Test match? Do you reckon about who might be part of that batting lineup into the long term? Oh, you'd hope so. Um, you know, everyone's scoring big runs, so the top top few um, scoring big runs. And I think when you win a win a game like that by an innings, it's pretty hard to change the lineup. So, um, really, really happy with how everyone's going. It's a great feeling around the group at the moment. Well, what do you what do you guys think of when you see Mardis Labashan and, and the way he's improved over the last period? What, what's the chat uh, amongst the team about where you think he can get to? Uh, hasn't been too much chat about that, but I, I can't believe when you see the side-on vision of him last year to this year, how in 12 months he's you know, basically changed his technique and he just looks so settled. And I think he's only 25, but he looks like a guy that's in co- total control of his game, has all the shots, really you know, uses his feet well to spin and, and pace as well. So it's really exciting. He's um, you know here on his home ground, showed what he, what he can do. I think mean, he's played 10 games, but um, yeah, he already looks like a, you know really comfortable at this level. Uh, Paddy, how do you feel the pitch played throughout this Test match? Uh, was it a typical Brisbane Wacker wicket? Uh, Gabba wicket, sorry. Gabba wicket. Uh, I've only played a couple of games here. Um, it felt, you know, day one looking at it, it, was, it had a tinge of green and, and a little bit of grass, but it was probably less sideways movement than I thought. Um, the ball actually... I don't know what it normally does, but it felt like it got quite soft after you know, 25, 30 overs, and then from that it was pretty hard to, to get too much life out of the wicket. But, um, yeah, it was, you know, the odd one bounced, um, but, yeah, not too much sideways movement. You weren't rotated in the Ashes, and you've been through a lot of cricket over the last period. Is you feeling good? You, you think you're going to play all the Test matches for the, for the summer? Yeah, I hope so. The, the good thing after the Ashes, I, I had about four weeks you know, completely off bowling, um, which is as big a break as I've ever had um, without being injured. Um, so it was really nice, and the last few weeks has, has been a pretty good build-up. I played some T20s and, and a Shield game. So since the Ashes, um, you know, the prep's been basically ideal, and I felt as fresh as I felt for a long time coming to this Test match, so hopefully it continues. So was there anything that you worked on through that period then? Because that's a pretty good opportunity to, to work on some skills. Yeah, think about some skills. Yeah, think about some skills. I think the good thing about the T20s, we, we had six games in a couple of weeks, and to be honest, it was probably the first block that I could just concentrate on on white ball for a few for a few weeks. Um, you know, especially coming off so much red ball cricket in England, I was pretty happy with that where that was at. So, yeah, concentrate on on T20s for a couple of weeks coming back, and then um, you know, I felt like the, the transfer back to here was pretty quick. Barbara's arm broke through a test match century in Australia, his second test match century. How did you find him to, to bowl to today? Yeah, I thought he played nicely. Um, you know, obviously, any width out there, he pounced on and, and hit the ball really cleanly. Um, yeah, he, he looks like a, you know, a guy who's again, knows his game quite well. Um, hopefully, it's uh, next week, pink ball. There's a, a little bit of sideways movement, um, and it might be slightly different, but I thought he batted beautifully, so did Rizwan. Just on the pink ball and, and the set of challenges, I guess, and, and tactics that that brings to Test Match Cricket, heading to Adelaide for that test starting on Friday. How do you, do you approach a, a pink ball match? I think it's largely the same. I guess the, the strategy sometimes around the night sessions changes. Um, you know, we've seen in the five or so years that it's been around, the ball just seems to zip around and be more lively at night. So trying to use those key, key moments... Um, but other than that, it's, yeah, for most of the time, it's, it's pretty good hard cricket. Enjoy it. Congratulations on the win. Thanks very much. Ta. Pat Cummins with us on Grandstand at Stumps here at the Gabba as he shakes hands with Mitchell Johnson and, and Chris Rogers. Uh, the feature of, of Pat Cummins seems to have been of late. It's not necessarily that he's taking the big fifers all the time. He's just consistently taking two, three, four, that kind of thing. He did it through the Ashes series as well where he didn't take a fifer but was the leading wicket taker. And again, contributing with uh, wickets in this match, three for 60 in the first innings and and two for 69 in the second. Has he just become that really reliable fast bowler that Australia's always wanted him to be now? Yeah, I think he's a captain's dream. He, he's, when he gets the ball, you, you give him the ball, he knows what he needs to do. Um, so 
you, you, you almost let him set his fields, bowl to his plans, um, and he goes about and he, get, he gets the job done, and I, I think that that's just so important. And the, the thing is now you have, you have three guys three guys in that, um, in that side who are all like that in, in Hazelwood, um, Cummins and Lyon, so you have the luxury of being able to, to, to play a Stark even if he's not completely on because you're guaranteed good performances from the other three. So Hazelwood picks up four for 63 in the second inning, Stark three for 72 uh, to go with a good performance in the first innings when he picked up four for 52, so he gets seven wickets for the match, and he was the one, Mitchell Johnson, who had to really bide his time during the Ashes, and he's He's got significant reward here at the Gabba. Yeah, I mean, we've spoken about him uh, a fair bit throughout this test with his action just slightly changing and something that he's been very keen on. So it's, uh, it's been exciting to watch. And um, to get wickets, that's his job. And um, we've just got Tim Payne just join us. Yeah, he looks very satisfied indeed, the Australian captain. Thanks for your time, Tim. Congratulations. Thanks, mate. Uh, would have liked to have been here a little earlier, but um, I thought they batted really well. Did you think, oh, no, we're not going to have to pull the pads on again, are we? Oh, I didn't mind. I'm hiding <laughs> down at seven, so it didn't bother me one bit. But I'll tell you what, there was two very happy men when we took that last catch. Joe Burns and David Warner celebrated harder than most of us. Obviously, you, you line up the first test of the home summer and there's a real emphasis on performing well in it. Did you achieve everything that you hoped to in this match? Uh, yeah, I think if you win an inning, win a test match by over an innings, you've done a lot right. So, um, yeah, I was really proud of the way we started the summer. There's certainly some things we could tidy up on. Um, I thought the way we finished our batting um, were a bit better than that. I think from sort of seven down, we pride ourselves in scoring a few more runs. We've got some talented batters in our bowling group. Um, and then today, um, I thought we bowled well for most of the time. But, uh, again, I would like to have finished a little bit earlier. But you've got to give Pakistan some credit as well. I thought um, Rizwan and, and Baba batted really well. Even, even though you said that you would have rather have been here a little earlier talking to us, um, it's probably not a bad thing for the bowlers to have a bit of a run like that on a pitch like that. Yeah. Um, and obviously now there's a, an extra day off as well, so going into that next test. So well, how did you see that? Like, they, they were working hard today. Yeah, I thought, again, I thought they bowled really well. I think we're um, just probably hold those four to a really high standard. So when they don't clean teams up, we think what's going on. And um, But that's... I suppose one of the things that happens when you've got a world-class attack. Um, yeah, I think, again, they took 20 wickets. Um, they were awesome in the first innings. They were pretty good for most of the second innings. Uh, lost away a little bit with our lengths towards the end, but when the tail's slogging like that as well, it can be quite hard to, to hold your length. So, uh, yeah, again, 20 wickets. Uh, they've been awesome. If we continue to score that many runs, we're going to win a lot of tests with those four bowlers. Um, it, it was a ruthless performance. Um, you must be exceptionally pleased. But if you look at it as a whole, what's probably the most pleasing aspect out of the last four days? Um, I think I think our batting, to be honest. Um, there's been a lot of talk about it and a lot of pressure on our batting group to, to score more runs um, and not rely as, as heavily on Steve. So if we're, if we're honest, Smithy missing out and still getting 580 is a real positive for our group. Um, it's something we, we've been building towards. England was difficult. It was the first time a lot of our players have been there. But I think as, you, as you've seen the last four or five days, a lot of guys have come out of that to are better players. Um, and I think we're, we're getting to the stage where we're going to be more consistently scoring big first innings runs. Um, and if we do that, as I said, with the four bowls we've got, we're going to be really hard to beat. Uh, and would you expect now Joe Burns and Davey Warner to see out the test summer? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think they'll be scoring enough runs to... Um, both really good players. Uh, I said a few times I thought the way they, they set the tone for our batters with their running between the wickets and their energy. Um, I thought they batted superbly and um, you know they've actually already been into Marnus today about making his, his innings a hell of a lot easier for him but that's what openers do but they wear the shine off it. Hopefully they can cash in like those two do and it makes it much easier for the rest of us. How did you find the decision with um, Josh Hazelwood hitting, I can't remember who it was on the pad but it looked like Live, it looked pretty out. Yeah. How, what did you guys discuss in the huddle before that? Yeah. So again, our, our, our thing is at the moment we have a bit of a chat and decide why it wasn't given out. Um, we thought the only reason he might have given it out is if it was going over, but um, we were all pretty happy with the height. But um, as you know, at the Gabber, it can be hard at times to get LBWs, and um, I wouldn't say it was a wrong review. We got to keep our review, yep. so we've kept our record intact for the summer. <laughs> so you go to Adelaide and the pink ball. What's What's your challenge? What's your worry with Pakistan heading into that match? Um, look, I think the pink ball, firstly, I think you've got to adapt to it really quickly. They've obviously had a game with it already this summer. Um, so we're going to have to, luckily now we have a day early, so we might be able to get there and have a bit of a look at it. But 
Um, look, I think they've got some really skillful players. I think their quicks have got some real airspeed. Um, they've got a world-class spinner. Uh, they look like they found a really good opening batter in, in Masood. Uh, and their middle order's dangerous. So, um, as we saw today, if we're not quite on against this Pakistan team, they're going to they're gonna give us a really good run for our money. So we've got to maintain our, our discipline and keep executing as a bowling group and, um, and keep cashing in when we get a chance as, as, as a batting group. So it's a pretty simple game. Tim, congrats. Good to chat. Thanks for your time. No worries. Thanks, mate. Australian captain Tim Payne with us on grandstand at Stumps. And uh, Barbara Zahm is also been made available to us. Ramiz Raj is going to be having a chat with him in just a moment on Grandstand. Um, Ramiz, thanks to be, thanks to you for being with us and uh, Babar Azam as well. Welcome to you on Grandstand. Thank you. Thank you so much. Congratulations on your, your innings. I'll let Ramiz take you away through it. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Babar, Mushkil work may a century up key or up in a stamp Karnithi up new authority one day, ke, uh, one day, about test cricket method. Kitney up Hushan. हाँ काफी खुश हूँ क्योंकि अर्ली ओन हमारी जो विकटें गिर गई थी उसके बाद हमें पार्टनरशिप की जरूरत थी तो मेरा यही था कि जब मैं और शान भाई खेल रहे थे अर्ली ओन तो हमने ही कहा था कि पार्टनरशिप जितनी लगाएंगे उतने अच्छा है तो अगले दिन आके हम उसको कंटिन्यू करेंगे तो बस वही हुआ था जो अगले दिन आए तो थोड़ी छोटी पार्टनरशिप हुई लेकिन उसके बाद जब रिजवान आया तो हमारा यही प्लान था कि यार गलत शॉट नहीं मारनी अगर अच्छा बॉल हो जाए तो वो फेयर इनफ लेकिन हमने वो लूज शॉट नहीं मारनी तो बस यही प्लान था कि कितना जितनी हम पार्टनरशिप करेंगे उतना हमारे लिए बेहतर होगा सो आई आस्क हिम द क्वेश्चन हाउ शफ्ट ही इज अबाउट स्कोरिंग दिस हंड्रेड एंड ऑब्वियसली इज एक्सट्रीमली डिलाइटेड द अदर थिंग इज दैट ही वॉन्टेड टू गेट द पार्टनरशिप रोलिंग फॉर पाकिस्तान द इंटायर डे सो फर्स्ट वन वॉज विद शान एंड देन लेटर वन यूज बैटिंग विद रिजवान इट वॉज आस्किंग हिम टू जस्ट कंट्रोल हिज नेचुरल इंस्टिंग टू प्ले विच वॉज टू हिट द बॉल एंड जस्ट टेक द द एफर्ट डीप इन टू इन डे फोर did he feel that even though pakistan was in a very difficult position from early on in this match that they were able to take something out of out of the match in the end uh mushkil to tha pakistan ke liye magar is match se kya aap leke ja rahe hain adelaide uh ji bilkul ramesh bhai jo galtiyan ki hain wo aage jo adelaide mein test match hai wo wo na kare lekin jo achhi kaisi galtiyan galtiyan hum एज बैटिंग जो अर्ली ऑन जो हमारी विकटें गिरी हैं वो ये है कि अर्ली ऑन जब नहीं गिरेगी तो पार्टनरशिप जितनी लगेगी उतना बेहतर होगा नीचे वाले बैट्समैन को भी कॉन्फिडेंस आएगा कि ऊपर अच्छा खेल रहे हैं तो वो जब आ, आप थोड़ा सा खेलते हैं आफ्टर टेन टू फिफ्टीन ओवर तो थोड़ा सा गेम थोड़ा सा आसान हो जाता है तो वो आप फिर आप उस हिसाब से आप अपना गेम प्लान करते हैं तो मेरे ख्याल से ये जो पार्टनरशिप है जितनी होगी उतनी अच्छी होगी सो स्पेंडिंग टाइम एट द क्रीज वॉज वैल्यूबल एंड मेक श्योर देट यू नो यू डोंट कमिट द सेम मिस्टेक्स लर्न फॉर योर मिस्टेक्स and so they'll carry that theme forward into the Adelaide test. And let's ask him the big one Ramesh what we all want to know for Adelaide is surely Muhammad Abbas plays and, and what about mm-hmm. Imam Al-Haq as well. Yeah okay. Um aap kaptan to nahi hai na chief selector hai magar main phir bhi puch raha hu ki pura Australia puchna chahta hai Muhammad Abbas kahan hai aur kya Imam Al-Haq ki wapsi ho sakti hai. देखेंगे अभी जब एक दो सेशन है हमारे एक प्रैक्टिस प्रैक्टिस होगी उसमें देखेंगे कि जो टीम का क्या ख्याल है Muhammad Abbas ko miss kiya ya nahi? जाहिर सी बात है इन कंडीशन में हम वाकई उसको मिस किया था लेकिन जो टीम टीम का डिसीजन था वो हमें करना सामने रख के खेलना था कि वह आवाज़ खेल रहा है कि इमरान खान खेल रहा है तो यही था कि जो खेल रही है उस पर बैक खेल so uh, clearly a very guarded answer because he's neither the chief selector nor the chief coach is not a miss ball hack but he's aspiring to become one i think uh, yeah i mean they clearly miss mohammad abbas because they needed somebody to bowl in that corridor of uncertainty as it's called uh, and there's no response regarding imam ul haq from him so uh, he says he'll look at the practice session who bats first and probably then he'll give us a clue whether imam is batting or not whether he gets a go in the nets or not baba we loved your performance congratulations thank you thank you so much thank you baba is on with us on grandstand at stumps and thank you very much to ramiz raja for his translations a few reflections on the test match us dollars by the way <laughs> we don't pay in us we all right, pay australian we pay in yeah, lira lira all right okay so 250 million lira then <laughs> Talk us through from your perspective ramiz how did you see this pakistani performance in the first yeah, i test? think uh, it, it was a good hard cricket that they played today obviously there was so much at stake their reputation and it was an excellent uh, time for them to become heroes also you know your match winning innings are uh, memorable for you and for the fans but match saving innings are as much important so i'm sure you know the australian fans had a look at babar azam and what talent he possesses and so it's a, it's a great century for him and hopefully lots more from him 
Uh, and also, I think, uh, Rizwan, I think Pakistan have found a good one. He's, he's gritty, uh, you know, he, he's quick on his feet. He played spin well. And I, I thought what was best about Rizwan was his temperament. Because playing only your second test match with your back against the wall, uh, you had to deliver and it del- delivered beautifully. Uh, and just in terms of selection from your perspective then with, a, I guess, the, the capacity to pass judgment maybe more freely than Baba Azam, yeah. would you see those two changes that, that I was asking about occurring for Adelaide? Yeah, you've got to uh, play Mohamed Abbas, you know. Um, even if he's half-firing, he's got experience and he's bowled superbly um, against the Australians. And the other thing that I think should happen is Pakistan need to play three openers because if the real match is how to negotiate fast bowling and that's going to be the key in pink test uh, match also then you've got to have them at one two and three because Harris Sohail hasn't looked uh, the quality that you'd want at number three on these bouncy tracks I agree with you Remis but if you looked at the the warm-up games and Imam Al-Haq played a Mm. a, a pretty good innings even, even though it was against a a younger opposition, but he showed those qualities. Why do you reckon that they actually went for Harris Sahal in the end over Imam? Well, you see, they, they feel that Harris has got a lot of potential and talent, uh, and his record is not bad. I mean, he averages in the 40s in Test cricket. Uh, last time he played for Pakistan in a Test match against Australia, it was, I think, he, he got 100. Uh, so they wanted to carry him through and maybe establish him as a number three batsman, but clearly, I mean, he's looking for the short ball. The technique was all over the place. That's why he was uh, managing to feather those balls outside the option because he was looking for that bouncer length all the time. So it's clearly a misfit. I would have another opener slotted at number three. Ramiz, it's been awesome working with Fantastic you across the course boy, of the last so. few days and you'll be with us again in Adelaide. We look forward to having you again there. Right. Brilliant to be here. Thanks a lot. Ramiz Raja with us, former Pakistan Test batsman on grandstand at Stumps. Um, Australia has won this match convincingly, the first test dismissing Pakistan in its second innings for 335, the victory by a margin of an innings and five runs in the end. Man of the match, unsurprisingly, Manus Labashain. We go to hear from him in just a moment. Before we get to that, we will reflect on one of the bright parts of Pakistan's day, and it was certainly the knock of Babar Azam. Up to the wicket now to Barbara outside the off stump, and he's cutting away past line at backward point. That'll be four. Racing away towards the fence. Two slips, Gully Cummins into the attack. Bowling to Barbar on 92. Short and he pulls through mid-wicket. Great shot, four. A slip, the catching man outside the off stump. Stroke through, cover. That might be his hundred. It's racing out to the boundary. Baba Azam reaches triple figures at the Gabba. And he pumps his fist in the middle of the pitch. What a delight to see one of the great talents of world cricket transfer the white ball form to the traditional form of the game. He's 100 not out in a very, very tough scenario for his country. And he gets the plaudits from the fans in Brisbane, drops to his knees, kisses the turf, praises those around him. What a knock. Line bowls, there's the edge, there's the wicket. Payne a sharp catch and Bubba Azam, a fine innings, comes to a close. Lyon gets that all-important breakthrough and ends the partnership of defiance from Baba Azam and Mohammed Rizwan. Baba out for 104. A superb innings, delivering on his immense talent and putting it on show here at the Gabba. It's six for 226. So Baba Azam made 104 for Pakistan today, a real bright spark for them and Mohammad Rizwan 95 as well. Their partnership actually did threaten to take this game a little further than many of us had expected. So there is perhaps a more spine to this Pakistan batting lineup than we first thought based on the first innings. Yeah, well they they actually dismantled Australia, eh? So they came in with some pretty good prep and I I think that they were quietly hopeful that they could um, do something that unexpected and, and, and cause a boil over but they came up against a, an Australian, particularly the attack, that's just on top of its game, and, and they got found out. I think a couple of the players who 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 can play well just found it a little bit hard with the with the extra quality. So um, yeah, there's there's a lot to like. They've got some very good players. I still can't understand some of their selections. I think they they didn't actually give themselves the best chance, but they'll go to Adelaide. I think that they will 
get the right side. Um, how they fare there, I, I think they'll need to win the toss and then somehow put Australia in under lights at some stage. I, I feel that they maybe were just a little bit too tentative at the start and sort of looking up at the scoreboard, um, 240 and 86th or 87th over and they got 335 within 85 um, uh, in the second innings. But I just feel like maybe they thought, oh, the Gabba, it's going to do a bit early, so let's just be really watchful. Maybe they could have just been a little bit more aggressive uh, with their batting. I don't know. I, I, just sort of thinking about it now more than anything. But, um, yeah, I, I'm the same. I think they were quite confident coming in after what they did in uh, Perth in the um, against the young guys there. But I, I, they're in the game with this pink ball. I think they're massively in the game. And if they could really, if they win the toss, they could go through Australia if they um, they've definitely got the talent they might you might see the ball swing a lot more as well and do a little bit more early on there so yeah we'll wait and see yeah I I mean I think it's a little bit hard to expect them to come out and play shots but I, I know what you're getting at 80 you, to get 240 off 85 overs or whatever it is you're actually having to do so much hard work it's going to probably count against you at some stage but you know what they were none for 60 at lunch I think on day one or whatever They'd probably take that. But then from there... It was Is that, that good enough, though? The, the pitch wasn't moving. There wasn't really any swing oh. either. Yeah, and it probably... They bowled well like at times, Australia, but we even said that they didn't bowl their best. Yeah, it, it probably cost them in the end because they had a couple of guys who... I mean, they got out right after each other and, you know, it just looked like that they'd almost hit the wall a little bit with how hard they were, they were, they were trying. So you need to try and get that balance, yep. but... You know what, they fought hard. There were, there, were some, there were some times that they could have easily collapsed and given in, but they, they held, held on. There's, there's got to be a bit more, no doubt, particularly with when they're in the field um, in Adelaide, but there's some, some good qualities, and I do think Baba Azam will be an exceptional player for years to come. So Pakistan dismissed for 240 in the first innings after winning the toss and electing it to bat first. Australia then compiled 580. And then in reply to that, Pakistan all out for 335 in 84.2 overs. So they did collapse in the end, as predicted by Jason Gillespie when the second new ball was taken. So Australia's 580 multiple contributions of great significance. Joe Burns, 97. David Warner, 154. But the star of the show was the man of the match, Manus Labuschagne, who made 185. His maiden test century was a beauty. Let's relive it. You, you do sort of think about how you want to celebrate 100, you know, when you're a kid, how you're going to do it. And then when I nicked it, I look back. I don't know what happened. Something took over because that's not what I was planning to do. Labashain on 97. Shaheen in. He's driving a thick outside edge through the gap. Wide of third slip for four down to the third man boundary. Labashain on his home ground. It's his maiden test ton and the gap arises. Andre Lubbersky with me, who's just seen his son, Manus Lubbershane, score a ton. Oh, it's an amazing experience. It's just an awesome outcome. Lubbershane on 149, strokes the ball to point, takes the single. 150 for Manus at the Gabba. What a day for this young man on his home soil. First test ton. First test 150. And he points his blade to all points of the Gabba. He's the sort of guy that actually, he organises backyard cricket, he has garage cricket, so if he's got a day off cricket, he gets his mates around. And I say, mates, it could be 15 or 20 of them playing garage cricket. I'm not sure many test players still do that. Shaheen comes again outside the off stump in the air and caught a gully. And Labashane falls for 185. He's leaning on his bat handle. He does not want to go. Baba Azam, a shake of the hand. In fact, this is really lovely. All the Pakistan players coming forward to shake the hand of Manus Labashain before he departs the field. What a nice touch that is. The spirit of sport is alive and well at the Gabba. And this will be the reception for Manus Labashain. The Gabba rises to him. Baba took the catch. But Manus Labashain, he's turned a maiden test century into a whopping 185 on his home ground. And the crowd are bringing him off. Beautifully described by Alison Mitchell. As far as innings are concerned, it was certainly a whopper. A maiden test century for Manus Labashain, 185. And you do wonder what he's going to do from here. When you factor in, and we spoke about this during the course of the match, Chris Rogers and Mitchell Johnson, here's a guy who gets his opportunity under 
strange circumstances, unconventional circumstances during the Ashes series. He absolutely seizes the moment when given that opportunity and he uses that to build the platform and now cements, consolidates his spot at number three in the Australian test side. I mean, people talk about getting opportunities in strange ways sometimes. Manus has certainly seized his, Chris. Yeah, he has. I mean, he had... They were tough conditions over in England, and he did well there. I think he averaged 50, and then to come back and put his stamp on, on it straight away with that. It, for me, too, I was lucky enough to, to see them train um, leading into the test, and you could just tell there's something different about him. He just has this incredible hunger that he wants to do well, he wants to get better, um, and that doesn't always transfer into good performances, but you can just see the way he's going about it, that he's giving himself every chance. Yeah, he's the right character, isn't he? Um, it's not just the performance on the field, it's what uh, he does off the field and away from the game. Um, and that's what Justin Langer wants in this uh, Australian team, this lineup. So, uh, as, as Tim Payne said, I think he was pretty impressed with the way the guys batted um, throughout this, this uh, test match. Yeah, the other thing too, he, he's just such a, a friendly, innocent guy at the moment, yeah. you know, like he... he he just brings this freshness, I think, that um, the Australian public can re- really enjoy and really get behind because he, you can see he's playing, he just, he just loves it, you know. He, he, he talks about being nervous, about how much enjoyment that... that, that yeah, he's, pretty, what, he's quite open, isn't he, which is good. Yeah, and, and what, you know, the normal person would be like if you were in that situation. We're getting a bit all TV here. It's the walk and talk that we're doing <laughs> on radio. We're wandering over to... Manus Labuschagne because he's signing autographs over by the fence here at the Gabba. We're going to go and see if we can have a chat to him. He might be able to sign a few autographs while he's doing it as well. He's, he's gonna... a good multitasker. And I reckon the kids will be happy to be on a bit of ABC radio as well. There are hats hanging over the fence and miniature cricket bats left, right and centre for the man of the match, Manus Labuschagne. What do you reckon of Manus, boys? Pretty happy with his output? He batted beautifully, didn't he? 185. He's going to join us on Grandstand at Stumps very shortly, so we look forward to having a chat with Manus, the man of the moment. In fact, we'll try and sneak in while he's signing a few autographs here. If you can multitask for us no, a bit, Manus. Multitask. He can't do it. No, can't do it. Well done, mate. We will let you get back to signing autographs very shortly, but reflect on the last four days. How's it been for you? Look, it was a great game. Um, like, as, as the game as a whole, I think our bowlers were fantastic. Um, you know, after there being none for on day one, um, to knocking him over for 240 and then, um, you know, for, for Joe and, and Dave to, to start like that, I mean, that's the dream um, start, you know, opening pair just brought back together and, um, you know, they really they really took the, the sting out of their attack and, and yeah, it, was, it was amazing um, to see both of them get, get big scores. Tim Payne was saying that they were trying to suggest that they were the reason for your big knock. Do you concur or do you disagree that they, they took the shine off it, they did the hard work? Well, look. As far as as far as that, that's the longest I've had to wait to bat for 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 a very long time. Um, you know what was I in the 64th over or 60th over, something like that. So that's you can't ask more. Though. That's amazing job from them, and and they both batted unbelievably. So um, credit to them. Uh, we saw you yesterday, um, Marnus, and obviously you're on top of the world. What did you do last night to to reflect, and and who did you get to celebrate it with? Uh, I actually just went home. I had a beer here and then uh, just in the ice bath and then uh, went home and just had some some pasta for dinner and then just chilled out and uh, went through all my messages, thanking everyone um, for, for all their, you know, obviously, um, what do I call it? Congratulate. Congratulations. Congratulations. How many do you reckon you got? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Too many. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, it was just, um, you know, just, just going through that. And then I probably watched my innings a few times again. <laughs> that um, would have taken a while. Yeah, oh, not too long, like highlights half an hour package. or something. Yeah, highlights package. Um, yeah, just like I said, there's, I, I love it. And I just love seeing, you know, the bigger picture as well, not just... What about, though, you, you, you spoke about, you know, being grateful to certain people you, and, and your family is one of them. Were they, were they there with you? No, not last night. Uh, my mum's actually only landing this afternoon so um, from South Africa, so um, I'm sure in the next day or so we'll have a bit of a catch-up and, and, and a dinner and, and celebrate. But, um, yeah, for now it was just I was just sort of making sure we stay focused on um, and make sure we win this game. And, just, and getting that first 100, it's, it's, I mean, it's always a special moment. There's always the unknown whether you can actually do it as well, and you've had a couple of close calls. What kind of confidence does that give you now that you've, you've got it out of the way? Yeah, I think, who was it? Um, 
I think it was Usman Khawaja that said to me the other, I said the first hundred's always the hardest um, because you're kind of going into the unknown. You don't know how it feels. You don't really know how to do it, although you've scored one for, for Queensland or for Glamorgan or for whoever you're playing, but you've never scored one for Australia, so it, it's a different pressure, it's a different feeling. Um, and, and to get it to get it here in front of, like I said, my family and and all my friends, um, you know, was, was awesome. So yeah. A, a less serious question um, <laughs> from a fast ex fast bowler. Uh, so, what are you going to do with your bat? Are you going to are you into your memorabilia? Will you hang that one up? Do you think, or are you going to keep using it? Look, I find it very tough to hang it up because I'm, <laughs> I get real attached to a bat. So. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna have to use that one till it till it breaks, and then and then maybe hang it up and and, and keep it. But yeah, for now I need it. I can't go hanging it up. <laughs> Was it a newie, Marnus? Because we saw you on the boundary line actually standing on it, trying to get some flex into the handle. Because they can be a bit stiff at the start of an innings, can't they? No, it actually wasn't. It was actually an old bat I got um, at. I got it during the Ashes, so I got these two beautiful bats. They looked like beautiful grain and everything. And um, one that one's handle broke, and so I got a new handle put in it. And when you put a new handle on an old bat, it's really stiff. It like, because it's kind of not deteriorated at the same time. So I had to try and loosen the handle up to just get some flex, so it wasn't so um, like so much vibration going through the bat. It worked. You batted beautifully. It was a joy to watch your maiden Test century. Congratulations. Now look around because the crowd hasn't diminished, mate. I think that's actually grown. There are probably more kids here now waiting for your autograph. What do you reckon about the star of the show, the man of the match, Manus Labuschagne, with us on the ABC? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, That's Marnus Labuschagne. Great to speak to him. Thanks to Sarah and Penny and the team at Cricket Australia for the great access. Post-match today as well on Grandstand at Stumps have been superb. And to get the insights of the Australian captain, the leader of the, the pace bowling attack, Pat Cummins, and the man of the match, Marnus Labuschagne, I think we can tick a few boxes there, Bucky. Is that That's it? We're win. done? <laughs> Ramiz was asking for a pay rise. We might have to ask one for yeah. one as well after all of that. Um, just some further reflections on the, the match itself and, and what it means for Australia now. We've got the five tests this summer. The first is a commanding victory. And I think most would have thought from the outset that New Zealand would present a greater challenge. And they're going very well against England at the moment. Um, to build momentum early in the series during these matches against Pakistan, do you feel like that? can be taken into the Test Series against New Zealand as well? Oh, no doubt. I mean, it, it reinforced the fact that Australia has a good attack, as good attack as anyone going around. But it's, it's the batting that's, that has been the issue now, that no doubt. And to see what we saw, I mean, there's, it's still at home. There's still a lot of questions to be asked um, and answered away from home. But uh, they did really well. And, and, you know, I guess the fact, as Tim Payne pointed out, that uh, they could get 580 and Steve Smith not get, f I think he got four. Um, I yep. mean, that is just an incredible sign for, for Australia in the future. Yeah, I, I agree mostly with that, um, Bucky. And uh, I think going into uh, the, the pink ball test with the ball swinging around, that's where it's, they're going to be tested, the batsmen, and that's where they need to stand up. I think they can do it. Um, definitely with uh, what we've uh, seen here in this test match and if their techniques are in order and they've got the right mindsets um, and I think having the extra day off as well is probably going to help them. Yeah, and I think that also they, they, I mean, they, they bowled three out of four days in, in um, well, t they bowled quite a lot over, the, over this period. Um, it's probably put to bed a little bit the, the all-rounder um, argument about that, that player who bats number six. So I think with Marnus Labuschagne also bowling his leg spin, I think that just allows them to the luxury of having Travis Head or, or whoever it is to, to, to bat at six and outright batsman. So James Pattinson wasn't eligible for selection in this test match. Um, he will be eligible from here on in. Mitch, what do you think the chances of, of seeing a change in the bowling attack across the course of, of this summer? Could Australia manage the pace bowlers through the entire summer or do you think that there will come a point where someone comes out and maybe Pattinson goes in? Uh, it's a good question. Oh, I don't see a change in this next one. I think, um, I mean, who do, you, who do you change out of that? Um, yeah, it, it's a tough one. Oh, they'll try and look after the bowlers, I think, if, if they feel that they need a bit of a break. But I'm always for like, if you're playing and you're performing in Test Match Cricket, you Always putting your hand up. Uh, they they did ro uh, not rotate. I guess they did manage quite well over in England with 
Um, the, the bowl is there and a few guys got to go. And, and we, like we said, Mitchell Stark played one match. Um, so it was all based on conditions. Um, so I don't see a change in the next one. I think a Mitchell Stark swinging the ball around, it's going to suit him so well. Um, it's really hard to change a winning team. Lads, had a lot of fun. Thanks very much. Um, Bucky, unfortunately, from our perspective, this is the only test you're doing for us this summer with, with all your work commitments up here as part of the Cricket Australia program. Thank you very much, and you are a key part of uh, our test match summer every year, and we hope to nail you down as much as your career is progressing outside of the commentary world very nicely. We hope to nail you down for a few more test matches next time. Thank you very much for your contribution, mate. Thanks, mate. Always a privilege to be a part of it. Chris Rogers on grandstand at Stumps. Mitchell Johnson as well. Thanks to you, who will continue to be part of the team. You're heading off to Adelaide, Mitch. It, you oh. don't want the pink rock in your hand, do you? You don't oh, like I, the pink. I, I don't like it in a test match, but it'd be pretty, pretty awesome when it's swinging around and flying <laughs> through. That's for sure. But, yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. It'll be great uh, atmosphere there, I think. Yeah, to Quentin Hull and to Jim Maxwell, the leader of the team, Alison Mitchell, Jason Gillespie and Rummies Raja as well. Big thanks to Zane Bojack and, and Matt Clinch behind the scenes, along with Robert Apolloni and all the team back in the studio. That's a wrap from the Gabba, where Australia's strong record has continued, still not beaten. In over 31 years now, our Grandstand at Stumps podcast will be available soon including a special extra episode featuring Ed Cowan and Corbin Middlemass with their end of test overview, which they will continue to do at the end of each test match this series. Thanks again to all the team. The series now moving to the Adelaide Oval starting on Friday. I hope you can join Grandstand then for continuation of the test series against Pakistan. Hi, this is David Warner. You're listening to ABC Grandstand at Stumps. Welcome to Grandstand at Stumps. Back for a new test series. Australia home over Pakistan by an innings and five runs. The winning streak at the Gabba extends to a 31st year. Corbett Middlemass alongside former test opener Ed Cowan. The Australians beat Pakistan. There's a whole lot of individual stories, though, out of the first test that we've got time to chop up here on Grandstand at Stumps. Firstly, Ed Cowan, did the first test live up to your expectations? Corby, thanks for having me again for another series. I thought I might have got the, oh, the, the chop after the ashes. You're the star of the show. I had a couple of sleepy moments. It's it's nice to be doing a, a podcast at you know something other than stupid o'clock and, and getting to watch some cricket. But to answer your question, it didn't. I thought it was a, I mean, it did in in a lot of senses. We saw some phenomenal individual performances, but. As a contest, I really thought Pakistan would would probably give a better account of themselves. There were even for the Pakistanis some some nice individual uh, performances that that probably didn't come together as a team. And I, I would be interested to hear your view. If they had bowled first, would it have been a tighter game? I'll throw one at you early on. Yeah, I'm a hard no. Uh, just given the they didn't bowl well enough, they, they ended up with 580. Uh, and think about the um, they had two teenagers who would have been so juiced up on the first morning playing here in Australia. I'm not sure if they had have come out and bowled on day one as opposed to day two, that that would have, that would have been any better. Uh, and and I, I just... I don't I, know if you can refer to Pakistani fast bowlers being juiced up, but... Yeah, you know what anyway, I'm speaking about. It's hyped up, ready to go, all <laughs> above board. Uh, I just... I don't understand how... It, just by the fact that if they had a bowled on day one as opposed to, to batter, that you're making the you're making the argument that you think that all of a sudden that would have uh, lended itself to a better bowling performance in a different game. haven't made the argument at all. I just threw it open. But I am now going to make the argument that I think it would have been a better contest. So back to the original question. Was I disappointed? Yes, because the contest was a little bit of a flop. I think if they had bowled first, I don't think Australia would have got 580. But more importantly, I think their batsmen would have accounted themselves a lot better in both innings rather than one. We saw when the wicket flattened out excellent batting conditions at the Gabba and they they have the batsmen to, to score the runs but I, I think with the sideways movement and the bounce and the, the tennis ball bounce that we saw on, on day one that was too much for them and so if they had bowled I think Australia they, they, we would have got many more than their 240 yeah, but did. it, it would, probably would have been 350 I feel like Pakistan would have responded with 350 they didn't lose a wicket. And so at that point, we've got a game on. Yeah, that's true. So that's a, yeah, they, they'd set point. the perfect platform. They were none for at lunch. First time we've ever seen that from a touring team. 
Uh, and then the, the second session, just horrendous stroke play, which led to a, a lot of their dismissals. And, and the, the thing for the ball, which was the most disappointing part for me, is that Imran Khan, who was the leader of the attack, uh, he didn't bowl well at all. <laughs> Particularly didn't start well when he's got two teenagers. Their bowling was poor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so. their, their bowling was poor. And you, you make a good point about not losing a wicket, but sometimes it's actually that first session can be the easiest time to bat because of that tennis ball bounce. And then a few divots come in, the moisture st- starts coming out, quickens up a little bit, and you know it can be a bit harder to bat. But point taken, I was just throwing it out there. Yeah. I'm not, not saying that... You're going to take back your openness. Right or wrong. They're going to take back your openness card if you're telling people it's the easiest time to bat up, up front. In those <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. You've got to spread, you've got to spread, the, spread the rumour. Hardest place to bat. I don't know why anyone would do it. And now Marnus, uh, what a breakout test match for him. He's had a heap of them, obviously, over in England, but finally now uh, able to uh, call himself a test centurion on the back of what he was able to do in Brisbane. You, you do sort of think about how you want to celebrate 100, you know, when you're a kid, how you're going to do it. And then when I nicked it, I look back. I don't know what happened. Something took over because that's not what I was planning to do. Labashain on 97. Shaheen in. He's driving a thick outside edge through the gap. Wide of third slip for four down to the third man boundary. Labashain on his home ground. It's his maiden test ton and the gap arises. Andre Lubberskarpany with me, who's just seen his son, Manus Lubberschein, score a ton. Oh, it's an amazing experience. It's just an awesome outcome. Lubberschein on 149, strokes the ball to point, takes the single, 150 for Manus at the Gabba. What a day for this young man on his home soil. First test ton, first test 150, and he points his blade to all points of the Gabba. He's the sort of guy that actually, he organises backyard cricket, he has garage cricket, so if he's got a day off cricket, he gets his mates around, and I say, mates, it could be 15 or 20 of them playing garage cricket. I'm not sure many test players still do that. Shaheen comes again outside the off stump in the air and caught a gully. And Lavashain falls for 185. He's leaning on his bat handle. He does not want to go. Baba Azam, a shake of the hand. In fact, this is really lovely. All the Pakistan players coming forward to shake the hand of Manus Lavashain before he departs the field. What a nice touch that is. The spirit of sport is alive and well at the Gather. And this will be the reception for Manus Lavashain. The Gather rises to him. Baba took the catch. But Manus Lavashain, he's turned a maiden test century into a whopping 185 on his home ground. And the crowd are bringing him off. So Mana Slubbershain finishing with 185, man of the match. He's got the feel about him, Ed Cowan, that he's going to have cult status very shortly uh, in Australian sport. What impressed you most about him in Brisbane? 185 runs. I think that, that starts getting a cult status pretty quickly amongst the cricketers when you're scoring uh, test hundreds with the ease at which he played. I think we've seen an incredible improvement in his game. And it's a testament to Manus. It's a testament to the coaching staff. Uh, it's just fantastic to see this absolute hockey stick uh, of outcomes where we've seen, obviously, someone super talented, but as you can get such a, a quick read on, someone who is just soaking up every piece of information, every opportunity to just be the best cricketer he can be. And we're seeing it play out in test cricket. I mean, there, there's so much to sort of unpack here. If you, if you wind back the clock 12 months, I'll put my hand up. I, I thought, odd selection. Mm. I can't can't see this working out well. 12 months later, he looks every bit a test cricketer, a world-class batsman. His technique that, you know, has been unpacked and repacked, I guess, by every analyst uh, around the world on television and the like has improved, there's no doubt about that. Much more balance, much more access to the ball. He's always been able to play spin, and that is such a massive part of international cricket because you're playing the best spinner from every country. If you if you struggle against spin, you're going to have a, a tricky time of it in test cricket, but he's got every shot against the spinners. He can use his feet, he can sweep, he defends well, and he, he's just getting better. And It's a, a pleasure to watch. Easy on the eye, and you... He's the kind of guy that you're happy to cheer on. And that's, I guess, what I was alluding to with the, the cult status, with his 
his background and his story. He's very sort of 2019 Australian cricketer uh, who's sort of got a, a surname difficult to pronounce, a lot of consonants all in a row, made, his, uh, made the move out to Australia as, as a child, had to adapt. He was a small kid similar to, to Michael Hussey, and he's, he's been dubbed in some parts as the new Mr. Cricket. Uh, really didn't break out or play any of the underage teams until he was uh, in his, his late teens, sort of playing fifth grade for his club side in Brisbane, and has worked his way through, uh, takes... A ridiculous catch as a subfieldsman for Australia, and now all of a sudden is is out there the first concussion sub in the history of Test cricket. So it's a it's a background and a story I think that a lot of people can uh, relate to and and get behind and, and root for. Absolutely, and it's a it's a win for club cricket. It's a win for people showing the resilience of having to prove themselves and work their way through the system, not being handed anything uh, on a plate. So he's had to work hard at his game. And there is an oddity in there in that he's he's never had a Shield season and averaged more than 40, and yet he's come to Test Match Cricket and and really risen to the occasion. So I, I do think we're seeing a player, you know, really showing the improvement. But it's a couple of other things, points that I do want to make, not necessarily minor specific, but the importance of playing first-class cricket on Test venues and just how at ease he looked at the Gabba somewhere where he has played probably four or five Shield games a year for the last four years, he just, he walked out to bat and he, there was an air about it. He knew his game was going to succeed on that wicket and I think that's so important just as a, a general comment about a, a young batsman coming through playing on test match venues as much as possible. Uh, he's a, Sorry, I've, I've got a bit sidetracked there. No, no, I... Uh, just to pick up on, I guess, the thread about Marnus and how much he loves the game of cricket. It's it's sort of the one thing that a lot of his teammates always emphasise or anyone that sort of reads a story about um, Marnus and, and growing up and his love for cricket. And we heard from his dad there as part of that package. He says he still plays garage cricket on days off that he has uh, at home. But I love the story that Kerry O'Keefe told during the week as, as part of the Fox Cricket uh, coverage where he said... In, his, in parts that he'd read about Manus, that he, he thrives on his failures, that he almost embraces them in a way that it's a learning opportunity for him and he's able to go out there and, uh, and correct what he's done previously, which is sort of interesting with the human psyche, uh, Ed, where a lot of us probably look at our failures and, and almost turn away from them. He's someone that sort of goes headfirst into that to, to try to correct his game. Yeah, I think that is the key to uh, great well, the development of, of great batsmen, being able to learn from your mistakes because there's no hiding in, in cricket that you're going to make a lot of them as a batsman, as a top-order batsman. So to embrace that, to, to have the resilience to pick yourself up again, to look yourself in the mirror with honesty and say, what, what did I do wrong today and how can I fix it tomorrow? And to have that attitude is so key and, and all the best batsmen... Uh, portray that that attitude so the, all the makings are there uh, I think it was actually Wade Seckham who who was telling the story of the of the garage cricket as a as a as his state coach frustrated that when they when he gets a day off he, all he wants to do is play with a taped up <laughs> tennis ball but uh, an incredible story and and the summer is now his for the taking you know a, another hundred or two perhaps in this kind of form and and the world's really at his feet is this our opening pair for the foreseeable future, Joe Burns and, and David Warner? Yes. Well, <laughs> this is a conversation that we that keeps popping up. And, and we said at the end of last summer, there's no way that Joe Burns will get dropped now. He's 180. He's a lockdown for the Ashes, and he wasn't there. And then you know, we started, particularly on this podcast, making a case for Marcus Harris, who I, I'm a big fan of. He'd, he'd had a decent home summer. He'd scored some runs. He'd dominated Shield cricket. It felt like you could fit everyone into the team. And now we're in a situation where Burns, he has to have nailed down the spot. It, it was more the way he scored the runs. It, you know, Technically proficient, but he's got such a fluency to his game. He, he's very hard to bowl to, actually, because he plays so well off the back foot. Sometimes his, his defence... Um, it's probably not as solid as you you may expect from a, from an opening batsman, but he gets in really good positions. He's always balanced at the crease, and if you bowl a loose ball, he pounces on it. And again, also plays spin very very well. So he was outstanding. He he really set it up. 
uh, unlucky, obviously, not to, to post a, another ton in Test cricket. He'd been dropped four times already in his, uh, his 17 Test career and has really nice numbers. It's an opening stand in the past 12 months that it's only averaged 16. The openers for Australia are now... All of a sudden, water and burns back together, and they put on over 200 for the first wicket. Can you explain to me, Ed, we've already touched a little bit on the Pakistan bowling. Why, when Imran Khan is leading the attack, does he not come around the wicket to David Warner the way that he was dismissed on all 10 occasions in England? Everything, every, every attack that he's faced since then, whether it's in domestic cricket or grade cricket, has done the same thing, and yet he confronts this uh, attack in, against Pakistan, and it's almost as if they've done... No scouting at all on David Warner over the past 12 months. Mm. It's a good question, and I can only go on what my gut tells me. And it tells me that uh, Imran wasn't comfortable bowling around the wicket with the new ball. Maybe he hadn't practiced it enough. He felt like he could move the ball down the line, but still we know that Warner thrives when the ball's coming back into him. Uh, yeah, it's, it's beyond me as to why he wouldn't go straight around the wicket and really challenge him but that would be my only kind of gut feel is is that he didn't feel comfortable doing that so it's it's a good pick up and I don't really have a a better answer than that on day three uh, young Nassim Shah and there was so much talk about him obviously in the in the lead up uh, to the uh, to the test the 16 year old making his debut the team's in the field for five and a half hours he bowls four overs on the third day the team comes out in the aftermath and says he's not injured uh, I mean, really, the glowing omission here is the fact they leave out Muhammad Abbas, who tormented Australia the last time they played, albeit in different conditions. Um, it felt like they missed a few tricks. Pakistan first up at the Gabba. Yeah, they, there's no doubt. Uh, I think, that, and there's some talk that Muhammad Abbas is still recovering a, a little bit from his dislocated shoulder that he suffered against New Zealand. And if that's the case, maybe it's a bit more understandable. Uh, I think from the, might have been the, the post-game press conference, uh, they touched on the fact that they think that they now made an error, having lost by an innings and, and five runs. It would probably be a decent time to concede it. Uh, a fine bowler controls the scoreboard, which they struggled at times to do. And, uh, you know, the oddity being it's all well and good to, to pick a young tear away quick. And I, I do get the fact that, you know, four overs probably way way too few in Test match cricket. There's no bowling restrictions. There's no, you know, it's not underage cricket. You need to be going full tilt the whole time. But whether they felt his body wasn't quite up to it, um, you know, the the toil of a day and a half in the field, I'm not quite sure. But his first game, and obviously um, Nassim uh, had played three previously, so we're talking about a very, very raw attack, an attack that I probably wouldn't have picked going into the test match, that that was the one that they were going to formulate. So they, they did struggle with the ball, uh, and, and they, they weren't good enough for, for long enough um, yes, for yeah, most ju- of the test match. Coach, jump in on Yashir Shah, who probably bowled better than his figures mm. suggest in the end. He picked up the wicket of Steve yeah. Smith and celebrated with uh, the number seven salute the seventh time that he's got him in six test matches. Uh, what did you make of uh, of that reaction after picking up the prize scalp of Smith? I'm all for a little bit of gamesmanship in, in test cricket. You, when you get to play the same people over and over again, you can, as we saw with Broad and, and Warner, you can develop these these situations where you get one over a player. And when you get one over the player that on every television ad you see is being built up as the next Bradman, why wouldn't you celebrate? But, you know, if Steve Smith does have some form of kryptonite, it is spin bowling moving away uh, from leg to off, whether that be right arm leg spin or left arm finger spin, because we do see it time and time again. So it's interesting as the summer goes on, both Yassir Shah and then Mitchell Satner coming out for New Zealand, that Steve Smith will be tested. Just on Pakistan, if they get somewhat of an upswing out of this. It's it's obviously on the back of what Baba Azam was able to do today. A slip, the catching man outside the off stump, stroke through, cover. That might be his hundred. It's racing out to the boundary. Baba Azam reaches triple figures at the Gabba. And he pumps his fist in the middle of the pitch. What a delight to see one of the great talents of world cricket transfer the white ball form to the traditional form of the game. He's 100 not out in a very very tough scenario for his country.
and he gets the plaudits from the fans in Brisbane, drops to his knees, kisses the turf, praises those around him. What a knock. And just superb through the offside, Ed, in what he was able to do. I think he scored over 70 of his runs uh, en route to that 100, uh, just the second time that he's, he's scored a Test match 100. And as Q touched on there, and, and we all know he's, um, he's one of the world's best premier white ball players. He is, uh, and he's, he's so young. You, you can see him building on, on his Test career. He, he's in fine form. He obviously came into the game with 100 in Perth the week before, but just classically technical. And it's so nice to watch a technician go to work and, and do it with such ease and how well he's adjusted to Australian conditions with the pace on the ball. He's a he's a player for all conditions. And you're right. It, well, he'll be testing Adelaide where no doubt the ball will, will seem with the, with the pink ball and more grass on the wicket. So that will be an interesting test for him. But I'd like to see him a bit further up the order. I mean, they got absolutely nothing out of... Uh, Harris O'Hale for the first test. As a Ali, we know is a is a fine player. Not so sure about Masood at the top. So they do have they do have some batting, but I actually thought the the highlight for Pakistan was the new keeper and Mohammad Rizwan. I thought he yeah. kept beautifully. He took some excellent catches, and then in their second innings, I thought he was superb with the bat. And obviously, having taken over from their former captain Safraz. Big shoes to fill, but it, it feels as though he is a high-quality player. So changes for Pakistan. Uh, what do you think will happen before Adelaide on, on Friday? Oh, I think a bus has to come in. Oh, it's going to be a seamer's wicket. It's not a wicket there at the moment when they keep the grass on it that you have to bowl flat out. You just have to stand the seam up and you have to bowl a nice full length. They call it the Chad Sayers length in Adelaide. And Mohamed Abbas can do that. So I would definitely be picking him. And, you know, as far as the batting goes, uh, I don't know enough about their, yeah, their reserve batters, but I think they'll probably go in with, with the same, same batsman. Yeah, so Imam Al-Haq is out here, so there's a, a chance that he'll come in and bat up the top. And as you said, Harris Sahal might be one that um, misses out in all that. We've seen Azhar Ali obviously play it at first drop recently, so there, there could be a bit of a reshuffle if they, they bring in Al-Haq as the opener. I was interested in the, the numbers that were highlighted on Mitchell Stark throughout the test, and it was really centred around the fact that he, oh, he comes in and cleans up the tail. And the, the numbers uh, which were, were posted uh, during the broadcast that he averages 35 against batsmen, 1 to 7, and his average against batsmen listed 8 to 11 drops all the way down to 13. And it made me think out, I thought, well, it'd be a bit of a problem, wouldn't it, if it was the other way around, if all of a sudden you average just <laughs> yeah, less exactly against right. the top guys than he's down you the bottom. You to the punchline. Of course he's going to average less against the, the tail enders. And, <laughs> and isn't that where Mitchell Stark's at his best, when he comes in, rips through the tail, uh, bowls with, with great gas? And I think we saw that uh, from him throughout the, the test. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> that's, it's a great point. First and foremost, everyone has a role to play. And, and his, partly his job is to clean up the tail. People have been picked uh, for, for doing exactly that for, for many, many years. So someone who can clean up the tail, because conversely, a tail that wags can be so uh, destructive and swing momentum. So to have a guy to do that is so valuable. Swings the new ball when, he, when he's bowling well, which he is. Uh, I'll, I'll throw a stat back at you. Seven bowlers in the history of Test cricket to have taken over 200 Test wickets with a strike rate of better than 50. There's only one Australian on the list. I'll give you a tip. It's Mitchell Stark. Wow. So that gives you an idea of the company he's in. Alan Donald, you know, the greatest fast bowlers of all time, Malcolm Marshall. Mitchell Stark's in that list, and yet every time he's slightly off and Shane Warne calls for him to be dropped because his body language isn't good enough, people hop on top of it, yet the stats don't lie. He has been a phenomenal bowler for Australia for a very long time. I do think he's bowling better now. I mean, we've seen what his worst looks like and everyone has patches and his variation between his best and his worst is very large, where Josh Hazelwood, the difference between his best and his worst is not much. He's he's very consistent and probably the same with Cummins. But Stark can win you a game in a session and probably lose you a game in a session. So you get these these huge swings in form that people love hopping all over because it, it can sell, sell papers. But he's someone that 
when he's bowling well, you want him, you want him in the team uh, for for so many reasons. And he showed it with the new ball in in the first uh, innings, and he showed it against the tail as, as well consistently. So, um, uh, but here we are talking about it again. Yeah. Well, it could, could be a bit of a sliding doors moment too. With obviously the last time that we recorded a pod. Not long after that, uh, the news came out about James Pattinson who had been suspended after a, a third infringement of, in domestic cricket or in, in cricket. Um, so as a result, was suspended for the first test. And that was the, the big selection dilemma, wasn't it? Whether they go with Pattinson or Stark uh, for the first test in Brisbane. Uh, and I think the, the feeling is now that there probably won't be a change uh, heading towards Adelaide for a, a side which wins by over an innings inside four days. Uh, what did you make of the, the James Pattinson incident? A, a third offence... Um, I noticed a couple of his teammates came out and felt that it was particularly harsh that he missed a test for something like that. Did you have a view on how that all unfolded? Uh, well, my my view is probably, I don't know, it, it, it might sit in the minority, I'm not sure. But in a team that is trying to rebuild confidence in the Australian public, that their behaviour and their values are going to uphold uh, those that we expect of people who are representing us on the national sporting field then no it's not too harsh because from all you know it's first of all his third offense and the second point being you know from what he said it it seems is highly inappropriate so in the i mean there's, there's never there shouldn't be any context required but the context is that the Australian cricket team 12 months ago was on the brink of imploding or had imploded and there is a set of behavioural standards and values that need to be lived to, to be part of that team and if you don't meet those, then you're not welcome. So I, I don't really have any issue with it. The first test at the Lucky Gabba. your view. On, on that? Uh, I think that's yeah well encapsulated. I'm surprised that the players would, would come out and give voice to the fact that they're surprised that the sanction had been handed down, which is what their employer is. Conversely, if they come out and say, "Oh, it's all it's all well and good," then they've got Pato bowling bumpers in the nets at them for the next two yeah. years, and that's probably not a that's, nice thing either. That's, that's probably a fair point. The first test uh, at the Gabba, obviously returning there this year after last year, uh, it was staged in Adelaide. Uh, Australia lost that test the first of the summer. So, as I said off the top, they extend their uh, their unbeaten streak at the Gabba to a 31st year. But one thing which was hard to ignore were the, the crowds. Uh, well down, uh, only 45, just under 46,000 attended the Gabba test over four days. Sheffield Shield crowds, they, they call them. There was no one there. It was Sunday, last day of the test match, and there were 4,000 people there. It's an absolute disgrace. So you can kick and scream and say, oh, the wicket's the best in the country and they deserve to have the first test of the summer. If people don't go and watch, it will not continually have the first test of the summer. That That is the cold, hard facts. There will be a test match there, no doubt. Oh, and I think the corresponding fixture uh, several years ago, which was a day-night test, had sort of 25, 30,000 more people. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct. Mm. And so... what? Why wouldn't they play? And look, Brisbane is not a great place to watch test cricket. It's hot. It's sweaty. You're in a concrete bowl. There's nothing great about the Gabba except probably the the wicket. So what can make that better and more appealing is to play day-night cricket there. So I think it's one of those venues, a little bit like Adelaide, that is suited to day-night cricket where you can then have your, your day test matches, Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, albeit that's a, a pink ball test yeah. this year as a bit of an experiment. Uh, and, you know, so this whole has to be the first test match of the summer. I, I, I don't get, personally. I, I like test matches being played there. I think it makes for a great contest. It's a fantastic surface. There's no doubt about that. But cricket relies on people being interested in the fixture. And so whether that's bums on seats or people watching on television, and day-night cricket, the Gabba, can, can do both. So uh, that, that would be my push. And a couple of the, the big picture issues which uh, came up during the test match after certain incidents, uh, the no ball calls, which we saw a couple of times, and David Warner in particular, who was called back after Nassim Shah appeared to have picked up his first wicket in, uh, in test cricket 
All of a sudden, Warner comes back, goes on to make 100. It's the fourth time that it's happened to him in his test career where he's been given a reprieve and then goes on to score 100 and really cash in on the second chance thereafter. And Trent Copeland on Sevens Telecast presented some figures on day two that in the first two sessions alone, there had been 21 no balls that weren't called by the on-field umpires. Uh, I guess, what's the answer going forward? Or is this just the way modern cricket is, that it's it's only ever checked in, uh, if there is a wicket that falls? Yeah, oh, great question. I think something needs to be addressed because not only is it the extra balls, it's the extra runs. As you say, if it's only being checked when a wicket falls, how's a bowler meant to know that he's close? If the you know the communication of being called a no ball or being told consistently that you know you're up and close to that line, then how are they meant to know? I just think it's it's so hard for the umpires. We expect so much of them to get the decision right at the important end of the game, which is where the batsman is. Technology has a has a part to play. The, they've trialled various techniques, one being a little buzz, um, a buzz on the watch of an umpire who, who's standing, who can actually then call a no ball. I, I think the third umpire very easily can have a camera set up and after every ball, check every single ball. And if it's a no ball, it gets called a no ball. So we get in the habit of knowing when the no balls are. I don't think we're too far away. We're not asking to put people on the moon here. All we're asking is for no balls to be called. And so I don't quite understand why the ICC are A, reluctant, and B, so slow in addressing this. It it, it goes beyond the realms of belief, really. And I, you know, even there are other technologies available. I know Peter George, who was on the ABC uh, during the lunch break talking about it, he, he's developing the, the ex-South uh, Australian and Queensland fast bowlers, some technology that will help... Uh, assist umpires in calling no balls, but it, it, it just needs to be addressed. It, it's like a black and white issue, and let's get on with it. Yeah. Oh, is it that a bigger problem for the game if, like you said, that the third umpire watches it on a couple of seconds delay, and then, then the no ball's called after the event? It, I, how does that change anything? Because if a wicket falls... I would falls, have thought so. Yeah, it, it, we stop and we do that That's anyway. exactly right. <laughs> so, uh, if somehow yep. it mars some great moment in the game because a couple of seconds later the umpire says, hey, that was actually a no we're going to do another one. Um, I, I wouldn't have thought that that's a bad look for the game or anything worse than what we've got at the moment. Unusual. But certainly not worse than what we've got at the moment. Yeah. Um, and, so I'll, I'm in favour of... A, a, let's start simple, and, and if that's not good enough, we'll, we'll find something a bit more complex to... to create a solution. Now, the thing that we often speak about out of a day's test cricket is the overrate. The fact that, again, the inability of test teams to be able to bowl 90 overs in a day, it's it's amazing to think that these same players play first-class cricket, they bowl 96 overs in a day, uh, playing here. A lot of them go back and play grade cricket. They get through a hell of a lot more overs at that level. It's To not be able to bowl 90 overs in, what, six and a half hours of cricket just seems... Ridiculous. I think they were four overs short on day one and three overs short on day two, and it was a regular problem throughout the, the entire test. It feels like the fining system that we have in place at the moment where captains uh, get fined a certain percentage of their match fee just, just isn't working. Um, what's the answer, and, and do you think it is a, a pressing issue for the game? Of course it's a pressing issue. When, when we're trying to make test cricket as attractive proposition as possible, when there's so many possible threats to the existence of test cricket... Why would we have anything to detract from the spectacle? And slow over rates is one of those factors. So finding captains becomes irrelevant. You've got guys who are earning millions of dollars through a whole range of means, different tournaments around the world, test cricket sponsorship, and we're going to find them 25% of a match fee. What I would do, and this has only just come to me because you've only just popped the question at me, is with the test championship, something like you do in the Shield, you have very dramatic points deductions for teams that don't bowl their overrates. And I bet you, as soon as that comes in, when you know that actually has a detrimental impact on where your team is sitting on the world uh, cricket ladder over the four-year cycle, I reckon that, that might solve it pretty quick smart. Is it too harsh to point the finger at the umpires in all this? I feel like the... The umpires were very forgiving of them at the moment because no. of DRS and everything else that yeah. they have to deal with. But 
surely yeah. given the, the reliance on technology that they now have for a number of things, we're talking about how many no balls go uncalled during a day. Surely it's up to them every now and then to say, hey, the guy running out an extra set of gloves or a drink, for example, one over before a drinks break. Is it time to say to those guys, hey, like either let's stop that or here's a thought, let's get rid of the drinks break. Why, why do we have a drinks break in the middle of a session, which is sort of this archaic uh, part of the game? And I, I get why it happens and why it originally happened, but nobody's short of a drink out there anymore. The drinks come on and off at the end of every single over. So surely it's, it's one or the other that's, that's got to give. That's a, a great suggestion. No drinks breaks. That's something that uh, they should probably look into. Uh, and there, are, as you say, it's actually the little moments that really add up. It's the gloves. It's the dr- running of the drinks because someone has to run on. They have to run off. What we're forgetting is side screens in Test cricket don't move anymore. So not only in, in first class cricket are you getting through 96 overs, but generally people are moving side screens. You know, there's a whole regalia around that that takes a whole heap of time. Uh, there's just so much fluffing around. The, the the speed of the game in between balls is so much slower than any other um, standard of cricket. I understand there's, there's different pressures, there's different tactics, but the game is the game. So get on and, and play it. There's, it's, it's beyond me, actually. Uh, reports coming out during the test match that George Bailey is now the favourite to be the new selector. He's obviously still playing huh. uh, with Tasmania. The early reports from the press was that uh, Max Klinger was the original favourite when the job was uh, was advertised so publicly on Seek. Uh, but the reports recently are that, that George Bailey is, is firming to join Trevor Hones and Justin Langer on the three-man selection panel. Your former teammate, Ed, how would he go as a, a national selector? He'd be brilliant. I'm, I'm slightly um, biased. He's He's one of my best mates, so I can't. I'm interested where these reports are coming from because I asked him the question yesterday, actually on the phone. He said he hadn't heard anything since since the second round interview. So there's either a leak, or people are just wanting to rustle up a bit of support for for smiling George. He would be superb, and and the reasons are this: he's a fantastic communicator, someone who is very articulate and be, to cut through to the point. There's no BS. He's happy to give uh, straight answers, even if it's not what you want to hear, but he has a way of doing it with empathy so that you can actually really understand uh, the crux of of his point and and argument. He understands the game. He's a superb leader, probably the best captain I ever played under. All the attributes that you want in and around Australian cricket, so whatever that is, whether that's as a selector mentor, player, doesn't really mean he's obviously not going to play, but um, to have him in and around Australian cricket is, is only a net positive, and I think he would provide the rigour uh, that that job now demands, and, and I think that would be a, a huge net win for the selection panel. I hope he's got you down as a referee. Who's Ed. spreading the rumours out of interest? Uh, oh. <laughs> he does, actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, st- he stole my intro to, to my CV, so... Yeah, um, might be able to cut that the job. and just send it on to uh, to whoever's making the phone calls from um, from Cricket Australia. Uh, just for whatever it's worth, too, I, I'm a big Michael Klinger fan, and I was interested to hear um, Chris Rogers speak about um, the, the Renegades job, uh, and he said during our uh, our coverage that uh, that Max Klinger is in, in line to take over there as uh, the, the new uh, Renegades coach. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that it's not Michael Klinger, given the, uh, the, I guess, the takeover from the West that we've seen at Cricket Australia recently. The national team has had success under Justin Langer. I think one thing that you can't deny about Langer is he is a winner, and he's proven that again uh, since coming in as as, uh, a senior coach of the men's team. But Ben Oliver, who was part of the high-performance department in the West, is now at Cricket Australia as well. So to have someone, I think, outside of that is good as well, rather than having, say, another voice from the, the same system. And, and as we often find, Ed, I think in any stage of life, that you can fall into a little bit of group think at times if you're surrounded by um, sort of like-minded people. So to have Bailey come in uh, from a, a different part of the country, has different experiences, I, I think is a, a good thing to be part of that panel as well. There's no doubt that diversity of thought, uh, particularly when you're, you're picking <laughs> cricket teams so you're not falling into any kind of bias, is super important. And I'm sure Michael Klinger, you know, he, he may well still get the job. Who knows? Um, but you're probably right. Also, the optics of, of having another Western Australian um, 
although the Victorian and South Australians might argue differently to that. Um, and odd, just as, as a bit of a tangent, I'm surprised, and phenomenal T20 cricketer, superb person, but I, I don't love players going straight into coaching roles. I think that coaching and playing are two very well, fundamentally different skills, and to, to coach is to teach, and not all players have that ability, and it needs to be learnt, and I'm sure Michael Clare, if he wants to coach, will be a fantastic coach, but a head coaching job, if he does in fact get the Renegades job, is, I don't know, is a great place to start. I feel like players should be doing some kind of apprenticeship before they get thrust into these sort of high-profile jobs, but that's a, a sidebar. So Australia winning the first test uh, by an innings and five runs. Uh, the next test, the second test uh, of a, a two-test series, is in Adelaide. It starts on Friday. Uh, and one of our popular parts of our podcast that we did during the uh, the Northern Ashes series was you gave us some cricket nerdy stuff uh, from particular venues uh, and things that are, are unique to that particular place. What can you tell us about uh, Adelaide, particularly from a, a playing point of view that jumps out? Jeez, it caught me a, a little bit off guard. Um, well, apart from having the best lunches in the world, maybe Lords might sneak ahead of the Adelaide Oval, but the Adelaide Oval is famous for its lunches. There's no doubt about that. They have these little chicken schnitzel tenders that they put sweet chilli sauce on that are just absolutely second to none. But in terms of playing surf, it's obviously it's changed significantly uh, since Damien Hugh has taken over. He's leaving more grass sort of eight mils of live grass on the wicket, particularly for these pink ball games, and it's making for a great contest. So if you're a batsman, it, it, it makes driving virtually impossible for the first couple of days. You really have to just wait for your, your width. Uh, you have to wait for back-of-length balls to, to score off the back foot, and, and the spinners can do very well as well because the seam grabs in the live grass. So it's it what once was... A batter's heaven is now, you know, drive at your peril. Got to be very patient, leave well. But once you get in against the pink ball, it, it can be lovely to bat on it when it just sort of skids on under lights a little bit. So uh, I don't think I've provided anything yeah. new is there, it, but it's, it is one of the great venues of the world. Oh, it's a great ground. It's, it's probably my favourite, I think, cricket venue just about going around at the moment um, in, in Australia and uh, and to be able, the way that they've blended the old with the new, it's spectacular for spectators. But for players in particular, like the uh, the changes that have been made to the, I guess the uh, the viewing area and the pavilion and the uh, the facilities that the guys have there nowadays. Absolutely first class, superb. You, you cannot fault the Adelaide Oval as a as a venue for cricket. With the old scoreboard, the the, the nets are absolutely immaculate. They they are exactly like the middle. It's just an absolute treat to turn up and play cricket at Adelaide Oval. Uh, the changes. And you're right. You're calling this test match, Corey. I am, yes. You? So you'll be able to hear my voice throughout the week on, uh, on ABC Radio. Yeah. Thanks, Ed. Uh, changes. Brilliant. Do you foresee any uh, in the Australian team? No. 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 None. Same team again. Uh, just to, None and done. <laughs> just, before, just before I let you go, I played that uh, superb montage earlier, uh, Karen Ty's great production work on, on Manus, Labuschagne's uh, 100 off the top of the podcast. You would know, Ed, what, it's, what it feels like to score a maiden test century at the Gabba. Can you take us back to uh, your maiden test ton and what you recall from it? This is, this is a classic stitch-up. Yeah, this is a leading that question. so long ago, Corby. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was bloody, it was almost a decade ago. All I right. can't remember what happened last week. I'll just get but, you to listen, yeah. listen into this. Yeah, this is, you know, look. Okay. This is more of Karen's great work. Just to, maybe you might be able to recall a, a few things from this. <laughs> Staying in. Back goes Cowan. Cuts him and cuts him well. Down to third man for four. Oh, he'd be sniffing 100 before the lunch break here. 20 minutes to go. He's into the 90s. Ed Cowan's wife, Virginia, let our guest on, on grandstand. If he, if he gets that Test 100 today, could you somewhat encapsulate what it would mean to him and to you and the family? I don't know that I could tell you what it would mean to him. I mean, that's obviously something that he's been striving for for his entire career, probably his entire life. So <laughs> it'll be a very, very special day for us. Well, you are the ultimate professional in calling, but can we trust you if Ed Cowan gets his 100 to call it as it actually should be called rather than a screaming... Go, you good thing, you old Cranbrookian. <laughs> can, 
can there be a degree of and a lack of bias? No. Or are you just going to go nuts? No, I'll, I'll just go with the moment. Yeah. yeah. Well, I hope it's a good, clean blow when it comes. <laughs> Philander again, right arm over, bowls to Cowan, and he pulls this, and there's the 100. He beats the man at square leg. It's racing to the boundary, and Ed Cowan gets his first test match century. Off comes the helmet. He leaps in the air, hugs his skipper, Michael Clark. What a milestone. Ah, oh, delighted he is, and well, he might be. Arms go up. He's a delighted man. He's played supremely well. They were 40 for three. He was under the pump from uh, the seam bowlers. Australians to a man, rise to him, and well-deserved. Great knock, Ed Cowan. Cranbrook Ed strikes for the uh, the public school boys, Jimmy. <laughs> uh, Jim Maxwell, very proud, standing at the uh, back of the box. Backed him all along. Ed's dad, Richie's here. How proud are you, Richie? Very. Rudyard Kipling said in 1856, don't push the world along and live in the world of fame. Be like the oxen and get there just the same. And that is what Edward has lived by. Your old man's comment at the end, at the end, Ed just made the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, I've got a bit of a tear in the eye, I must say, Corby. That's, uh, that was very special, actually. That's pretty uh, cool. Nice to hear my wife's voice, nice to hear my dad's voice. Great to hear Drew's voice. Yes. But it was a special day. It was... Um, it was a, a lifelong dream, so thanks. Appreciate that. It's a good way to go out, Ed. Uh, enjoy the cricket this week. Uh, look forward to chatting to you at the completion of the second test from Adelaide.